in the way in which that's addressed. So that's, in a fairly long-winded way, I apologise for taking the time, the statement of why the Greens will be supporting the motion put forward by Senator uh, Vanstone, I was not here when you put it forward, um, by the opposition, and uh, agree that those two bills need to be linked in a sequential manner. Senator Allison. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I start out by fully endorsing the comments made by Senator Chamaret, and indeed one could question why the government is so anxious to get this bill dealt with prior to the New South Wales election. In fact, I would have thought the New South Wales election, or any mention of it, is entirely irrelevant to uh, what we are debating here. And what we are debating here really is a question of process, democratic process, and that is that uh, the government affords an opportunity to uh, the minority parties and the opposition in the Senate to uh, have available to them the scrutiny of a bill which is being introduced, and that applies to any piece of legislation, not just to the legislation uh, before us, the Human Rights Legislation and Amendment Bill, but it applies to every piece of proposed legislation. Now, that opportunity simply has not been afforded to the minority parties and the opposition in this case. And I say to those uh, people who are listening and the people of Australia that no doubt you would expect that to be a fundamental rule, a fundamental democratic rule that would be practised in the national parliament. Well, of course, what is being proposed here today is an abrogation of that fundamental rule. What is being proposed is that the opposition and the minority parties, with little notice, very little notice, and no opportunity whatsoever to, uh, uh, to have any scrutiny uh, of this legislation, for them si simply to rubber stamp it, simply to, to fly by the seat of their pants, to, uh, to venture uh, with a blindfold, as it were, into the debate of this issue. And that is entirely inappropriate. It is entirely undemocratic, and is so it is something which should be abhorrent to the people of this country. Now, th the fact is that the Human Rights Legislation Amendment Bill does have relevance to the Racial Hatred Bill. I was uh, a member of the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, which looked into this matter. Now, I appreciate that the minister says that this matter has been uh, ventilated a great deal and that uh, it does, in fact, go back some years. But you see, what we have here is an intervening cause, an intervening event, which changed things dramatically. It was whilst the Senate Legal and Constitutional Committee was conducting its inquiry that the High Court handed down uh, its decision in the Brandy case. And what that did was to change things radically. It changed things so much uh, that the Legal and Constitutional Committee called before it the Attorney-General's Department to give evidence as to the effect that this case would have on the Racial Hatred Bill. And, uh, that is an unusual situation. It is not often that a Senate uh, committee, during the course of its inquiry, has a decision by the highest court in this land which affects that subject of inquiry. And that's precisely what happened. So all the years of uh, inquiry, all the years of discussion, could uh, basically count for naught, and that was what the, the uh, committee had to inquire into. Now, the minister is in, uh, Senator Bolkus is entirely wrong when he quotes the uh, Senate uh, committee as saying there is no problem with continuing with uh, the debate on the racial hatred bill, because in the dissenting report, um, which was uh, signed by uh, uh, Senators uh, McGorran, Brownhill, Short, Ellison, Abetz, Ochi and Bone, it was stated that, uh, given the recent decision of the High Court in the case of Harry Brandy and the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, it will be necessary to await the government's response to ascertain the mechanisms whereby enforceability for a complaint can be achieved. So what I'm saying is that, uh, in fact, it was not the unanimous decision of that committee that we could proceed with this debate. Indeed, the coalition dissenting report said that we needed to wait and to see what the, the Attorney General's response was to that case. And in fact, when we questioned officers from that department, it became apparent that they were faced with a very complex question indeed. In fact, what they were 
they were looking at was in the interim going back to the pre-1992 situation and uh, then trying to fathom out a response. Because Brandy's decision basically said that uh, uh, these uh, commissions, which were looking at uh, human rights matters, equal opportunity matters, sexual discrimination, could not function as a court. It was an abuse of the, uh, 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 that part of the Constitution which requires a separation of powers. That is, you cannot confer judicial powers on non-judicial bodies. Now, that was a fundamental flaw, so fundamental that uh, uh, all High Court judges uh, saw the flaw and uh, they, in an in a explicit judgment, cut, it down, cut down the operation of, uh, of these commissions. And of course, that then brings in the Racial Discrimination Act, uh, the Racial Hatred Bill, because the second half of that bill deals with civil remedies. That is, civil uh, sanctions for people who might offend, insult uh, any individual or, or section of the community by, by virtue of uh, uh, racial uh, comment. And so it is that. If we were to have the debate on the Racial Hatred Bill, we would get to that point where we would have to, during the course of the debate, talk about the enforceability of those civil sanctions, those civil provisions in the bill. And it would be at that point that the debate would run into a brick wall, because what you would have is uh, the application of Brandy's case saying there is no enforcement, there is no sanction. And of course, we would be then left in a situation uh, we, where we would not know what the answer is. We could only assume that uh, that civil section wasn't worth the paper it was written on, because you don't uh, you don't legislate against something and then not provide the sanction to back it up. Well, of course, what the government's saying here: it's okay to proceed with the debate on the racial hatred bill. Uh, debate the niceties of a, of a civil remedy for some act of racism, uh, but uh, you do so in the light that it's unenforceable. Well, why even have it on the statute book? Why even out outlaw it if there's no teeth, if there's no sanction, if there's no force? And of course, it's an absolutely facile argument. And so, what uh, what the coalition is saying is, look, let's have a look at the. Uh, what the government's proposing here in its, uh, uh, in its bill, make sure that it does what the government says it does, and if it returns the matter to the 1992 situation, so be it. But at least we can then conduct the, the uh, debate on the civil sanctions contained in the R Racial Hatred Bill on that basis. But at the moment we would be debating in the dark. We would be arguing about a hypothetical situation because we're putting the cart before the horse. And in fact, to, uh, to maintain any, any form of uh, logical democratic process, we should debate firstly the, racial, uh, the Human uh, Rights Legislation Amendment Bill, followed by the Racial Hatred Bill. That is the sensible course of action, that is the democratic course of action, and it is one which will not cause this country any prejudice. The greater prejudice will be caused if we're forced into debating uh, uh, a matter where we know not the answer. Senator Spindler, if you wish to speak, it'll have to be by leave. I seek leave to address the Senate again on this matter. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Uh, I would like to briefly respond to one or two of the comments made uh, by Senator Van Stone, Senator Ellison and Senator Shemaret. Much is made. Uh, of the fact that we haven't resolved the consequences of the brandy, so-called brandy decision in the High Court. I think it would be useful to briefly traverse just uh, what the substance of uh, the situation is. Uh, in the pre-brandy situation, it was possible for uh, decisions or pronouncements uh, by the Commission to be registered with the Federal Court, thus ensuring enforceability. The High Court decided that that was not appropriate. Uh, we have now amendments before us, and for a minute I thought that Senator Abetz said he hadn't seen them, but I think that was clarified. They certain, we certainly had them before us since Friday. We consider that inadequate timing, but they certainly were available. Uh, now those amendments substantially return us to the pre-1992 situation 
where separate action needs to be taken in the federal court to ensure enforceability. Uh, we rather regret that because it means that more cost uh, is incurred by people before the Human Rights Commission seeking civil remedies. And no doubt, in time, uh, some way around it will be found which is easier for people that take their case to the Human Rights Commission. Um, however, it seems to me that in this particular situation, uh, whether we have enforceability in one way or another does not really touch on the substance of the race hatred bill. Uh, I think uh, uh, it would only have some uh, relevance if either uh, the coalition parties or if uh, Senator Shemaret would suggest that they might be happy not to vote for the amendments ensuring uh, the post-brandy enforceability, uh, returning it to the 1992, and have no means of enforcement uh, for civil remedies before the Human Rights Commission. Now, I, I believe that that is not the case. I, I would find it extraordinary if that were the case. But if that is not the case, surely the second reading debate uh, on the race hatred bill can proceed on the substance of that bill on the assumption that we will have enforceability as suggested by the amendments of the government to the human rights legislation bill uh, that's before the Senate. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I do not wish to uh, prolong the debate unduly, but uh, if it is appropriate for me to move my amendment formally now, uh, I would like to do so. You may move an amendment now. Thank you. My amendment to the motion uh, moved by Senator Hill would be to delete all reference to the racial hatred bill so that the motion reads, I move that consideration of government business order of the day number one relating to the human rights legislation amendment bill be postponed until Tuesday the 28th of March 1995. Do you have that amendment in writing? It would be helpful for the chair. It might be helpful for others as well. Well, the question before the chair is that the amendment be agreed to. Senator Herodin. Um, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, um, uh, the um, proposal that has been moved um, uh, is one which um, uh, I am now inclined to support. I wasn't inclined to support it um, uh, until I'd heard the arguments um, that have been advanced. Um, Particularly, I might note that the arguments, uh, the very lucid arguments that were advanced uh, uh, by uh, Senator Shemaret, um, uh, influenced, uh, uh, have uh, influenced uh, my consideration of, of this matter because they were, they were so logical. And uh, it followed uh, from what she said uh, that um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on a logical assessment of whether or not to vote for the uh, motion or not, then uh, that assessment would come down in favour of the motion. I'm not suggesting that um, uh, the, other <coughs> other uh, the, the other discussions were not influential at all, and I understand the point that is made by Senator Spindler, but uh, I must say that the, the other thing that has convinced me to vote for the, uh, for the motion is the uh, the, the uh, speech uh, by Senator Bolkus uh, in opposition to the motion. And in fact, uh, if there was any politicising of this very important matter, it was by Senator Bolkus. And uh, he should really have uh, really think about that a little bit. If he's going to use the question of racial hatred as a political football, if he's going to use the refugee situation as a political football, as he and Senator McKinnon are doing, then that is a matter that should be discussed by this chamber. And that is a matter that weighs very heavily on my mind at this present point of time. I won't discuss, because I, I would be out of order uh, in detail, uh, my uh, concern that has developed over a period now of uh, three or four months um, uh, with what this minister is doing uh, and how his, uh, 
his statements have divided uh, the community. And that should not be done by a minister in his position, where we are trying, uh, as a country, uh, to create a society in which all persons can live with freedom and dignity and pursue their spiritual development and material well-being and conditions of equal opportunity. Um, and uh, this, particularly when it comes to persons coming to Australia from other lands, this particularly when it comes to giving international protection to persons who have uh, established a well-founded fear of persecution if they are returned to their persecutors and torturers. And this is what this minister uh, is uh, not doing. This minister uh, is injecting, politicising a political element into the arguments in respect of those life and death issues. And I can't um, condone that in any shape or form. When it comes down to the racial hatred uh, legislation, as I said this morning, I am inclined to uh, uh, support that legislation. Um, uh, uh, I've, I've found it rather fascinating how the government over a period of time uh, has uh, uh, denigrated uh, the concept of, um, uh, of uh, the educative role of the law. I mean, I've sat here for 20 odd years and uh, listened to some of the members of the government, uh, some, somebody, uh, a couple of the others too, um, over a period of time and uh, denigrated the idea of the educative role of the law. What's the racial hatred bill all about, to, to, to a large extent? And uh, to that extent, of course, uh, um, uh, I support it. Um, obviously, one cannot legislate uh, to make people moral, but we ought to have a framework of legislation in which basic human rights principles are upheld. And uh, one of those human rights uh, principles is not only that you should not utilise uh, persons, treat them as objects for utilisation for some other purpose, but that you should always affirm the person as a person. And that is a matter that should be beyond politics. And here we have the minister virtually, as Senator uh, Shamaret pointed out, virtually admitting that the reason that they're having, uh, wanting this debate uh, this week is because of the New South Wales uh, elections. Well, so what? The New South Wales elections come and the New South Wales elections go. I couldn't care less about the New South Wales elections, to be quite frank. Uh, but um, uh, but uh, because they, they do come and they do go. This is a matter which does need to be considered uh, to be above uh, party uh, politics and the grubby politickings of politicians. Um, and I um, feel this way, uh, uh, that uh, uh, it has been quite rightly said, um, I think, um, I can't remember one of the opposition uh, uh, speakers mentioned uh, that uh, an essential element of the matter uh, in the racial uh, hatred legislation is the matter of uh, civil remedies and enforcement procedures. And uh, they, of course, all depend on what occurs with the human rights and equal opportunities legislation. Now, I ask you, Minister, to find out from your advisers whether I was informed at all about the proposed amendments to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities uh, 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 the IROC legislation. Was I? Because if I was, I didn't get them. Apparently some people have got uh, privileged positions in this uh, chamber. Uh, I never recall receiving any proposed amendments to that legislation. And um, that is another reason that I am not prepared uh, to, um, uh, I am not prepared to, uh, 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 to support even a second reading speech uh, at this particular juncture. 
um, because so much depends on those amendments, in my view. And so, under those circumstances, uh, uh, I, I uh, support the uh, uh, motion that has been moved uh, by uh, Senator Vanstone, and I hope that uh, we can give mature consideration to, um, uh, to the matters uh, that um, are before, uh, before us in a non-partisan way, because these measures deserve to be treated, I believe, in a non-partisan way. Uh, and, uh, um, and so I uh, ask, uh, I, through you, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I would urge all honourable senators uh, to treat this matter in a non-partisan way, not try to get political point scoring for a tin pot election in New South Wales. Uh, but to bear in mind the importance of this matter for the future of a harmonious society in Australia. And bear that in mind also when it comes to the other matter, the attempt that is being made by the government to send people back to their persecutors, to the, send people back who are, are under threat of coerced abortions and coerced sterilisations and other grave sanctions. Bear that in mind, because if uh, we pass that sort of legislation, as the government wants us to pa uh, pass it, uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, uh, no claim to be a civilised country. The question is that Senator Spindler's amendment be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Uh, the question now is that Senator Hill's a motion be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. I think the, the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is, Senator Hill's amendment be agreed to. Mo motion be agreed to. Um, the ayes move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. And I appoint Senator Penitza for the ayes and Senator Foreman for the noes. There being 32 ayes and 28 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Clark. It now being after 12.45, I'll call on matters of public interest. Any senators on public interest? Senator Bohm. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, today I want to raise uh, some matters of some significance relating to the financial capacity of the uh, Australian Labor Party, in particular the New South Wales Division of the Australian Labor Party, which is technically bankrupt. Now we know it's morally bankrupt, we know it's intellectually bankrupt, we know it's politically bankrupt because we see evidence of that every day in the newspapers. We see it all through the election campaign presently going on in New South Wales. But the fact that it is technically bankrupt financially says a lot about the sort of government you would get in New South Wales if the Labor Party were, were uh, given the opportunity of getting back into the position of power that it had some years ago when it became renowned throughout Australia for the level of its corruption and incompetence. The Labor Party simply can't be trusted with money. And that is evident from what's happened in the way the New South Wales branch of the Labor Party has got itself not only into debt, but is technically bankrupt. Its assets are massively outweighed by its liabilities. Now, if you say that's the way they run their own party, how would they run New South Wales? And of course, we've seen in other states how the Labor Party runs a state. We've, and generally, the word runs in the, South, in, the, in the Labor Party sense means runs down. Because we've seen Western Australia, with Western Australia Inc., running down that state, running down to a situation 
where in fact uh, you've had uh, a significant people, the Premier even, uh, former Premier, uh, indicted, people in jail uh, and so on. In Victoria you saw what Labor running a state meant. Uh, it meant, in fact, the collapse of the state's bank. Uh, you had uh, a whole series of financial disasters resulting, in fact, in the state itself becoming the poor relation to the rest of Australia. Uh, and fortunately, of course, Mr Kennett uh, and his Liberal uh, government in association with the National Party uh, have been able to rescue Victoria. In South Australia, you've seen the same disaster. Now, let's see how much uh, this financial incompetence, and one must say, in some instances, regrettably, evident financial dishonesty. Uh, we, let's see how this really directly relates to New South Wales. Because at the moment, the New South Wales uh, Labor Party owns a building which is worth only a fraction of what it paid for it, and as a result, the New South Wales Labor Party is hugely in debt. Something like $10 million, of which more than half is owed to the Commonwealth Bank, the People's Bank. Now, one can wonder why on earth the Commonwealth Bank uh, became indebted, uh, uh, or became uh, uh, the uh, uh, the, the lender of so much money to such an incompetent crew. And one wonders how it is that this bankrupt organisation, the Labor Party in New South Wales, can be financing the biggest advertising campaign that has ever been seen in a state election in New South Wales. It's outspending the Liberal Party enormously. In fact, I think uh, it was last night they appeared to have about uh, a dominance of uh, commercials, uh, television commercials, something like seven to one uh, on my quick count last night. Whatever it is, there is no dispute about the fact that the Labor Party is massively outspending the Liberal Party and is, appears to be uh, able to, uh, to spend something like four million dollars on advertising alone, apart from all its other costs. Now, of course, the, uh, the Labor Party, Federal Labor Party chairman, uh, Mr Jones, uh, uh, said uh, or let it slip that the federal body of the Labor Party was thinking of intervening in New South Wales. They've already, I understand, uh, put up about a million dollars to try to help the uh, state out. But there's the suggestion of, of intervention, which uh, Mr Jones has uh, since resiled from saying when he said intervention, he didn't mean intervention, he meant intervention. <laughs> now, uh, to what extent this means actually taking over the state or simply trying to bail it out uh, is a matter that uh, will be found out, I think, on March the 31st, conveniently just after the New South Wales state election. But the whole series of questions are now emerging that, quite frankly, the Labor Party must answer if it's to have any credibility at all in New South Wales. Because at the moment, all that happens whenever this matter is raised, as it has been uh, by the media, particularly by Mr Alan Ramsey, who uh, issued a, uh, put out a very, very interesting article uh, on sat in Saturday's Sydney Morning Herald. But whenever this matter is raised, the Labor Party says, oh, look, that's just an organisational matter. You know, the fact that we can't run ourselves has nothing to do with our incompetence and inability to run New South Wales. That's the Labor Party's response. Until it answers these questions, the Labor Party in New South Wales should not be trusted with pocket money, let alone the Treasury of the state. Now, what we have to ask, and I think we have a right to ask, is what deals have been done to stop the Commonwealth Bank foreclosing on Labor over its debt in New South Wales? Now, I don't know what been done. All I do know is that there seem to be many, many people in New South Wales with a far better debt uh, relationship to their assets than the New South Wales Labor Party has who have been foreclosed on by the Commonwealth Bank. But it hasn't foreclosed this time. The other question is how will Labor keep financing its rising debt? How is it paying the $10,000 a week interest bill on its debt? over half a million dollars a year. 
$10,000 a week. Where's the money coming from? Look, if the Labor Party won't tell you where the money's coming from to pay the interest on its own debt, you can ask, can't you, where's the money coming from to pay for its political promises? It won't tell you either. Now, uh, I would submit the reason it won't tell you where the money's coming from for, uh, uh, to pay its interest bill on its huge debt is because, quite frankly, the Labor Party would be very embarrassed to reveal the sources of that money. And maybe uh, we could look at some, uh, some sources uh, of funds that have been revealed in the Courier-Mail recently to examine that, and uh, uh, I'll deal with that if I have time uh, at another, another occasion. But how is the Labor Party financing this huge $10,000 a week? They won't tell you because it would be far too politically embarrassing to reveal it. Now, where is the money coming from to fund Labor's election campaign, which includes, as I said earlier, something like $4 million in advertising expenditure? How can the, the Labor Party get that sort of money? Is the Commonwealth Bank funding their overdraft, even though, even though the, uh, the uh, Labor Party is, is technically bankrupt? Now, how on earth can this kind of expenditure, only a proportion of which, only a part of which, will be re refunded by, uh, uh, by the state for uh, electoral funding? Only a part of it will do that. Where is the rest of the money coming from? I mean, is it, uh, is it coming from the... The, the union movement. Well, let me remind uh, the Senate. The union movement is owed something like two million dollars in New South Wales in back rent by the Labor Party. Now, is the union movement prepared to forego what it's owed and put up even more money to this uh, this bottomless pit in New South Wales? This is competent bunch who couldn't run a lolly shop, and I say that because the way the New South Wales Labor governments have run in the past has been regarding government as a sort of lolly shop where you get in for your lollies while you can. And this is what intrigues me. If the uh, Labor Party has been able to avoid foreclosure because the Commonwealth Bank says, well, look, we'll wait till after the election, what is it that would prompt the, uh, the, the Commonwealth Bank to think? that uh, a New South Wales Labor government would somehow significantly change the financial capacity of the New South Wales Labor Party to pay off its huge interest bill and pay off its debt. Why would this magically happen? An election win mean that all of a sudden the Commonwealth Bank's uh, losing investment in Labor could be paid off. Now, I. Uh, must say, uh, it seems to me there is no reason whatsoever, no honest reason whatsoever, why Labor coming to power in New South Wales, if such a, a terrible thing were to happen, would mean that it would suddenly be able to pay off its huge debt and emerge from its technical bankruptcy. Now, I presume it must be because uh, uh, the Commonwealth Bank must take the view that it, it expects a car government to be like. Uh, the previous Labor governments in New South Wales, back to the good old days of graft, corruption, the lolly shop mentality, and the ALP will be able to make enough out of being in government to pay off the debt. Otherwise, why is the Commonwealth Bank giving the Labor Party this special benefit that it doesn't seem to give so many, uh, uh, so many other debtors? I mean, it seems to me also we can ask uh, uh, quite reasonably whether or not the style of the classic New South Wales right wing, uh, uh, which would dominate any Labor government if uh, the people in New South Wales were unfortunate enough to end up with one uh, next Saturday, you wonder whether the style has already been, uh, if you like, foreshadowed, the particular style of Labor, foreshadowed by, for example, the, the way uh, uh, the Labor, a Labor government, it says, will hand over uh, the Sydney showground to Mr Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation for a planned film studio complex without a formal tender. That's if it wins uh, Saturday's election. The New South Wales uh, Labor Party spokesman on finance, Mr Michael Egan, 
said at the weekend that the Labor Party did not believe it was improper or necessary to have a formal tender. A Labor government would negotiate directly with News Corporation to ensure the film studio complex was built on the showground site. Now, uh, the fact is, other people are interested in that site. But the traditional way the Labor Party in New South Wales does deals is to do a deal with a mate and there is some benefit, one way or another, to the Labor Party that emerges out of it. Now, is this the sort of deal that the Commonwealth Bank has in mind when it thinks that uh, maybe it might be able to, uh, to uh, resolve uh, what is staring, the loss that's staring it in the face if the Labor Party is to win the next election? And I must say uh, I'm overjoyed to see that the Sydney Morning Herald uh, editorial today says this, the Treasurer and Arts Minister, Mr Peter Collins, is right to reject the private threat from Fox Filmed Entertainment, a wholly owned subsidiary of Mr Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, that it could move its planned film studio from Sydney to Melbourne if the state government insists on retaining the tendering process. And uh, Mr Collins, it goes on, while continuing to insist on the proper tendering process, has put his finger on the necessity of such a process to be observed. And I quote, secret deals were the very thing that brought Western Australia and Victoria to its knees under the administration of Labor governments. Exactly the same sort of deal that bankrupted those states would be imposed on New South Wales if the bankrupt state ALP were to get its hands on the lolly jar. And so uh, I can understand why the Commonwealth Bank is prepared to let uh, the New South Wales Labor Party maintain its huge indebtedness uh, until after the election. And one wonders in that context, what would the Labor Party do about the Sydney casino? What sort of secret deal would it come to in that uh, situation? And we have, in fact, a clear warning to the people in New South Wales. If you want to go back to the days of those secret deals, particularly secret deals, I might say, in this instance, and both of those that, uh, uh, that uh, I've mentioned, could bear, could bear some relationship with media proprietors. If you want to go back to that kind of situation in New South Wales, then, uh, and I don't believe the people in New South Wales do, then clearly uh, that's, uh, to get it, uh, you would do you would vote Labor. But it is interesting that this, the Labor Party, and in particular the company, uh, its subsidiary, Labor Centenary House Proprietary Limited, has not yet lodged its annual return. The latest on record is 1993. There's no annual return for 1994. It's in breach yet again of the Australian Securities Commission requirements. It breaks the law. It doesn't pay its bills. It does secret deals. That's what the Labor Party in New South Wales is all about, and that's the party that frankly has no credibility, particularly when it's outspending the Liberal uh, National Coalition in New South Wales in this election campaign. Right. Senator O'Chee. Mr Acting Deputy President, today is the International Day Against Race Discrimination, and I thought, in view of the tirade we had from Senator Bulkus just before 12 o'clock, in which he accused honourable senators on this side of being racists and all sorts of things, I thought it might be appropriate to examine the government's credibility on the issue of race discrimination. Because you see, Mr Acting Deputy President, race discrimination isn't combated by what you say so much as how you behave yourself. And what I want to tell the Senate today is how the Labor Party tells the ethnic community of this country one thing in relation to a commitment to do away with race discrimination, but then quite happily tolerates behaviour by members of its party, members of its parliamentary party, which is quite contrary to the standard that they would have the ethnic community believe they support. In other words, the Labor Party is hypocritical when it comes to the issue of race discrimination. And the evidence I wish to present to the Senate, Mr Acting Deputy President, 
is evidence contained in a radio interview that was conducted on 6PR on the 10th of March this year, in which a Labor senator alleged that there was some dark, sinister conspiracy, Mr Acting Deputy President, between the Liberal and National parties, the National Civic Council, the refugee associations and the legal profession to populate Northern Australia with Asians. Now, this ludicrous nonsense, and it is quite simply ludicrous nonsense, Mr Acting Deputy President, is part of a long-running saga in which this senator has shown himself incapable of examining issues of migration with an open mind. And I'll read to the Senate portions of this interview that demonstrate the point that the Labor Party is quite happy to tolerate less than satisfactory behaviour amongst its own people. The senator in question said to the interviewer in relation to the Migration Amendment Bill number four, he said, quote, but behind all this, Rob, is the hidden agenda of that very secret of organisations, the National Civic Council, who want to populate the northern end of Australia. And the interviewer, Mr Broadfield, said, I'm sorry. And the Labor senator continued. He said, no accident that the NCC have infiltrated and influenced a number of refugee support groups around Australia, so much so that there are some of those groups who now do not even talk about refugees anymore. They only talk about asylum seekers. And Mr Broadfield, quite puzzled, said, now the National Civic Council, Council Bob Santa Maria's mob, as most Australians would know it, you are saying he's in league with the opposition now. And the Labor senator said, no, 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 I'm saying that the NCC have infiltrated political parties refugee support groups and others in our community. Mr Broadfield interrupted and said, to what end? And this particular senator, so full of himself, continued to say, the legal profession as well. And Mr Broadfield said, no, but to what end? For what purpose? And the Labor senator said, to populate the northern end of Australia. And Mr Broadfield questioned him and said, with Asians? And the Labor senator said, with, and he was going to say with Asians, and he changed his mind and he said, with, to populate the northern end of Australia, to take the pressures of countries in the Asian region that they say are overpopulated. Now it's by no accident that we've got the full-time secretary of the NCC in Western Australia, Mr Richard Egan, who is also the secretary of the WA representative of the Indochina Refugee Association, end of quote. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, this must be the most disturbing manifestation of a psychological disorder that I could possibly imagine. If it is not a disturbing manifestation of a psychological disorder, then it is quite clearly the case that what we have is a Labor Party that is doing this sort of thing for deliberate political purposes. In other words, it's trying to whip up a little bit of anti-Asian sentiment in Western Australia for its own political purposes, yet it comes and comes to this parliament and berates the coalition and says that the coalition isn't fed income about race relations in this country and the coalition doesn't understand the issue of race. Mr Acting Deputy President, I understand the issue of race. My colleague in the Liberal Party, Senator Abetz, understands the issue of race because we live with it every day. The sanctimonious piffle with which we are bombarded is quite simply offensive, but it's something with which we have to live. But when the sanctimonious piffle from the other side of the chamber is accompanied by this sort of crass, paranoid delusion, it is quite clear that the Labor Party, in attempting to get the ethnic vote in this country by spreading dishonest statements about the, uh, the coalition in relation to ethnic affairs, is totally and utterly hypocritical. And no honourable senator could defend the behaviour which I have just outlined to the Senate. No honourable senator could come into this chamber and say, 
that that sort of speech was anything other than a crude attempt, the very crudest of attempts, to whip up the old fear of the yellow peril. And isn't it interesting that there are a lot of people who have come to this country on boats? And not all of those people who have come to this country on boats have come here from Southeast Asia. And isn't it interesting that some of the people who have come to this country on boats as economic refugees now love to point the finger at another group of people who come to this country in boats simply by virtue of their race? Now, what honourable senators on this side of the chamber say, and I know Senator Abetz shares my views entirely in relation to refugees, is that this country has a right to determine who is entitled to be a refugee and otherwise. And we have real concerns that this country should not be flooded with refugees. But we also accept that there are certain people who have such real and well-founded fears of persecution and the committee on which Senator Betts and I sat heard evidence of that, that they should not be automatically precluded from a right to at least have their case heard as to whether they are a refugee. Certainly anybody who is faced with the threat of forced sterilisation, who is faced with the threat of forced abortion, and who is faced with the threat that if they are returned to the People's Republic of China and deliver a baby only to see it suffer infanticide, have a reasonable case for their claim to be heard and properly determined. And that is all Senator Abetz and I say, that they should have their case properly heard and determined. But for some reason, the Labor Party is quite happy to allow this sort of bigoted opinion to be aired on the national airwaves. For what purpose? For what good? I don't know, Mr Acting Deputy President. I cannot see any good from any honourable senator whipping up the old yellow peril argument. When you get in trouble, say that we're going to be deluged with hundreds of thousands of Asians. Always makes good copy. Unfortunately, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm one of the Asians in this country whose family has had an association with Australia that goes back to 1888. Our family has made over a hundred years of contribution to this nation. The suggestion that somehow the Asians are here to rape and pillage this country is to me and is to the entire Asian community in this country of Australia offensive, disgusting and is, in, and is designed to lower the standing of the Asian community. The Asian community in this country is united in one thing because there are ethnic differences and religious differences and geographical differences, but they are united in one thing, a desire to see a better future for their children as Australians than they would have had had they grown up in another place. And that means a real commitment, a deep down commitment to the betterment of Australia and to an acceptance of their role as an Australian first and foremost in order to achieve that. This sort of behaviour from the Labor senator in question demeans that commitment to Australia at a time when this Labor government is spending millions of dollars to encourage people to become Australian citizens. I think there are a fair few people out there in the Asian community in this country who would say, why bother? if this is what we're going to be subjected to, if we can't be judged on our achievements but only on the colour of our skin, because that seems to be all that matters on the other side of the chamber. If this sort of behaviour is tolerated, 
Now what I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, is it is time for the Labor Party to act if they are to have any sense of honour and decency in this matter. It is time for the Labor Party to abandon the mere words and to act to stamp out this intolerance, this blight, not just on their party but on this parliament, that such views are allowed to continue. And the reason I say that is simply this, Mr Acting Deputy President. I want to reveal here and now the name of the honourable senator on the other side who gave this radio interview. Because the name of the other honourable senator is Senator McKinnon, who happens to be the chairman of the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Migration, Mr Acting Deputy President. The Joint Parliamentary Committee on Migration, and these are his balanced, reasoned, rational views. Well, I understand Senator McKinnon did come here on a boat. I checked out his maiden speech. He was a ten-pound migrant to this country. I assume he came here by ship. He may have come here by, by plane. But he made it very clear in his maiden speech that he came here seeking a better life. What's the difference whether you come to Australia on a boat from Ireland or a boat from somewhere in Southeast Asia? You are entitled to have your case heard. And that's all that we on this side of the chamber ask. Equality and fairness before the law. If the Labor Party is to be taken seriously on the issue of race, Senator McKinnon must resign as chairman of the committee. The Labor Party put him there. If he won't resign, the Labor Party should sack him as chairman of the committee. Because otherwise the word can go out from here to every ethnic organisation in Australia, to every media outlet in Australia, to every newspaper and radio station, to every television station in this country. The Labor Party is not fair dinkum on the issue of race relations. Today is the day in which they can repair this egregious fault. Today, on the International Day on Race Discrimination, they either sack Senator McKinnon or they hang their heads in shame. Senator Patterson. I take this opportunity to speak on matters of public importance because it is Seniors Week in both New South Wales and Victoria. March the 19th to the 26th is the week in which those two states we celebrate with seniors and acknowledge their contribution to our community and to make a commitment to the needs of seniors in our, in our community. As I mentioned in the notice of motion this morning, there are 2,109,109 Australians aged 65 years and over as of June 1994, and that represents 11.82 per cent of the population. But uh, we also need to address this issue because, as we see over the next uh, 30 uh, or so years, 35 years, that the number of people in that age group will increase from to, uh, to 5.2 million, or over 20 per cent of the population. That is, one in five people, one in every five people in Australia will be over 65 years of age. And there are many issues which are of great concern to seniors today, and for many of them, they're the pioneers who are actually paving the way for those of us who are going to be in that age group in the, the, in the 21st century, paving the way for us, making a mark and, and making it easier for those of us who will follow behind us. And the issues that, that concern them are issues such as age discrimination in the workforce, which also includes compulsory retirement on the basis of age, issues of retirement incomes and issues of superannuation, issues which affect them in the area of social security. You only had to listen to talkback radio, as I was doing over the weekend, and listen to how long people have to hang on to the telephone when they're ringing up the Department of Social Security. Issues of health issues of health funding and health insurance and access to health and waiting lists, issues of community care and uh, issues that enable cho real choice for older people when they need assistance to either have care in their own home or to choose to live in residential care. Issues that face those who care for older people 
many of whom are older themselves and, in particular, older women. Issues that are associated with residential accommodation and its funding, and mental health issues such as the increase in the number of people with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. As I said, this is a week and a time in which we should celebrate and we have the opportunity to acknowledge the contribution seniors have, seniors have had in contributing to our great nation. We look back at many of them who have fought in uh, wars and uh, as younger and younger people come into the community, those gallant uh, exercises that young men and young women and giving up their lives and giving up many of them their health to fight for the security of Australia and fight for the freedoms that we enjoy in Australia and take so much for granted. Many of those people now are in the twilight years of their life, in the older years of their life, and, uh, and of course it's through, the, uh, through them that we have this freedom which we so easily and often forget about. We also acknowledge the contribution that they've made through their participation in the paid workforce, many of them working now in their 60s, 70s and 80s. In fact, I met a man the other day who said he just retired from his butcher shop at 86 and how he was missing the contact with, it, with uh, his customers. So many of them are there working and contributing to our community at what many would have considered some years ago as a very old age. But not only are they in the paid workforce, they're there as unpaid work, doing unpaid work as carers of older people, carers of grandchildren, and many grandparents now take enormous responsibilities in caring for young children at home while their parents are out working, as voluntary workers in the, in the community, and we see examples over and over again of older people playing their roles in hospitals, playing their roles in community organisations, and also the work that they undertake um, in continuing to make their fa to interacting in their families. I was only talking to a colleague today, and I don't think uh, I won't obviously discuss who it is, but the person was saying what an important role the grandparent had played in a particular issue that faced their family just in the last few weeks. And often we forget the role that they play in uh, giving guidance and assistance, and sometimes being a linchpin or a, a, a conduit between the younger person and their families when communication breaks down. But when we look at what the government has done for seniors, they've done much to undermine the certainty and lifestyle of many of them. Superannuation, for instance, we've seen continual and changes in the goalposts, complicated and constantly changing sets of rules. There's increasing uncertainty with a compulsory superannuation guaranteed charge that there be adequate superannuation for the majority of Australians. And for women, the situation in regard to superannuation is even more grim. It's generally acknowledged that because of women's broken work patterns, lower incomes and the effect of taxes and charges on superannuation account, many women will be severely disadvantaged in their senior years. And uh, I guess I remember a poem, and I don't know if I can quote it from memory here, that, George, that Joyce Gren Grenfell quotes uh, quoted, and she said, I've joined the old time dance band, dance band. The trouble is that there are too many women over and no gentlemen to spare. It seems a shame it's not the same, but still it has to be. Some ladies have to dance together, and one of them is me. And that's a very poignant example of the fact that in the old, old population of those over 85, a significant proportion of those are women. And we haven't addressed the issue, or the government hasn't addressed the issue, of women and their particular needs in, with regards to superannuation retirement incomes. And uh, it is a sad reflection on this government that it really has not done enough to address that issue, in particular for the many women who are coming into that age group through the baby boom who will be faced with, with inadequate incomes to um, live out their, their um, older lives. The other area in which the government has failed seniors in, is in regard to the income and assets tests for the assessment of, of the pension. Time and time and time again in this chamber, we have pointed out to the government the inequities associated with the treatment of unrealised capital gains on shares 
as income for the purpose of assessing the pension. Now, we might have seen a decline in the um, number of letters coming to our offices from pensioners on this issue at the moment because of the state of the share market. But once those shares start to increase again, we'll start to see a fluctuation in income for pensioners that is totally intolerable. And when shares were going up, um, I, I know and I know that my colleagues had letter after letter after letter from people with a small amount of money, $20,000, $30,000 in shares, and it was having a huge effect on their income, on their, um, the flow of their income from fortnight to fortnight. The coalition has uh, said that we will rescind that unfair legislation in, in government. The government was forced into a, uh, an inquiry which was undertaken, and we've yet to see a proper response from the government on that or any action. And pensioners are still waiting, and I still get letters asking what the government's going to do about it. Another area where the government has failed older people is we've now had report after report after report. The Gregory report and, and a number of other reports talking about the inadequacies in the funding for nursing home and hostels. And the government has failed to address that. There's also been a failure of the government to address the need of older people with dementia. And we've seen uh, various groups now coming together and saying to the government it is intolerable, it is impossible now to run a dementia-specific unit. Now, if you run a, de a dementia-specific unit, you can do it more cheaply than you can in a nursing home, but it's more costly than a hostel. The government fails to acknowledge that, and very few, if any, associations or organisations are now venturing into the area of caring for people with dementia in residential care because it is not financially viable to do so, and the government has failed to address that. Nor has the government addressed the need to have flexible respite care. It is not always appropriate for older people to be, have respite care in a nursing home or hostel. For many carers, the effort of taking or getting a, um, a person for whom they're caring into respite care in a nursing home or hostel is not worth the effort because when they come back after two or three weeks in respite care, to settle them back into their own environment is more, more than it's worth having the two or three weeks off. And yet we don't see the government addressing creative programs. I'll give you an example of one that I saw in South Australia. Aged Care Cottages in South Australia run a program which was uh, triggered off and seeded by a donation of something like, I think, $250,000, where they have 600 volunteers taking or, or giving respite care to carers. And that respite care is designed to meet the needs of the individual. You don't try and squeeze the individual into the program. What happens is that the program is designed to meet the needs of the individual. And if the person who has dementia um, used to like to go fishing at Victor Harbour, then what they might do is find a volunteer or a couple who will take the person away fishing to Victor Harbour, back to where they used to go when they were younger. And for many who have dementia, some of their earlier memories are much clearer and they're not as confused if they go to somewhere where they know. The carer doesn't see that they've failed by having to say, my husband or my wife is in a residential care while I go on holidays. They can say, I've never liked fishing, my husband's gone fishing. And so they, haven't, they don't perceive themselves as having failed. They may take the couple away together and give the carer respite care. What they do is to tailor the respite care to meet the needs of the individual. They're the sorts of programs that we ought to be seeing being assisted and funded by the government, programs which are flexible and which meet the needs of individuals, not programs where we have to squeeze the individuals into the, needs of, uh, into the uh, dimensions of the program. There's been, report, there's been report after report after report on the HACK program and its need for um, review. We saw with uh, some of the COAG meetings, some of the meetings of uh, the uh, min relevant ministers, the need to actually reduce the overlap 
and the fact that there are, I think, I think Senator, uh, sorry, Mrs. Tian, Minister for Health in Victoria, told me that there's 39 various programs in the Home and Community Care Program. And what happens is, because there's no case management or an organise, organise, overriding organisation or inter good cooperation between the state and the federal governments, that in fact what you end up doing is finding people falling between the stools. What we need to ensure is that the service is not there for the bureaucrats, is not there for the service providers, is not there for the state or federal governments, but is there for the individuals who need the care. As I've said before, one of the things that older people face is age discrimination. We've got compulsory retirement. The government has done nothing. We've had private members' bills brought in here by Mr Connolly and myself previous uh, parliamentary sessions to eliminate bar, uh, age discrimination in the Commonwealth Public Service. Nothing is done about it. Why should we fix retirement age at a particular age? It makes no sense and makes no allowance for individual differences in fitness or capacity in older people. The government has been very tardy in addressing this issue. The other thing that uh, the government has been tardy in, in, in addressing is the issue of age discrimination. You know they're, they're all very hot shot on issues associated with uh, with uh, women's issues, and we hear constantly. But where are they when it comes to the issues of age discrimination? Now I remember, as uh, when I was teaching at Lincoln Institute, there was an advertisement with uh, for some furniture, and uh, it had an older lady sitting in the in, in the uh, sort of structure made out with four sides. She was drinking a cup of tea, and the the ad on the bottom said, uh, "Make a playpen for your grandma out of this modular furniture." Now, if you go through the advertising material, you can often find such age discrimination. Fortunately, it's being reduced, and um, my students wrote quite a heated letter to, to the people who put that advertisement in. But you will still see discrimination as portraying in the media in particular, and in government policy, and in, uh, as I said, even in advertising. Older people portrayed as dependent, frail, inflexible, passive, unproductive, mentally deteriorating, or even needing institutionalisation. Now that is not. Order, <coughs> order. The Honourable Senator Tarvis, Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President. Can I uh, commence my comments by uh, simply uh, congratulating Senator Patterson on her very genuine uh, approach to the uh, topic that she just spoke about? Mr. Acting Deputy President, the contribution I want to make to the uh, matters of public interest debate today is to give recognition to the fact that today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. This International Day was uh, agreed to pursuant to Resolution No. 2142 of the 21st Session of the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1966. Australia voted for that resolution. And Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, it is uh, noteworthy that uh, at that time, of course, the Liberal National Parties were the government uh, who controlled our vote at the United Nations for the purposes of designating today as the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. When we then look at our Federal Constitution, Mr Acting Deputy President, in uh, Section 51, uh, Placitum 26, we note that in 1967 an amendment was made to our Constitution deleting the words other than the Aboriginal race in any state. In other words, the Aboriginal people were incorporated into the Commonwealth Constitution. Once again, another initiative of the uh, Liberal side of politics. A referendum, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, which won the overwhelming support of the Australian people. And given the earlier debate in the Senate today, it is 
with a note of sadness that I feel necessary to get up and talk on the International Day for the Elimination of Racial, racial Discrimination. Because in the past there has been what I consider to be a fairly bipartisan approach, as was taken with this uh, amendment to our constitution to uh, give Aboriginal people the same status as those of us who uh, have a different uh, coloured pigment in our skins, or in fact lack pigment in our skins. So, Mr uh, Acting Pr Deputy President, uh, it is important to note that the Liberal Party has a very strong and proud tradition in this area. And Mr Acting Deputy President, we were submitted to some revisionist history earlier today by the Minister for Immigration, who suggested that it was a uh, former Labor Minister who had, in effect, got rid of the White Australia policy. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, it is worthy to note that the current Prime Minister is a great supporter of the former Premier of New South Wales, Jack Lang. Indeed, the current Prime Minister moved within the New South Wales division of the Labor Party to allow Jack Lang to be reinstituted into membership. Indeed, the Prime Minister comments about the fact that he sat at the feet of Jack Lang and had a great impact on his life. And we have a look at Jack Lang's policies, Mr Acting Deputy President. They were unashamedly supportive of the then White Australia policy. And also Mr Lang was, in any interpretation of the events, anti-Semitic because he was concerned about the role that the Jewish community allegedly played in the black market. He sought to paint all Jews with a particular brush. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, today Senator O'Chi has highlighted another example of the departure from what I would have hoped would have been a bipartisan approach to these important issues of tolerance and elimination of racial discrimination. And Mr Acting Deputy President, it saddens me greatly that the Chairman of the Immigration Committee of this Parliament should say in a media release, Australia could become flooded with hundreds of thousands of boat people from China and other Asian countries. And that was in relation to a bill that was once before us, now no longer is before us, has been withdrawn and undoubtedly will surface again here later on in a slightly different form. But Mr Acting Deputy President, what that legislation seeks to do is to talk about the fertility control policies of countries. Then there is another subclause which says it is, for the purposes of this legislation, the fertility control policy of China is considered to be one such example. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, why did Senator McKeon find it necessary to talk about hundreds of thousands of boat people from China and some other Asian countries? The legislation, as I understood it, was not designed to victimise Chinese and Asians. It was designed, allegedly, to have, an, to have a response to a perceived problem as to what might happen with fertility control policies being used for certain purposes. Why the need to refer to Chinese and Asians? Why couldn't he have just said, this is designed to stop people from uh, having their fertility control policies in their countries being used. But no, he had to pick on Chinese and other Asians. One really has to look behind the mentality that would allow a senator to make those sort of comments. 
and clearly laying behind that is a form or is a uh, thought process which I believe is not necessarily in tune with a concept of elimination of racial discrimination. And I found that uh, comment by Senator McKinnon particularly unfortunate and unhelpful. And it's very unfortunate and unhelpful when combined with that sort of statement by the chairman, we have the minister for immigration seeking to import improper motives onto the opposition when we sought to delay the discussion of a bill earlier this day so that we could consider it indeed a delay of some only seven days. And he sought to say that the Labor Party was the champion of abolishing racial discrimination. In the few examples that I have just mentioned, the Prime Minister's wholesale embrace of Jack Lang with his outrageous racial policies, the Labor Party's current embrace of Senator Jim McKeonan as chairman of that important committee. I would have thought the Labor Party would be the last of the parties to try to stand up and give a patronising lecture to people on the opposition about their attitude to ethnic groups within this country. Senator O'Chee clearly is an Australian by birth, but he has certain physical characteristics that clearly indicate that he has a heritage other than Anglo-Saxon. And the National Party found no hindrance, Mr Acting Deputy President, in endorsing him for, as I understand it, a safe Senate seat, indeed a casual vacancy? Yes, for a casual vacancy, a guaranteed introduction to the Senate. In my own case, Mr Acting Deputy President, I was not born in Australia. I suppose by looking at me you would not necessarily be able to tell that I was not born in Australia because I don't have those distinguishing features that uh, I refer to about Senator O'Chi. But when you have a look at my surname, you know, the Z in it gives it away. <laughs> Most people would say, well, that is a foreign name. Where, where is it from? What's your heritage? And a lot of people ask me that question. But Mr Acting Deputy President, the Liberal Party in my state found no difficulty in endorsing me, once again for a casual vacancy, a straight entrance into this Senate, to represent the people of Tasmania and to be a representative of the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party has had a very, very proud tradition of supporting the ethnic communities, working with them, endorsing them and uh, having them sit in this chamber and indeed in other houses all around this country. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, it really does ill behove the Minister and the Australian Labor Party to try to score points off the opposition, saying that somehow they are better managers of uh, the ethnic groups within Australia. Indeed, Mr Acting Deputy President, I used an analogy once, and I would seek to uh, repeat it here. And that is, whilst there is a lot of talk within the community about Australia being a multicultural nation, my view is that, yes, we are drawn from a lot of different backgrounds, but it is like a good curry. And that is, there are a whole lot of different herbs and spices mixed into one, but you do not give preference to one particular herb or spice. You describe it as a curry and it is the full flavour of all the different components that give the food a distinct flavour. And indeed, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, it is today in Australia that Australian culture has a distinct flavour because of the Chinese contribution, the German contribution, the Dutch contribution, Asian contribution, and above all, of course, the English contribution which has had such a very significant impact on our country and uh, indeed on the formation of this parliament, the way our legal system operates. 
but altogether, Mr Acting Deputy President, I believe that all the ethnic communities working together can achieve a result which will make Australia a standard bearer in the rest of the world in relation to our approach to the question of the intermingling of the different races. And Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, it is therefore sad that on this, the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, we had to suffer the sort of uh, commentary from the Minister for Immigration, because I would have thought that if there is one thing a Minister for Immigration ought to be seeking to do is to bring about harmony within the portfolio of immigration between the different ethnic communities and, above all, Mr Acting Deputy President, to get a bipartisan approach to the question of uh, any legislation that is required to deal with migration and to deal with uh, matters such as racial hatred. Mr Acting Deputy President, there is no one on this side of the House that would in any way condone racial discrimination or racial hatred. And Mr Acting Deputy President, the events that we saw on our TVs just uh, over the weekend concerning the rally in, uh, I believe it was Melbourne, is one that does deeply disturb every decent thinking Australian that people would hold those views. However, Mr Acting Deputy President, we on this side of the House take the view, no matter how obnoxious those views are, people ought to be allowed in general terms to express them, but we will nevertheless work without ceasing to ensure that there is within the community of, uh, within the community of Australia an acceptance of all the different racial groups and accepting them as full Australians as part of mainstream Australia without trying to marginalise them by uh, treating them the way the Minister has. Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, and I believe that Australia has already come a long way in achieving that as a result of the golden age of Australian politics, which was the Liberal era under Robert Menzies, John Gorton and uh, Harold Holt and Billy McMahon. <laughs> Honourable the Minister. <coughs> no comment. Uh, I move that the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2 p.m. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.
Questions without notice. Senator Hill. Mr President, my question is directed to Senator Evans, representing the Prime Minister. Remind the Minister that Labor Party President and Member for Laylor Barry Jones has had the guts to admit that there was not a secret deal between Mr Howard and Mr Packer over changes to cross-media rules. Now that Mr Jones has confirmed that there was no deal, Order. why shouldn't Mr Keating be brought to account for his lies and attempted character assassination and forced to resign? Why shouldn't the same standards be applied to Mr Keating as he would seek to apply to others? The order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Evans. Well, Mr President, Mr Jones also had the good sense to acknowledge he didn't know what he was talking about on that or indeed anything else that he opened his mouth about in that uh, order. unfortunate interview on Sunday. The truth of the matter is that Mr Jones is not in a position to know. Mr Jones is not in a position to know what the Order. nature of any information that was held privily by the Prime Minister might be about this extremely sensitive matter. And the truth of the matter is, as I've said on innumerable occasions, the evidence for that belief on the part of the Prime Minister doesn't need anything more than the public record to substantiate it. A public record which amply demonstrates that save and except for that little time in 1991 when Mr Howard was doing a deal of a different kind with another media proprietor, there has been absolute consistency of approach on the part of Mr Howard about his belief that the present cross-media rules are inadequate, inappropriate, in need of review, in need of amendment. There is also on the public record a very clear statement by Mr Howard and various of his acolytes about the necessity for the Trade Practices Act to possibly have a role in that particular area as the appropriate way of dealing with any monopolisation that might exist. There is also on the public record, however, clear statements from the Trade Practices Commissioner, Professor Fells, that the Trade Practices Act has no such potential application because you're talking about different markets. You've also had on the public record an absolute unwillingness on the part of Mr Howard over and over again to respond to specific questions about what the nature of his policy commitments will be, what he will do in fact, in practice, and you've had a failure to produce any such policy, of course, and there will continue to be such a failure all the way through until the next election. You're talking about someone here on the opposition side without any shred of credibility at all on that particular issue, and the government's case stands very firmly in the way in which it's been put. Supplementary, Senator Hill. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, for his honesty, Barry Jones has now been bucketed by the minister in the, in the Senate. You know, some sense of loyalty to his party president, I would, have, uh, I would have thought. Whilst the minister continues this farce of arguing that the evidence for a secret deal, the secret evidence for a secret deal, is in fact on the public record. What are these extra matters that you say that the prime minister holds privily? What, are, what is this extra evidence that we don't know of? And if he is not prepared to put up that evidence, why shouldn't we assume, as did Barry Jones, that he in fact lied to the Australian people, and why shouldn't he resign? The Minister, Senator Evans. The President of the ALP, Barry Jones, made no such assumption and no such statement. He just expressed his own rather idiosyncratic view uh, of the circumstances of the particular occasion, not a view that was conceivably based on any information Order. at all. The situation is as I've described. We're not in a position. We're not in a position. Mr. Keating's not in a position. Mr. Lee's not in a position. And I'm not in a position, obviously, to disclose sources that don't want to reveal themselves. But you don't need sources to make the point. You don't need sources to make the point that what we have on the opposition side is a squalid willingness to trade in a way that is seen by the opposition as politically advantageous and beneficial. That's what we've got on the other side of politics, and you ought to be ashamed of that. You ought to be ashamed of your utter incapacity and unwillingness to be frank and honest with the Australian people about what your media policy is. What your media policy is that is one that would clearly accommodate a major proprietor in print having a major interest in a major television the network in the same city. The That's what you've said and you haven't denied it. Order. I draw the attention of order. I draw the attention of honourable senators to the presence in the President's Gallery of a parliamentary delegation from the Russian State Duma, led by the Deputy Chairman of the State Duma, Mr Alexander Venjarovsky. On behalf of honourable senators, I have pleasure in welcoming you to the Senate and trust that your visit will be both informative and enjoyable. Yeah. Senator Kearney. Mr. Uh, President, Mr. President, my question is directed to the uh, Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Evans. 
Could you tell us what are the implications of the High Court decision last week for the future of the native title legislation? What is the government's reaction to the statement by the Western Australian Premier that he will continue to fight against that legislation? And will the government accept the opposition leader's proposal to make the legislation more workable? Oh, good question. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. <laughs> Mr President, the High Court decision on Mabo and the Native Title Act is a complete and absolute vindication of the stance that the Commonwealth Government has taken on the constitutionality of our legislation, as well as, of course, on the principles of justice which underlie that legislation. It's now open for the West Australian Government to come on board and to cooperate, as other states and territories are doing, in putting together a sensible and equitable regime for providing justice to Aboriginal Australians for the first time. The Commonwealth is certainly concerned about the uncertainty relating to the new titles issued in WA since 93. Premier Court has deliberately ignored the processes that were set down in the Native Title Act, and he has to take ultimate responsibility for the effect of his decision in WA. He has to take responsibility for the waste of at least $4 million of taxpayers' money, and he has to take responsibility for the uncertainty that now surrounds some thousands of titles that have been issued since 1993. The uncertainty, such as it is in WA, is wholly of that state government's doing, and it's up to them now to decide how best to fix the mess that they've created. We are nevertheless prepared to work with the West Australian Government to ensure that issues arising from this decision can be addressed cooperatively. Preliminary talks have already been held at ministerial level with the court government and further discussion at both officials and ministerial level will obviously be needed. Mr Howard tells us that the Act needs to be made more workable. He hasn't given us any information as to about the respects in which it needs to be made more workable except to say that he's going to respond appropriately to the responsibilities and the, uh, the interests of the states in this respect. Not a word about the interests of those who the legislation is entitled Order. is designed to assist. Not a word about anything other than the state interests, and that's typical. We don't know what in detail the prescription is going to be because there was not a word said about this in the otherwise extremely lengthy statement on a whole variety of policy issues that was made by Mr Howard to the Liberal State Conference over the weekend. This is not an issue on which he feels comfortable, and that's perfectly obvious the reason why. We've got no doubt at all that the Native Title Act is perfectly workable in its present form, and that Mr Howard's reference, as Michael Lavash said over the weekend, is simply code for gutting and filleting this legislation, as the opposition wanted to do with the Land Fund Act. Perhaps he's going to get Richard Court to draft the legislative amendments for him. We've always said that we'd see how the provisions of the Act operate before we'd consider the, any question of amendment, as is normal practice for legislation. It's only been in operation for a year. We won't compromise any of the principles in the Act which does represent an appropriate balance between competing interests. Any amendments that we make will go only to improving procedures under the Act and won't affect the spirit of the law. Nor will we accept, Mr President, any prescription from the opposition that goes to the spirit of this law or anything else that we've been doing so far as Aboriginal legislation and social justice programs are concerned. The heart of this legislation is the spirit that we understand to be at issue here so far as Aboriginal people is concerned. And I can understand, Senator Hill, you don't want to talk about Aboriginal people's interests because you simply don't understand them. You didn't understand Order, them when you took your opposition the chair, to the Mabo legislation. You didn't understand the Senator issues Evans. at stake here when you played the role that you did in opposing the land fund legislation, and you certainly didn't understand the sensitivities that are involved for Aboriginal people when you took the position that you did, and Mr Howard continues to support him every inch of the way in taking the position that you did, the squalid and tawdry position that you did on the Hindmarsh Aboriginal Documents Affair. You have had three major opportunities to get it right so far as Aboriginal affairs over the last year is concerned, with Mabo, with the Land Fund and with Hindmarsh. <coughs> and on every one of these occasions you have been wrong Order, and three Senator strikes Hill. and you are out. Three strikes and you are out. You have demonstrated an absolute unwillingness and an unwillingness to acknowledge the nature of the issues that are here involved. <coughs> I contrast the, the minister's your time has expired. <coughs> with that of the CRA. <coughs> Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Leader of the Government of the Senate, to Senator Evans. I hope he will at least attempt to be a bit more honest in his answer uh, the, to this one than, than he was in his previous Order. answer to Senator Hill. I refer to the uh, sudden sharp fall in the value of the Australian dollar against the United States dollar and the trade weighted index, which includes most other currencies, uh, including the Japanese yen, against which we have now reached a record low. Uh, has the merchant, uh, US merchant bank Goldman Sachs compared the Australian economy with the Mexican economy, 
and predicted a further large fall in the value of the dollar because of the blowout of the current account deficit expected in the next six months and the government's inability to deliver on its responsible fiscal uh, policy. Does the plummeting value Order, in Senator the dollar Court. and a continuing concern about its prospects greatly increase the likelihood of further interest Senator rate hikes Court. and tax increases once the New South Wales election is out of the way? Or will you categorically Senators, rule out these increases in interest rates and taxes? <laughs> the Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Through the Chair, if you would. Just, President, we're not in the business, as Senator McMullen says, of trawling around every second-rate commentator trying to find skerricks of commentary that drag this country down. We are proud of the economic performance of this country. We're proud of the capacity for sustainable growth that we've now introduced in this country. We're proud of the achievement that we've made so far as employment is concerned, Senator with Kim. more than 500,000 jobs having Senator been created Kim. over the last two years, as compared with a promise to do it over three years, and that performance is there on the public record. I'm not going to comment specifically about the dollar. We never do. I am obviously prepared to concede that the current account deficit at the moment is higher than any of us find comfortable. What I am also saying, however, is what this government has been saying since day one, is that the government is committed to a significant tightening of fiscal policy in the May budget in order to boost national saving and, as a result, reduce Australia's call on overseas capital. That is the way in which we are going to address the problem of the current account deficit. That will be there for all to see when it comes to this budget in just a few weeks' time. The growth that is there in the Australian economy is perfectly sustainable when you take into account the enormously strong productivity performance that this, that this uh, economy has accumulated. It is sustainable when you take into account the extraordinarily low rates of inflation that we have managed to be able to hang on to for three years in a row, with inflation headline rates now running at around 2.5 per cent. This is an absolutely extraordinary achievement, not one that has been seen for decades in this country. It is a proud record. The economy is in good shape, and there is no need to act in any other way. The notion the nonsensical notion that uh, somehow interest rate uh, strategy is being governed or directed or somehow influenced by current political events utterly fails to acknowledge the reality that the government does not single-handedly control interest rates, even if we were irresponsible enough to want to behave in that way. That is a function of the Reserve Bank's decision-making authority in consultation, yes, with the government, but in its own authority and based on its own sense of monetary responsibility. To make that accusation of the kind that you continue to make, have been making over the last few days and weeks, is to demonstrate an, demonstrate an absolute contemptuous lack of respect for the credibility of the Reserve Bank, those people who make up the board. The point of the matter is that we have a responsible monetary policy. We are determined to put the primary weight of the economic adjustments that are necessary on fiscal policy for the reasons that I've explained, and we do have a sustainable deficit target that will in fact be reached as a result of that budgetary process. Senator Short, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, in view of that uh, totally equivocal non-answer, I, uh, I ask you. Uh, just how soon after the New South Wales election will the interest rate hike occur and the increased tax proposals be announced? Will it, will it, be, uh, will it be late March or will it be April or will you perhaps wait until May? To the Minister, Senator Evans. To ask that question is to demonstrate exactly the kind of irresponsibility Mr. President, that has kept this mob out of government since 1983 and will continue to keep them out of government for the indefinitely foreseeable future. That's the way you think, that's not the way we think. <coughs> Senator Foreman. Mr. President, uh, I direct my question to the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, Senator Collins. As senators would be aware, the Australian meat and livestock industries have now developed a significant trade in live sheep and carcass meat in the Middle East. A point of concern has been the difficulties that have existed in terms of live sheep trade into the Saudi Arabian market. Can the minister advise the Senate of progress in industry and government negotiations to have trade recommenced? The Minister for Primary Industry and Energy, Senator Collins. <coughs> Mr President, uh, I'm pleased uh, to announce that Australia is to recommence the live sheep trade with Saudi Arabia. This is an important development 
and one that's going to be welcomed by the Australian industry. I certainly know that my colleague, the Minister for Trade, uh, Senator McMullen, is also very pleased to see this matter finally resolved. The position follows what has been a very protracted period of discussion between uh, the Australian government uh, and industry and our Saudi counterparts. Over the last uh, few months, our ambassador in Saudi has had a series of meetings with the Acting Minister for Agriculture and Water, the Deputy Minister and other key officials regarding the Saudi requirement for the importation of Australian live sheep. A clear understanding now exists of those requirements. The Australian industry is confident that it will be able to supply live sheep in full compliance with the tight conditions that have been established. This is the, the first shipment, in fact, is likely to occur early next month. Mr. President, uh, these conditions include uh, strict age requirements, direct shipment to Saudi and the presence of a certified veterinary officer with each shipment. The decision to reopen this trade is a further economic boost to the rural sector, which is of course still struggling with the severe impacts of the drought. The Middle East meat and livestock trade was valued at about $300 million last year, and this included, importantly, $140 million worth of chilled and frozen sheep meat products. The access to the premium Saudi live sheep market will potentially add another $20 million to the Middle East trade per year. Mr President, the Australian Government welcomes this significant development that will further build on our already strong bilateral trading relationship with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It is yet another example of how the Government is working with Australian industry to build a stronger, more diversified and competitive rural sector. Mr President, the industry, the Government, uh, will continue to closely monitor this trade to ensure that its long-term development and stability is guaranteed. Senator Kernow. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for the Environment and concerns his attitude to the powers of approval he has over projects with environmental impacts, uh, projects like uh, wood chipping and coastal developments. It was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning, Minister, that you have a submission before Cabinet on the use of the Environmental Protection Impact of Proposals Act, which has as an option to effectively exempt from environmental assessment all projects that are currently in existence, including those projects that are having a significant effect on the environment. And I ask, if you were really to put that position, Minister, does it mean effective abandonment of environmental concerns in approvals for wood chipping licences? And will a similar attitude prevail toward developments for which you have responsibility under other acts, such as a project at Port Hinchinbrook in North Queensland? The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, naturally, I have seen the article in the Sydney Morning Herald to, uh, uh, on which Senator Kernow has based uh, this particular question. I think about the only thing that uh, is correct in uh, that particular article is the statement that this government does have a strong stand on environmental issues. While I don't intend uh, today to preempt uh, Cabinet's discussion on this issue, I do feel that it's important to correct uh, those very misleading reports and allegations about uh, proposed amendments to the administrative procedures under the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act. Let me say straight up, Mr President, that uh, any changes, any amendments to the administrative procedures will not affect the objectives of the Act. The administrative procedures are subsidiary instruments and they can only give effect to the object of the principal Act. I am not proposing any amendments to the Act itself. This Act, in fact, is one of the centrepieces of the Commonwealth's environment protection legislation. There is no way that I would put forward any proposal that would undermine the Act in any way. The object of the Environment Protection Impact of Proposals Act is to see environmentally significant projects assessed, but assessed only once unless, of course, uh, Senator, there is an environmentally significant change in circumstances. And, uh, what I am responding to here is the uncertainty that was created by the Guns decision about the application of the Act uh, to ongoing operational decisions. For example, one of the potential consequences is that each individual coal shipment from a coal mine that has been assessed under the Act 
needs to be designated and reassessed. And I think nearly everyone, nearly everyone, would accept that that's undesirable, that it's unworkable, and that it's not consistent with the government's understanding and interpretation of the Act. It's also, Senator, just contrary to plain, good, old-fashioned common sense. Now, Mr. President, since the Guns decision, the government has overcome these potential operational uh, difficulties through issu issuing short-term individual exemptions for decisions relating to export approvals. Uh, this also is clearly not a satisfactory longer-term re uh, remedy. Mr President, the amendments to the administrative procedures which I am proposing will provide a more uh, satisfactory working arrangement and will restore the government's previous understanding of the intent and the scope of this Act. Of course, uh, senators would also be aware that there is a full-scale review of the Act that is currently underway. The Act has been in place now for over 20 years, Mr President, and it needs to be brought up to date. The EPA has released a discussion paper which is focused and, uh, on the base and formed uh, uh, the basis of a public uh, consultation process, and that finishes at the end of this month. There are a number of uh, fundamental issues relating to environmental legislation being considered by that review. I don't uh, propose the government will make any decisions which might preempt the outcome of the review process. And it's not my intention, Mr. President, having said those things, the which puts the time government's position clearly on record, to make any more comment prior to the cabinet decision. Supplementary, Senator Kerno. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, then on the last part of my question, which relates to Port Hinchinbrook, are you currently finalising terms of reference for the study assessing the impact on world heritage values of the next three steps of the Port Hinchinbrook project? And considering what you said then about assessing things only once, will those terms of reference look at all the cumulative environmental impacts of the entire proposal over time, not just each step in isolation, and the same with the aesthetic impacts, over time, cumulative, not each step in isolation, in the way you're talking about um, a coal shipments, which I understand? The Minister, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, in relation to that uh, uh, aspect of Senator uh, Kerno's question. On the 22nd of February, I did meet with the developer, Mr uh, Williams. Officers of my department have also uh, met with the developer, Mr Williams, of, from Oyster Point. Uh, through those meetings, he has been made very well aware of the Commonwealth's position in regard to the proposed development. On the 23rd of February, we received from the developer a request for consent to undertake a range of works on the site, including a breakwater, uh, dredging of an access channel and matters pertaining to the foreshore and foreshore management uh, plan. Currently, Mr President, that, uh, that request is being uh, evaluated. I've made it uh, clear to him uh, and all the other interested parties that my responsibility with regard to this uh, development is to assure that it doesn't damage the values of the adjacent World Heritage Area. The evaluation of, uh, of, the evaluation of any requests uh, for consent will bear this uh, in mind, and, uh, and we will look at uh, all those issues. We will look at uh, all those issues concurrently. <coughs> Senator Shamaret. Thank you. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, and I ask. When did former Indonesian General Sintong Panjaitan arrive in Australia, and when is he due to leave? On what basis was the former general granted entry to Australia? And three, how does the government reconcile its high international stand on human rights with their sponsorship of a visit by this general who was so closely linked with the Dili massacre in East Timor in November 91? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, Major General Panjaitan has been visiting Australia as a member of an advance party for the planned visit by the Indonesian Minister for Research and Technology, Habibi. He's now Deputy for the Armed Forces Affairs, for Armed Forces Affairs and the Agency for the Assessment and Application of Technology within Minister Habibi's portfolio. And it was, of course, in that context uh, that he was visiting Australia. 
Major General Pajaita was the commander of the 9th Military District in 1991, who did have overall responsibility for East Timor, but he wasn't in East Timor at the time of the Dili killings on the 12th of November, and there's no evidence that he was personally culpable or responsible in any way for giving the orders in question. There is no doubt that he was held uh, responsible in the sense that he had to assume the commander's responsibility for the acts of those subordinate to him, which responsibility he, he did accept and stood down or was forced to resign from the position in the armed forces that he had previously held. But there's an important moral distinction, I think, between the nature of the uh, behaviour or the responsibility of someone who was personally involved and was in that sense culpable and someone who is essentially formally responsible. And the government certainly had that distinction in mind in deciding, after careful consideration, not to uh, object to his presence in Australia. I hope it will be seen uh, in that context and not in any way as the government uh, being prepared to acknowledge that uh, somehow the events of Dili uh, were less serious than we previously said or the culpability of those directly involved was any less. I do make the point uh, finally, however, that uh, it's always been the government's position that a distinction was to be drawn between the events in Dili uh, and those, for example, in Tiananmen in uh, Beijing in 1989, because in the Chinese case what you clearly and unequivocally had was a deliberate act of state policy carried out at the direction and with the knowledge um, of those at the highest levels of government as compared with the situation in Dili 91, which was uh, clearly aberrant, albeit grossly aberrant and outrageous behaviour by local military commanders. I don't have uh, to hand uh, any information as to the precise uh, date of his arrival in Australia or his intended departure, uh, but it was only a relatively short visit for the purpose of uh, setting in place arrangements for the long-awaited visit by Minister Habibi. Supplementary, Senator um, I, I think it's my understanding that he may have left yesterday, in which case I ask why didn't the government, as a good international citizen, take any action to collect the $14 million damages awarded by a United States court against Sintong Panjatan for the murder of a New Zealand citizen in the Dili massacre? And will the government refuse him a visa for a future visit to Australia? If not, why not? The Minister, Senator Evans. As I understand it, there was a civil uh, liability that was uh, recorded in the American courts by way of default uh, judgment uh, in the absence of any uh, attempt by General Pajayatan or the Indonesian government to respond to that particular uh, plaint. Uh, executions of civil judgment are a matter for civilian plaintiffs to pursue through uh, proper process, and it's certainly no responsibility of uh, this government uh, to pursue that matter, even uh, had we um, some belief in a moral responsibility to do so, which for all the reasons I've indicated we don't. Senator Olson. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government. Is it a fact that the New South Wales branch of the ALP, already more than $10 million in debt, has been served or threatened with a notice of foreclosure by the Commonwealth yes. Bank unless it makes suitable arrangements to service the debt? What steps has the bank taken to achieve a reduction of the principal of this massive debt, or has it in fact blown out in recent weeks? Will the government obtain an assurance from the managing director of the Commonwealth Bank that the bank is not simply bankrolling a very politically privileged and technically insolvent debtor, and that ordinary Australians can expect the same sympathetic overdraft accommodation? Yeah, right. <coughs> the Minister of Mr. The President, this is not a matter Senator for Evans. Commonwealth Government responsibility, my responsibility, the Prime Minister's or anyone else's, but let me nonetheless make the point that uh, there is a substantial mortgage uh, over the property in question uh, belonging to the New South Wales ALP. The New South Wales ALP is servicing the interest on this mortgage at $10,000 per month to the satisfaction of its bankers and auditors. Order. And there is no substance, to my knowledge, in any suggestion that that debt is about to be called in or is in some other way being pursued in the way that's mentioned. It is, of course, uh, the case that the ALP lost a considerable amount of money on that particular transaction as a result of the collapse in the Sydney property market. Lots of people, uh, as a result of those uh, events, 
did lose uh, money in property investments and have been in some financial difficulties as a result. John Fay knows all about that. The Premier of New South Wales knows all about that because he's in charge of the state superannuation scheme, which has had a write-down of $1 billion as a result of the collapse of the Sydney property market in the early 1990s. And that is $1 billion of taxpayers' money that's been written down as a result Order. of that little exercise in property speculation. Order. $1 billion. $1 billion of taxpayers' money in New South Wales money was put at risk by the property investments of the state super scheme under John Fay. If you don't want to acknowledge any kind of responsibility or any inappropriate uh, behaviour on the part of the government instrumentality under John Fay in producing that debt, well, don't shed crocodile tears in here about the similar problems that the ALP got itself into as a result of exactly that, exactly that same situation. Order. Supplementary, Senator Olsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I, I note that you simply say that the debt is being serviced. In other words, presumably the principal is not being reduced on a $10 million debt. I ask you further, how many Commonwealth Bank representatives attended the recent $2,000 a plate fundraiser for the ALP and how much was contributed on behalf of bank shareholders to ALP funds? Has the ALP overdraft been considered by the board of the Commonwealth Bank? And if not, why not? And seeing you're interested in uh, state, state politics, can I simply ask you to answer the question so eloquently asked by Alan Ramsey last, last Saturday, and it was this. How do you convince the voters you know how to run the state if your own party is so demonstrably exposed as having mismanaged itself into insolvency? So, some, I must what say some of parts of that question are very tenuously relevant to the Minister's well, responsibility. What kind of a lunatic question it was? How many Commonwealth Senator. Bank shareholders, I'm asked, have contributed to the ALP funds? Do you know how many Commonwealth Bank shareholders there are now? How many millions of Commonwealth Bank shareholders? Order. Like you, point of order, point of order, point of point order, order, Senator Alston. Obviously, the Minister was just not wanting to hear the question. How many Commonwealth Bank That's representatives not, attended the recent $2,000 a plate fundraiser? Order. And Senator how Alston. much was contributed on behalf Senator of Senator Alston, shareholders? that's not a point of order. Well, it is, Mr President. It's not a point of order. It's precisely on relevance. Be seated. Senator Alston, be seated. It's not a point of order, and you well know it. Senator Evans. What's not a point of order? Uh, it is, you say I know that it was not a point of order. The fact is that Senator Evans himself would concede he was answering a question that he thought was related to how many Commonwealth Bank shareholders have contributed. Order. That's not and a I'm point of order. I'm simply saying on the question of relevance, my question was how much was contributed on behalf of shareholders. I would have thought that's a pretty simple proposition. It's not a point of order, and it's clearly not a point of order. Senator a distinction Evans. without a difference. How much was contributed on behalf of the millions of Commonwealth Bank shareholders? You goose, you wouldn't know the difference. The mortgage debt of the ALP is not $10 million, it's $6 million. The New South Wales ALP is committed to and will pay off every cent of the amount owing under the mortgage, capital and interest. We'll do this in close consultation with the order. branch as necessary with anyone else, and that's the way it'll be, and you can eat your rotten little heart out. Senator Neil. Order. Senator Neil. My question is to the Minister of Family Services, Senator Order. Crowley. We're talking about uh, childcare at the moment. Can the minister inform the Senate of the truth behind the New South Wales Premier's promise during his campaign launch to provide an extra 26,000 places under the national childcare strategy? Has the New South Wales government contacted the federal government about this issue? And given that the national childcare strategy is a joint funding agreement, Order. what does this mean for the Premier's promise? The Minister for Family Services, Senator Crowley. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Premier, uh, Mr. President. Like uh, anyone involved in childcare, anyone involved in childcare, I was astounded at the Premier's announcement that he would actually provide an extra 26,000 childcare places. Because Premier Fay, Mr. Fay, knows knows full well he's made a promise that he can't keep. He's made a promise that he can't keep. And he simply, he simply cannot provide those extra childcare places, and the reason comes from out of his own mouth. Mr. President, the, the Premier, Mr. Fay, said that um, the cost of these uh, 26,000 places, or the 22,000 that he is then proposing to pay for, would be about $116 million in one year, and the liability for the state would be about $58 million. 
What this means is that 60 million of that liability would be the Commonwealth. So Premier Fay is making a promise to the New South Wales people that's contingent on this Commonwealth finding $60 million recurrent each year for childcare when he hasn't even signed the national childcare strategy for the last five years. So it's pretty, pretty bold of him to go around promising to spend Commonwealth money, $60 million of it recurrent each year, when he hasn't been prepared to sign the national childcare strategy for the last five years. It is very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, I'm very glad you interject, Senator Order. McDonald, because the uh, Frank McGuire, Francis McGuire, Director of Community Child Care, a peak child care organisation in New South Wales, has uh, this to say about Mr Fay's promise. Order on both sides. Now that the Liberals are facing an election and realise that their track record for the provision of child care is really poor, they are beginning to make these outrageous claims. It's just appalling that the Liberal Party has made this announcement, knowing that the bulk of people aren't involved with the setting up of childcare places and that they can get away with it. They can make these statements of 26,000 places to be set up, and if they're not, it's the Commonwealth's fault and the people might believe them. I think that's criminal." End quote. Well, uh, I heard somebody interject over there, what's this got to do with the Commonwealth? Senator Macdonald, it's got everything to do with it. Premier Fay is not prepared to sign the Commonwealth State Child Care Strategy. He's not prepared to sign that strategy. He's certainly not contacted me about dubbing the number of child care places from 13,000 to 26 in one week. And he is doing this dependent and contingent upon finding Commonwealth recurrent money of $60 million. Mr Fay has made a number of blunders about child care. In fact, he had to backtrack and apologise for what he got wrong last week. But the idea of proposing 26,000 places, why, Senators? Because it's about to be something that matters to the people in New South Wales. They've been dudded of over 8,000 places over the last five years because the New South Wales government refused to fly, sign this strategy. Now, on the even election, he's not only promising uh, the, the heavens, but he's promising to spend $60 million Commonwealth recurrent each year. Now, that is uh, a promise he knows that he can't make. He's just not serious about it. He's ratted on the families in New South Wales and he's certainly betrayed the women. Senator Tierney. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, Senator Evans. Would the Minister explain to the Senate why crucial decisions on national issues have been delayed until after the 25th of March, and I refer specifically to the holding off of the inevitable next round of interest rate rises, the outrageous federal cabinet move to block the release of 33 forest areas for logging in New South Wales, singling out just New South Wales, and the delay in the planned massive increase in flights from 60 to 80 movements an hour at Sydney Airport. Isn't it the case, Minister, that your government has delayed and distorted public policy in this country just to help your mates in their attempt to win the New South Wales election. The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Mr. President, that's an extremely vulgar suggestion from Senator Tierney, <laughs> and it's utterly without any foundation. I've already responded on the subject of interest rate rises. This is not a government that responds irresponsibly to the needs of this country for responsible economic management. If the Reserve Bank, in consultation with the government, decides that it's not appropriate to raise interest rates at this time, well then that's the decision of the Reserve Bank and that's one that we will readily accept. Because of course we would prefer that the economy is managed without uh, the need to go back to further interest rate rise. Of course, we'd all like to see any necessary policy adjustments being able to be managed by fiscal policy alone. That's been our position uh, for umpteen months, and that remains the position, irrespective of the transient uh, fortunes of the political timetable in, uh, in New South Wales. So far as the wood chips uh, decision is concerned, we made it clear some weeks ago that an extensive process of consultation was going to be necessary in order to make judgments about the status of those outstanding coops, and the timetable was Senator set weeks Tierney, ago uh, to enable that process to properly take place. So far as New South Wales is concerned, it's already been explained to you in words of one syllable, and it needs to be in one syllable for you, Senator Tierney, that the particular coops that were not handed back in New South Wales 
were because there was simply insufficient information given to us by that government of yours in New South Wales, that brilliant government of yours, which was utterly incapable, or if not incapable, unwilling to give us the information on which we could make a reasonable judgment about the extent to which those values were in fact represented elsewhere in the state. If that information had been forthcoming in some credible or useful way from that incredible and useless government in New South Wales, it might have been possible for us to produce a decision much earlier. And that's the state of play in every one of the issues that you raise. There's no attempt to avoid dealing with these issues. We are a government that is responsible, measured, balanced, sensible and credible in the way in which we approach these issues, and we will continue to be so. Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Mr President. My question— Order. Order. Senator Forshaw. Senator Forshaw. Senator Forshaw. Senator Forshaw. Senator Forshaw. Senator Forshaw, you have thank you. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to Senator McMullen, the Minister for Communications and the Arts, and I asked the uh, Minister, are media reports correct that New South Wales is in danger of losing the substantial investment in filmmaking facilities that have been proposed by Fox and were announced by the Prime Minister in Creative Nation? Mr Minister, if these reports are correct, what appears to be the problem and what is necessary to ensure that Australia realises the significant opportunities that would flow from this proposed investment. The Minister representing the Minister for Communications and Arts, Senator McMullen. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I am, of course, aware that the proposal to build an international film studio in Sydney, uh, initiated uh, not, of course, by the failed Liberal government, they didn't have anything to do with starting the proposal, but by 20th Century Fox itself, is in some doubt. And as a consequence, there is a concern that uh, millions of dollars of investment in the film industry and all that that entails in terms of creative opportunities and infrastructure opportunities and job opportunities for uh, uh, Australians might be lost to Sydney. People will be interested in the history. Uh, the proposal was first announced in October last year by the Prime Minister in Creative Nation. And the Prime Minister said at that time that the Fox proposal would need to be discussed with the New South Wales State Government, which gave us some cause of apprehension as to whether it ever would ever go ahead, because nothing goes ahead once the hand of the New South Wales Government gets on it, which has ownership of the proposed site, the Sydney Showgrounds. Given the importance and significance of this proposal, the PM was quick to commit the Commonwealth Government to assisting with site development and preparation. It is interesting to hear twice to hear. Order. It's been interesting twice today to hear Liberal senators from New South Wales contend that there is sleazy deals involved in coming to an agreement of exactly the sort that Mr Kennett has proposed. I have to say I don't think, that is a re I don't think that's a reasonable criticism of Mr Kennett and, and nor of all Order. the other states who would love to have the opportunity to have this investment. But rather than grab this in initiative which the Commonwealth made possible, the Fay government decided not to negotiate with Fox but to invite tenders, com com competitive expressions of interest, to implement an idea that somebody had come forward to them with. It is, in fact, a very difficult prospect for, a, for people who have been in opposition for a long time to understand, but obviously not one that originators of idea would be encur encouraged to come to a state for if all their ideas are going to be held up for tender so their competitors can come in and bid for their ideas. And obviously, Mr Kennett understands that this is not a proposal that would be attractive to anybody wishing to make a serious investment and has come forward and sought to steal this project out from under the nose of New South Wales, putting at risk the possibility that Sydney and New South Wales might lose these significant employment, investment and creative opportunities. And uh, It's not a question of whether this is a terrible uh, Labor attack on the Liberals, because Mr Kennett is of course, an equally enthusiastic uh, Liberal, but he is one who is putting forward this proposal, wanting to attract this proposal to Victoria. And it's not inconsistent with the experience of every minister who's ever had to deal with a proposal that requires cooperative proposals from a state. That's right. From Queensland, from Victoria, no from problems. South Australia, from Western Australia, from Tasmania, you can get interest and response and some sort of initiative that leads to a venture proceeding. But if it gets into New South That's Wales, right. nothing happens. What about regional New South Every Wales? Every time you get a proposal that requires any hand from million the million New South the Wales government, months, the proposal yes. stalls and stops up, dead. Order. Every occasion. And it is, in fact, 
it, hopeless. It is, in fact, exactly the same procedure I have found as Trade Minister. When Sorry. people are coming talking about investment proposals in Australia, they came to see us. They put forward a proposal that we wanted to go to New South Wales. We've had a much better proposal from Victoria. We're proposing to base our investment in Melbourne. And even as a, in the Commonwealth government's own area of initiative, we sought proposals from New South Wales and Victoria about proposals we wanted to uh, spread between those two cities. The only serious proposal we got was from Melbourne, and we've had to commit ourselves to conduct that conference, the National Trade and Investment Outlook Conference in Melbourne, for the next five years because there was no effective interest from Sydney. <laughs> Senator Woods. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for School Education, uh, the, the also ran uh, Senator Schott. Will the minister, I'm just quoting media sources here, media sources. Will the minister rule out leaked finance department budget proposals, which would see an end to real growth in Commonwealth funding for non-government schools? Order. And why is the government considering abandoning its election commitment to increase funding to non-government schools and instead proposing to slash their funding by $220 million over the next four years? Senator Ray. Minister, Thank you, Mr. President. Order. Senator Ray. To the, uh, to Minister the representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. To Senator the, the, former, the former failed member for Lowe couldn't hold the seat. Uh, all I just want to say is that obviously this question is motivated as part of your effort to help the New South Wales Liberal Party create a scare campaign. You know as well as I do it is not the policy of the government to make any comment about speculation in whether on any area that may lead in the budget discussions. And that doesn't mean that these matters are being considered or not being considered. We just don't comment on them. And you know that as well as I do. Supplementary, Senator Woods. So since the uh, minister is clearly avoiding answering the question, and I ask you again, will he actually rule out well, the proposal, which apparently has the approval of both Treasury and Finance, to cut the, uh, the Commonwealth funding for non-government schools? Will he admit that, if implemented, families with two children would actually have to pay more than $500 over the next four years, and then after that $300 a year? Uh, would this affect 900,000 students from 2,500 schools? And isn't this another example of how Labor's LAW really spells L-I-E? The Minister, Senator Schultz. Mr President, I'm astonished that the opposition could get up and complain about any suggestion of cutting an education expenditure. In the last election, they had proposal to cut billions of dollars of education expenditure. When, and it's interesting, the only, the, the only area you may be interested in uh, showing concern about is private schools. We are interested in the total education system of Australia, both public and private. And there will be good announcements made in the, on policy in this area, in the budget. And I'm just astonished that an opposition that keeps calling for expenditure cuts all over the place, particularly in the public sector, jumps up here saying that any suggestion, which are, which are in no way verified by the government, leads to your concern. It is just absolutely hypocritical on your part. Senator Coulter. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Evans, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, representing the, uh, the government and the Senate. The minister would be aware of the question I asked him last week of sitting regarding Australia's $6.6 .6 million assistance to North Korea to build two nuclear power stations. Is the minister aware that, contrary to his assertion that solar energy is of little use in Korea, Solar Heart Australia is already selling between one and a half and two million dollars worth of solar hot water units into Korea? Is the minister aware that Solar Heart was negotiating on the very day I asked the question with, uh, with South Korea to build solar hot water units in that country? Is, is the minister aware that South Korea very sensibly levies fossil fuel sales and uses the money to subsidise the upfront capital costs of solar units? And finally, noting that the paltry $6 million provided in the 1993 budget has not resulted in a single uh, domestic solar hot water installation in Australia. Does the minister not think it is now time we followed South Korea's excellent example and provided real assistance to Australia's domestic and export solar industries rather than propping up foreign nuclear technology? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, I'm absolutely delighted to learn that Solar Heart's got a million and a half or two million dollars worth of sales into Korea and that it has the prospects for many more such sales. I don't doubt for a moment that there is a niche capacity. Uh, for that particular uh, very uh, sophisticated and effective enterprise to get into that particular market and on that kind of scale. 
The point about my answer to you last week, uh, whatever it was, Senator Coulter, is that you were suggesting that solar energy could be the answer in itself to North Korea's nuclear needs. And the point of the matter was that in order to generate the kind of power that's going to be produced by the two 1,000 megawatt stations that will be supplied under this negotiation to save us all from having bombs dropped upon us, you'll recall, uh, Senator Coulter, that, that in order to pay for the energy equivalent of that in solar energy, you'd have to spend something like $15 billion on solar heating appliances scattered around the landscape. And that, of course, is on the assumption that there's enough sunlight in North Korea to uh, play upon these installations in order to generate uh, the wattage that's, uh, that's, that's required. That was the point of my excursion, not to say that there's no market opportunity uh, for solar heaters at all in that environment. Of course there is. There is in every environment in the world almost a niche opportunity, but it can be no more than that when you're talking about satisfying the basic energy needs of the nation. So far as our $6 million or $5 million US contribution was concerned, what we're basically doing is demonstrating a commitment to the solution, which we hope has been successfully now negotiated, of the biggest single security problem we had in the entire region, a problem whereby North Korea was almost certainly engaged right now in the production of nuclear weapons with essentially unsafeguarded facilities in an environment where it was putting at risk not only the security of the Korean Peninsula but the whole region. It was desperately necessary to get a negotiated solution to that security problem. I think in a first-class feat of, uh, of diplomatic endurance the United States did negotiate uh, such an agreement with the North Koreans, the trade-off for which was that the North Koreans would be assisted with their energy production needs in the future on a transient uh, basis pending the construction of those uh, energy power plants. There was going to be uh, the supply of um, heavy fuel oil and Australia's contribution was to, uh, to assist to pay for that, but also, as I said, as, a, as essentially a symbolic contribution to the larger peace deal. Um, that was the only realistic uh, energy alternative available, as I understand it, that was acceptable to the North Koreans. The facilities in question will be uh, fully safeguarded. That's very much part of the uh, arrangement as well. And um, the whole result is one that ought to be applauded uh, by you wearing your peace hat, not uh, poured scorn upon by you wearing your sort of solar energy greenie hat, because your solar energy greenie hat just simply doesn't offer anything of any relevance. Uh, to the solution of the basic problem that we were trying to address. Supplementary, Supplementary question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, leaving aside the, the minister's naivety and his uh, faith in the NPT, uh, and just dealing with the solar energy, will the minister admit that he is totally misrepresenting the point? The, the cost of the two units uh, being built in North Korea is $4.5 billion. We are talking about $6.6 .6 million from Australia, and it would be very easy for Australia to uh, substitute that small amount with solar energy, as, it, as is already happening in South Korea, as I indicate, indicated in the question. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, we didn't have any choice in the matter as to how our particular contribution would be spent. What the North Koreans wanted, what was negotiated in the deal, was a contribution to their um, transient energy needs which needed the supply of heavy fuel oil. We would much prefer uh, to have been able to supply uh, lighter fractions of petroleum which we can produce ourselves rather than simply paying for someone else's fuel to be supplied. But we weren't in there as an energy uh, policy exercise. We're in there as a peace exercise. And wearing your peace hat or your party's peace hat, surely you can see that. Yes, it does cost four and a half billion dollars. It's likely to cost that to produce these two light water reactors. But to produce the equivalent amount of energy through solar means, assuming the sunlight was available, would cost, as I said, $15 billion. That's the truth of the matter, so far as the energy economics of this are concerned. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr. President. I, my question is to Senator McMullen. I refer to the directions of the US government after the Uruguay Round resolution to use their export subsidy programs for market development for, and for the example. I give recent subsidised dairy exports to Asia. An ABS conclusion in the US Farm Bill paper, and I quote, if the US subsidy programs are refocused on markets that are important for Australia, exports largely in Asia and the Pacific, many of the benefits from less distorted trade, which Australia could be reasonably expect from the Uruguay round, would be lost. 
In view of the great damage to our smaller industries like citrus, tobacco, chicken meat uh, on the Uruguay Round Resolution and the interest of the uh, least sustaining benefits for our large industries like wheat, beef and sugar, I ask, does the government agree with ABS assessments? And if their assessments should eventuate and the benefits are not there, what will be the government's response for both our small and large primary industries? Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I am very surprised that I can't find the day when the National Party is uh, seeking to undermine the, the benefits that flow to the Australian agricultural industry from uh, uh, the uh, very important Uruguay <laughs> route. Oh, you've upset him. You've point, upset him. Point of order. My point of order is uh, truth, Mr. Pre uh, President, <laughs> and in no time have I ever undermined the, order, it's not the a... under. Uh, no time have I ever mind order, the not a point of order. industry. And Senator McMullen, order, well Senator, knows... there's not a point of order. Senator McMullen. Right. Yes. That, that point of order, Mr. Chairman, at least had the advantage of being unique. Um, the, it is, of course, true. And it has always been true, and Senator Boswell and I have agreed about this in the past, that Australia is very concerned about the continuing subsidisation of exports by the United States and by Europe, and, by, and the unfair impact that has upon free traders in agriculture, including uh, Australia. And uh, we have had this year one unfortunate example already uh, with regard to the dairy industry of minor significance to Australia in itself in terms of the particular initiative that took place, but a worrying sign and one which we responded to, I think, in common uh, on all sides of this parliament. Uh, and the extent to which the United States seeks to uh, refocus uh, uh, their export enhancement programs and dairy, and other, uh, dairy equivalents uh, into market enhancement programs does create the potential for uh, that to intrude upon Australian markets. But we continue to have to make representations in support of and receive reassurances uh, from the United States about their commitment to seek to implement even these programs as newly focused in a manner which minimises the impact on, free, on fair traders in agriculture, in which of course they include Australia uh, and the Cairns Group countries. And we are continually in uh, liaison with the other members of the Cairns Group, uh, seeking to focus attention on the two things we can do that are positive, rather than just sitting back here expressing concern, fear and trembling. In the United States, it is about seeking to put maximum pressure on the Farm Bill. We have, I think, in 1995, a real opportunity to have a significant downward pressure on the subsidies within the Farm Bill. I would love to say that was because of the eloquence of the representations of the Cairns Group countries and others, but of course that's only peripheral. The core explanation is the budgetary problems in the United States. As they come to have to face up to the reality of their enormous budget deficit, they will have to realise they cannot continue to subsidise agriculture to the extent they do. And the evidence is starting to emerge. The evidence of the waste in that program, the evidence of the domestic impact of that program, the, the way in which so many of the already affluent receive the subsidies and those for whom the taxpayers think they are providing it do not. All those things are starting to become part of the public debate, and we have the new chairman of the Agriculture Committee in the Senate, Senator Lugar, making some uh, progressive comments in this regard. So it is something that Every Australian uh, parliamentarian, every Australian citizen concerned with the public debate about trade and agricultural policy needs to be concerned about how these subsidies will be abused but the, or might be abused. But the key thing is, under the Uruguay Round, we have got agreement to reduce them and reduce them in the United States, and even more importantly, and we shouldn't forget this, even more importantly, to see them reduced in Europe. And I think budgetary pressures in Europe and the United States will reinforce the impact of those Uruguay Round commitments and should, I think, lead to the fact that during the course of this uh, decade the opportunities for Australian exporters in dairy in other agricultural products should be significantly enhanced as a result of the Uruguay Round and we will continue to actively address those issues to seek to achieve that outcome. Senator Colston. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator McMullen, the Minister for Trade. I refer the Minister to a public a prediction by the Australian Rice Growers Cooperative 
that Australian farmers are aiming to capture half of Japan's 1995 rice import market. In this regard, can the Minister report to the Senate on the expected growth of the Japanese market for Australian rice growers and other primary producers as well? The Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Constant for his question. Uh, in the Uruguay round, uh, we did have, amongst the other important initiatives that uh, I was able to outline in the response to Senator Boswell's uh, question, uh, an important commitment from the Japanese government to institute the graduated opening of Japan's uh, agricultural market, and particularly with regard to rice, in response to Senator Colston's question, although there were important uh, op market opening opportunities in other products, which I'll hope to have time to comment on brief briefly. But we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that. The percentage figures are small, rising from 4 per cent of domestic consumption uh, in the base year period uh, in 1995 up to 8 per cent by the year 2000. But that means 380,000 tonnes of imported rice this year and 758,000 tonnes uh, by the year 2000. Now, the rice, Australian rice growers and the Rice Growers Cooperative are understandably optimistic about winning a significant share of this, because in the temporary market opening recently caused by the uh, 1993 uh, market pro crop problems in, the, in Japan, Australia's rice was very well received on the Japanese market. The type of the rice, the japonica style and its uh, utilisation and uh, quality were very well received. And if the processes that are, imp are implemented to uh, uh, though instituted to implement this commitment, enable fair and uh, open competition for that uh, 380,000 tonnes uh, this year, I think Australia will win a very big share of it. It's not excessive for our rice growers to think they might win half of it. It's certainly a very uh, reasonable uh, objective for them to set themselves, and they've been going about the promotion intelligently. Uh, a similar opportunity on a smaller scale uh, arises in Korea. And there are other agricultural market opportunities uh, in the market opening uh, if for, in Japan for Australia, in wheat, in barley and in dairy. And we're already starting to do well in some of those markets and I think that opening, small as it is, and only a first step on what needs to be a much more substantial market opening, could be very, success, very important for Australian primary producers, will generate a lot of export income for Australia and a lot of income for many Australian towns. And I'd just like to say in conclusion, for all those who say, and there are some in the Senate, that there's a serious problem with the Uruguay round and we shouldn't have in entered into it, they should go to Leeton and explain to the rice growers why it's not a good idea that yeah, Australia yeah. signed up to the Uruguay yeah, round. Yeah. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Crowley. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Heron asked uh, the following question without notice on the 9th of March this year, how much federal funding had gone towards the production of sexually explicit swap cards. I've been uh, provide with, provided with the following information, Senator. I'm advised that the Bubble Boy card series produced by the Queensland AIDS Council was funded by the Queensland Department of Health from the AIDS Matched Fund Program, known as the MFP. Under the national HIV AIDS strategy, the Commonwealth allocates funds to the states and territories on a matched dollar for dollar basis for HIV AIDS activities. Funding is provided to the states under the MFP for education, prevention, treatment and care, training and evaluation activities conducted by state aid councils, AIDS councils and other non-government groups as well as state developed and administered HIV AIDS programs. Responsibility for allocating MFP funds rests with the relevant state health authority within the framework of the national HIV AIDS strategy. Senator Shamaret. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr President, under the order of the Senate relating to questions on notice agreed to on 28 September 1988, I ask the minister representing the Minister for Justice, Senator Balkus, for an explanation of why I have not received an answer to question number 1780, which I put on notice on 18 October 1994, to the Minister representing the Minister for Justice in relation to allegations concerning improper actions undertaken by Telecom. Is there a response from the... No, thank you. Well, I'm not quite there yet. You're, you're, uh... okay. Order. 
Earlier today, the temporary chairman of committee, Senator Colston, agreed to refer to me a ruling which he made concerning remarks by Senator Balkus about Senator Vanston. Senator Balkus said that Senator Vanston had produced something out of a brown paper envelope. Quote, Senator Vanston submitted that this remark raised an implication that she had improperly taken some action in return for a consideration and that the remark was therefore a personal reflection on her within the meaning of the Standing Order 193. Senator Colston said that he was unsure that the remark was unparliamentary and that he was unconvinced that there was a personal reflection intended, but he required the Minister to withdraw the reference to Senator Vanston. Having read the Hansard transcript of the exchange, like Senator Colston, I am not convinced that the personal re reflection perceived by Senator Vanston either was intended or would be perceived by a reasonable listener to the debate. The Chair has regard to the context to which the remarks are made, and having regard to the context of the remarks in question, it would appear that the expression brown paper envelope implied secrecy and lack of consultation rather than receipt of improper considerations. If a senator believes, however, that remarks constitute a personal reflection, the chair leans towards requiring, requiring withdrawal of the remarks, and that is what Senator Colston very properly did on this occasion. Are there any motions to take note of answers? So, I thought you had finished with that issue. I'm sorry, Senator. I'm sorry for interrupting you then. You. Senator um, Mr. President, I, I wanted to move that the Senate take note of the explanation, or rather well, the lack of explanation, of the minister. I haven't moved to, to that as yet. Uh, no. The, I, okay, fine. In, in response yeah. to the call okay, to order, um, uh, I, I made the call to order because I had um, requested uh, on notice an answer from the minister. Uh, for justice on 18th of October 1994 um, in relation to allegations concerning improper actions undertaken by Telecom. And uh, in response, uh, as uh, the minister was leaving the chamber, he said to me, oh, um, uh, somebody from my office is going to ring your office and the question will be um, forthcoming tomorrow. But I still pursued the call to order for the uh, reason that on the 6th of January 1994, uh, my office requested a response to that uh, question, which had been asked in, in October, and we were told that we would, uh, they would get back to us. One fortnight ago, uh, the minister's office assured us that the answer was on the minister's desk, or some equivalent. I, I wouldn't want to misquote anybody on, on the accuracy of that, seeing it was patently inaccurate, uh, but that it was uh, forthcoming immediately, and that was a fortnight ago, so I don't see that his uh, chance remark to me on the way out of the chamber excuses the minister from his failure to give an answer within the 30-day uh, rule that we have in this place. And uh, I have no reason to believe his comment that I will receive it tomorrow any more than, of course, I believed the uh, comment a fortnight ago. I won't delay the Senate. I know uh, my other colleagues um, and want to take note of answers, and, and I do myself. So I won't indulge in a 30-minute speech about the failure of the minister, but I do want to put on the record that uh, questions um, on, uh, on notice are one of the uh, few mechanisms available to people like myself in the chamber uh, who uh, don't get uh, the opportunity to gain this information from ministers uh, very often. And, uh, we, we do deserve the respect to have that 30-day rule um, honoured, and uh, so I want to draw it to the attention of the minister and, and uh, uh, move that the, the minister be censured for his failure to take seriously uh, the call to order on this day. The question is that the motion be agreed to, the motion to take note, that is, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye, those against no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Short. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I uh, move that the uh, Senate take note of Senator Evans' answer to my uh, question uh, earlier today on likely uh, interest rate and uh, tax uh, increases. Mr President, uh, during his uh, recent uh, overseas uh, jaunt, uh, Mr Keating uh, demeaned his position and uh, that of the Australian nation by disgracefully breaking the, uh, the long accepted convention of not pursuing uh, domestic political issues uh, whilst representing his country overseas, including—and I'm sure no one will ever forget—him elbowing aside 
the, pri the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore on the steps of the uh, Parliament House there to mount an attack on opposition leader John Howard. But when he wasn't, uh, when he wasn't so paranoically and uh, embarrassingly engaged, which of course was most of the time, he made himself look even more ridiculous by telling the Europeans how to run their economies, including Germany of all places, the strongest economy in the world, uh, telling them how to do business uh, with Asia, how even to uh, rebuild their cities uh, and how to reshape the, uh, the global power balance. Now, while Mr Keating was feeding uh, his, uh, his ego by strutting the world stage, I must say sounding uh, every decibel more like a dictator in the making, uh, the Australian economy uh, continued to plunge into further balance of payments deficit, the foreign debt continued to soar and the Australian dollar plummeted against virtually all other currencies, including of course, the Deutschmark, uh, the currency of the nation whose chancellor, uh, Mr Keating, had the arrogance to lecture on economic management. Uh, un unbelievable. And, uh, today, when I, po when I pointed out uh, that the, uh, to the leader of the government in the Senate uh, that the fall in the Australian dollar and our chronic balance of payments problem made further uh, interest rate and tax increases inevitable unless the government uh, acts uh, uh, swiftly and surely uh, to put its budget house in order, uh, the leader of the government uh, refused even to comprehend that situation. Now, Mr uh, Deputy President, the simple fact is that the government is attempting to sweep this inevitability under the carpet until after the New South Wales uh, uh, elections uh, next Saturday. And that is a quite disgraceful abrogation of the government's uh, responsibility uh, to manage the affairs of state uh, at the national level. It is almost exactly a repeat of what the Hawke government did, uh, you may recall, in 1988. Uh, when the now, uh, when the, the now Prime Minister, uh, Mr Keating, was Treasurer and when the, the uh, then New South Wales uh, Labor government uh, uh, under Premier uh, Barry Unsworth was uh, fighting, as it turned out, unsuccessfully uh, for survival. And the delays in taking uh, responsible action, economic action, at the federal level in 1988 uh, simply in a, in a uh, totally opportunistic uh, domestic political attempt uh, to save the skin of a, co of a colleague government uh, at the state level in New South Wales, the delays that were caused for that very reason and that very reason alone were the reasons uh, that led directly uh, to the Treasurer pulling on the recession that he said that we had to have but which, of course, in, in reality was a recession we should never have had to have and should never have had uh, if there had been one ounce of economic uh, responsibility and, uh, and, uh, and acceptance of that responsibility uh, at the federal, uh, federal government level. We are seeing the same thing again uh, this year in the 1995 uh, election for the New South Wales government. I'm absolutely certain that the result is going to be the same as in 1988. That is, the desperate attempts uh, by a Labor government in Canberra to save their Labor mates, and I use the word advisedly, uh, in New South Wales, is going to be as unsuccessful in 1995 and deservedly so as it was in 1988. Order. Senator Troth. On the same matter, Senator Troth? Uh, Senator Hill, I, I actually had you on the list. Are you in respect to the same matter? The question is, Senator, take note of the minister's answer. Those that opinion say aye, those against say no, I think the ayes have it. Senator Hill. Mr. President, I move the Senate take note of um, Senator Evans' answer on Aboriginal affairs. Uh, and I do so because um, I'm sick and tired of the government resting on its laurels in relation to Aboriginal affairs, when in fact their record in this most sensitive portfolio is absolutely appalling. If, ever, if there is ever an area of po public policy failure, Senator Reynolds, it has to be in relation to Aboriginal affairs. And you've only got to start, you've only got to start by looking at the facts. Look at the record of the Australian Bureau of Statistics as it put out in its recent census. Let's look at some of the figures for a moment. Unemployment rate 38 per cent. 
But if you take into account those who are working for the Dole on Commonwealth unemployment programs, over 50, 54 per cent of Aboriginals are unemployed. 60 to 70 per cent of them are long-term unemployed. 50 per cent in the age group 15 to 19. Now, you might smile or laugh at this, but we actually think it's important. Look at income, for example. Aboriginals haven't got jobs. Six out of ten Aborigines in Australia is on an annual income of less than $12,000—60 per cent. Six out of ten. It's an appalling record. Uh, education. This government boasts about the record of school, uh, uh, of school uh, children that are staying to school to year 12. Well, I can tell you that of 17-year-old Aboriginal Australians, only 30 per cent of them are in any form of education at all. And look at health. Did you read Senator Reynolds the, the, what the census report said? That 29 per cent of Aboriginal Australians are concerned about where the next meal is coming, coming from. Did you read, in, in fact, that, uh, that uh, maternal death rates are eight times higher in the Aboriginal community than in the white community? That 30 per cent of Aborigines are affected by diabetes? that men aged between 25 and 35 are ten times more likely to die than the rest of the community, and so, someone, so we can go on. Have you looked at the figures in relation to Aboriginal housing, uh, Senator Reynolds? Have you seen that 40,000 Aborigines living in remote and rural Australia need housing and that one-third of the existing stock—4,500 houses are in poor repair and in need of major renovation? That 35,000 bedrooms are needed and 16,000 people need proper access to sewerage systems. How many times do you need to look at the facts before you recognise, in fact, that your government has failed in this vitally important and sensitive, uh, and sensitive um, area? And I could go on with, uh, with housing. 69 per cent, practically 70 per cent, are in some form of uh, rental, rental housing. Now, that's not bad in, it, in, in itself, but why are they treated differently than the rest of the Australian community? Mr Deputy President, in the critically important areas of Aboriginal health, Aboriginal, Aboriginal jobs, Aboriginal education, these areas where Aboriginal people have a right to expect more of this government, this government has failed them. And all we hear from the government are their boasts. I heard it on the radio over the weekend. We gave Australian Aborigines Mabo. This government didn't give them Mabo at all. Mabo was the decision of the High Court. It was the High Court. It was the High Court that decided that native title existed, not your, not your government at all. And as to the latest uh, land bill, well, that's uh, we said that we'll support it. But the point is, the point is, it is easy for you to pass legislation to allocate public money in the purchase of an area where state governments have been doing it for years, and then boast of your achievements. But when you look at these critically important areas, health, education, and jobs, it can only be said on any fair, objective assessment that you have failed the Aboriginal community in this country. That your record in Aboriginal affairs is deplorable, and it's about time you faced up to your responsibility in that regard. Yeah. Well, the question is, is Senator, Senator Reynolds on the same matter? Yes, on the, on the same matter. Senator Hill, I can understand why you're sensitive. I can understand why you feel that you've got to go through a litany, a litany of, of uh, statistics. I don't suppose that anyone on this side of the chamber would try to make a claim that, that uh, the, the, this government has overcome all the very complex social issues facing Indigenous peoples. However, we have been prepared to tackle some of the major issues, the ideological issues, that you cannot come to grips with. You, you talk about our response to the High Court's decision, but of course it's quite clear that you could not deal with that issue. You were so divided, you couldn't deal with it in an open fair-spirited way. You had to nitpick at every, at every turn, and you, had to con you have to continue with all issues affecting Indigenous people to be very grudging in your approach. Here we, have, here we actually have today, when we should be debating the Racial um, Hatred Bill, we have a debate that goes on this morning while you again refuse to deal with the issues. Now, I, I will debate you any day about, about the fundamentals in relation to health, health, housing, employment and education. 
But if you look at the statistics of your, your administration or in the 1970s— Senator Edwards, I want to just invite you to address your remarks through the chair as well as to the opposition. Yes, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Mr Deputy President. I'm glad you reminded me of that. But uh, I, do think it, I do think it is important that we try in this place to get some cross-party approach to, to race issues and to Indigenous issues in particular. It, I find it very distressing that uh, the, uh, the opposition loses no opportunity to try to point score and politicise what is a fundamental issue for this, this nation. And Senator Hill talks about our reputation, but Senator Hill, you're someone who travels extensively, and I understand, I understand that it is quite uh, common, certainly when I travel, for people to compliment the Australian people, compliment the Australian government on the changes that have been being made in Indigenous policy in this country. There have been a number of people, particularly from Canada, uh, from the United States, who are extremely impressed with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission and the way it operates. And yet all we ever hear in this place is criticism of, of uh, the Commission and uh, well, well, you may not be, you may not be, you may not be cri uh, criticising on this occasion, but you are frequently, and members of the opposition are always criticising the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. You lose no opportunity to try to take Indigenous people to task. When, when we have, when we have uh, issues in other areas of government where funds have not necessarily been spent as effectively as they should. Do we hear from the opposition? No, we don't. We only ever hear from the opposition we, do, we, we only ever hear from the opposition when they want to attack indigenous people. And you don't hear well, and let's, let's, look at, let's look at at what happened in the Heinemarsh Island circumstance. Did we get a, gener a, a spirit of generosity from Ian McLaughlin? No. He finally had to resign because he was obliged to resign. He saw that that was necessary. So, Senator Hill, I don't think you're in any position to lecture this government until you get your own policies in order. We don't know what your policies are, and, and we don't know what your commitment to Indigenous people are. You're, you're continually resentful and resisting in your approach to indigenous issues and I think it's about time it's, a, it's about time that you put your policies on the table and then we might be able to make a judgment uh, order um, on the same matter Senator Evans thank you uh, mr. deputy president I wanted to address a few remarks to uh, Senator Gareth Evans response to the question on the native title legislation as well because I think it is uh, of concern that the uh, response made by the Liberal Party to the High Court decision the other day, and I think it has been highlighted by Senator Hill's contribution today, which I uh, take as a rerun of the Mark II position on the Land Fund, which was to talk about amendments that go to questions of education, health, housing, etc. I think that was the Downer position, as different from the Hewson position, as different from the Howard, uh, Howard position which is now to claim that the legislation is unworkable. And, uh, and I think this really, uh, really shows the total disarray that the Liberal Party has in relation to, uh, to Aboriginal issues. The High Court found uh, the other day that the West Australian legislation was invalid, and they ruled 7-0 on that issue. So it's quite clear that the Commerce legislation has been upheld, and the West Australian legislation was to be found, found to be invalid and, uh, is, in my view, essentially racist. Now, the Liberal Party has to come to terms with that. They cannot continue to bow to the Liberal rednecks in Western Australia who want to pretend it never happened. The fact is the Mabo decision did happen. The fact is the federal parliament did respond, did legislate in accordance with that, with that decision. And the High Court have now removed any uncertainty about our our legislation's constitutional validity and have ruled invalid the racist attempt by the West Australian government to take away those rights to native title enjoyed by West Australian Aboriginal people. But the worrying aspect is not that, that Richard Court continues to oppose the legislation and continues his fight 
I guess he has no option. He's committed himself so far down the track that he really can't turn back, although it's obviously at uh, severe risk to his credibility now when the $10 million of taxpayers' money in West Australia has been wasted on this futile uh, attempt to overturn the native title legislation. But the really worrying thing is, is the remarks made by John Howard in commenting on the decision following court's comments. He claimed also that the legislation was unworkable in WA. He's provided no evidence for that assertion. He's provided uh, no basis for that. But he is trying to respond to the, uh, to the uh, redneck elements from the Liberal Party in Western Australia who wish to argue it's unworkable in WA. Now, they don't say what's different about Western Australia other than the fact that we have more mining, mining uh, leases than any other state. And that's quite true. We do have a large amount of mining activity. But the principles that underline the bill are just as capable of working in West Australia as they are in any other, any other uh, state. And for John Howard to have this knee-jerk reaction that the legislation is unworkable just shows the total disarray on, Liberal, on the Liberal side on the questions of Aboriginal land and native title. They are so much out of touch that uh, is reflected in an in a article in today's uh, Australian in which the chief of the CRA well-known friends of the Labor Party and the trade union movement, has hailed Mabo as an opportunity for partnership. And I quote, in a speech representing a sea change in attitudes at CRA, long regarded as hard line, and praising the Prime Minister, Mr Keating, Mr Leon Davis said yesterday he was satisfied with the central tenant of the Act. Mr Davis said it laid the basis for better exploration access and then thus increased the probability that the next decade will see a series of CRA operations developed in active partnership with Aboriginal people." End of quote. So the Liberal Party is not reflecting even the views of the mining industry in its continued opposition to, to uh, the native title legislation. You've got CRA, one of the biggest miners and explorers in Western Australia, indicating its support for the basic principles of the Native Title Act. You are all alone clinging to support Richard Court, who was wrong, who's been proved to be wrong 7-0, and he can't accept the political defeat. What the High Court what the High Court has done is uphold our legislation and has uphold the opportunities that are existent in the Act to, to make the system work. And what I think uh, Richard Court and the Liberal Party are better off doing is looking at those problems that they say exist and using the mechanisms that already exist in the native title legislation to establish state bodies, state tribunals to deal with applications and, and to uh, look at the question of the right to negotiate regime and look at the possibilities for exclusion from some of those things. There are opportunities in the native title legislation that can be adopted and can be usefully used in Western Australia with a constructive approach. And John Howard should not go the same way as Alexander Downer did in bowing to hardline liberal right-wing attitudes. He brought about the downfall of his own leadership, and the same will happen to John Howard unless he changes his view on this legislation. Well, the question is that, uh, the question is that the Senate take note of that answer. Those that opinion say aye, those again say no. I think the ayes have it. What am I, what I, with my delicate sensitivity, make the observation that the expression racist in respect to a political party is probably acceptable, in terms of it being a description of a government is less acceptable. It is certainly not acceptable in terms of individual members of any party, whether they be the Premier or anybody else. Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr. Ac Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the answer given by Rosemary Crowley, um, Senator, Crowley. Senator, so sorry, Senator Crowley, um, in regard to childcare in New South Wales. And um, if Senator Crowley is, is not aware that after extensive negotiations that the New South Wales government signed off or agreed to the expanded national childcare strategy on 3 February 1995, then she is um, not managing her department well. She knows very well that there was in principle agreement by the federal government and the state government to the terms in the strategy at an officer level. Now, Rose, Senator Crowley has yet to sign the agreement, has yet to officially sign the agreement, and she is the one who is at fault in the type of political storm that she has tried to whip up today. And indeed, I concur with the comments of the New South Wales Minister for Community Service, Mr Jim Longley, who has accused the federal Labor government of deliberately delaying the implementation of the expanded national childcare strategy as a blatant political stunt. 
Now, Senator Crowley has long been critical of the New South Wales government for not previously signing the agreement, and it does seem strange now that the state has finally forced the government to make concessions, only weeks before the state election, in which Labor is not looking good, that Senator Crowley is now holding off signing the agreement. And one would almost um, be led to the conclusion that she is more concerned with playing political games with her state counterparts than actually being concerned about childcare places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The New South Wales government had not previously signed the agreement because they were not convinced that the strategy was in the best interest of children or their parents. And they were particularly concerned that the Commonwealth's emphasis on childcare for children with working families did not adequately address the needs of vulnerable children. Now, finally, New South Wales accepted the Commonwealth's offer of additional childcare places after three points were conceded. New places for disadvantaged families which Labor was not prepared to fund under the previous guidelines. When the Commonwealth finally ensured that administrative agreements were streamlined, which reduced bureaucratic delays and when long daycare places were added into preschools, which is surely making the best use of resources. Now, in negotiating for those concessions, the New South Wales government was not being obstreperous. It had simply taken great pains to work out an agreement that appropriately addressed the needs of New South Wales families and ensured a high standard of care for children. The concern with affordability, flexibility and accessibility is not something the Commonwealth Government on, has a very good track record on. And I might just refresh the government's memory of a number of reports which came out last year and chronicled the problems with the Commonwealth's childcare program, such as insufficient baby places, insufficient childcare places in rural areas, the cost of childcare, a, a lack of flexibility in care arrangements and so on. Parents continually complain about the lack of places, long waiting lists and unsuitable opening hours for centre-based care. Now, of course Senator Crowley is going to make these comments in the run-up to the New South Wales election. What needs to be borne in mind is the fragmentation and the administrative chaos of the Commonwealth programs compared to the constructive policies of the Fay government, which will, which will provide an integrated childcare program so necessary to the needs of the modern family. What are the questions to the Senate on the, on the same matter, Senator West? Uh, Mr Deputy President, I have heard many apologies in this place in various guises, but this is the best one I have ever heard apologising for New South Wales taking just on five years to sign the National Child Care Agreement. That means that 8,000 places in New South Wales have been wanting, have been not available to families in New South Wales for five years. And somebody in the opposition stands up and has to apologise. No wonder people in New South Wales are concerned about what this current Mr Fay's government is doing, when that's the sort of thing. We hear Senator Troth talk about the problems with long waiting lists. Well, there wouldn't be such long waiting lists in New South Wales if they'd signed the agreement some time ago when it had first been discussed and first been put on the table. But it takes New South Wales to the eve of an election where they look like losing before they actually decide they have to do something for the family of new families with children in New South Wales. I would suggest that Senator Troth would be well advised to go and talk to families in New South Wales, to go and talk to rural families about the preschool needs of children in those areas and how they cannot get preschools out to those places. You want to talk about childcare and preschool needs? What about asking the parents who can't get their children on the distance education preschool because the New South Wales government will only fund them for about 70 odd places? 70 odd places in distance education preschool to cover the whole of New South Wales? You have to be joking. They have crazy rules that people in places such as Wanaring, where there might only be one child of preschool age, because they live in a settled area, aren't 
able to have access to distance education preschool, which is the same as the school of the air. So New South Wales, in fact, has been discriminating against people, particularly in rural areas with families, for a long time on the issue of childcare and children's services. We wouldn't want for them to discuss also the issue of um, accommodation for the disabled in New South Wales, but that's not something in this answer. We here are talking about childcare and children's services in New South Wales. What the Fay government, the Fay Murray, Fay Armstrong government have done is just to totally neglect and disregard the needs of rural families in particular, but the childcare needs of people in those areas. In Broken Hill, they should go and talk to the occasional care centre there that's been trying to get extra funding out of the state government so that they can run an occasional care centre. They should go up to Wee War and talk to the mothers and the families out there who are trying, who this year have a mobile preschool running because they have a rural access program, a women's access program grant, and next year the state government is not going to provide them with anything. These are the sorts of issues and the sorts of things that the people in New South Wales are having to put up with. We also had, as I say, we had nothing from, heard nothing from the federal, from the state government, for four years in excess on this issue. Four years it went on for, and they did nothing. Deprived at least about 8,000 places, people with access to about 8,000 places. Now I couldn't live with that on my conscience, but obviously Mr. Fay is suddenly having an attack of conscience now when we're. Sort of, we started off when we were about five weeks out from the election, um, and we've had a few headlines since then. But of course, why does it take them four years or five years? Because it's now gone into 1995. Why has it taken them so long? They've come up with a number of feeble excuses. Oh, we wanted to get a better deal. Because we've waited, we've got a better deal. What about the families who have been discriminated against? What about those who have been unable to find the care for their children that they have needed in the past four years? They have been totally ignored and totally neglected. And that's the sort of thing that a coalition government would do federally and what we've seen. We know we have the example of what they do when they're in a coalition government in the state. This is the sort of thing that people will be opposing and voting against next Saturday. But it's interesting. We have not heard anything from the opposition on this matter, but obviously today, by today's performance in the chamber there is an election coming up in New South Wales. The opposition are very concerned about what the result is going to be, and it's pretty clear that there's going to be a change of government. This sort of thing is just highlights to us just how, how um, very seriously concerned the, uh, the current Liberal government in New South Wales is when they have to suddenly, after five years, decide they're going to sign agreements. I think it's an abysmal shame and a, a disgrace that it would take a government five years to do something and it would deprive 8,000 families of ac or more of access to childcare which they desperately need. Order. The question is that the Senate take note on the same matter. I, I would like to. Um have a, say a few so, words I'm, on I'm the issue go, of child I apologise. I have I the call, and I think you order, might give me the courtesy of it, respecting that. Order, Senator, Senator Neil, I apologise. I, if, there's a, if there's a speaker on the other side, if, with your indulgence, I, I must call them. I didn't understand there was. In fact, I was so concerned because Senator Chamaret was, was to take the call for the next question, and I was preoccupied with that. But if there's a call on the same matter, uh, I have called you, Senator Neil, if you insist you're entitled to have the call, but um, I, I, in fact, I would, under normal circumstances, call somebody from the left. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Se President. If Senator ever the Betts. people of New South Wales needed a reason why they should not be voting Labor at the next election, it is the contribution that we have just heard from Senator West. The simple fact is, as Senator Troth has so properly pointed out, the Fay government signed the appropriate agreement in early February. Something, sorry? Yes. They, signed, they signed off on that agreement. They signed off on that agreement. They, they signed off on the agreement. Why don't you listen? Order, Senator Neil. It's most unlike you to be describing the comments of one of your colleagues on the other side as telling lies. I'd, I'd feel more comfortable if you'd, if you'd uh, sure. withdraw that. Oh. Se Senator, Senator Ray. We on this side have always taken a very consistent attitude to that point you have raised. 
and uh, I'm sure Senator Neil will, uh, in uh, the fullness of time, in fact after I finish speaking, withdraw uh, that particular comment. Uh, and uh, yes. What I actually said was that what he had said. What? Just would you mind actually listening? If you shut up and show order, some order, courtesy, order. I will withdraw. Order, order, Senator Neil. Senator Neil, as an inexperienced deputy president, I could get easy to get the impression that you and Senator Ray are taking up the time that's left, which is uh, running down very quickly. I'm asking you to withdraw. I, I will withdraw Thank any you. statement, S S S any S statement that they were liars. But what I said was what they were saying was not correct. Senator Neil, the, the time for this debate has uh, has expired. I put the question that. Um, that the Senate take note of the Minister's answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I, I think the ayes have it. Presentation of other documents. Pursuant to the resolution of the Senate of the 23rd of August 1990, I present the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Native Title on the National Native Tribunal Annual Report of 1993-94, together with a transcript of evidence which were presented to, to me on March 9, 1995. Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I move that the report be printed. Uh, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. 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 President, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, I'm sorry, do you wish to speak to it, Senator? Yes, briefly, please, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, uh, this report was, uh, which is the second uh, report of the uh, Joint Parliamentary Committee on Native Title, was uh, tabled out of session due to uh, pressure of business uh, last sitting week. Uh, the report uh, is our report on the first annual report of the the Native uh, Title Tribunal. Um, it's uh, noteworthy that uh, this report on uh, issues to do with Aboriginal affairs is, an, is again a unanimous report of the Parliamentary Committee, which is represented by all, all parties uh, represented in the Senate except the Democrats. And uh, for that I'd like to thank the committee members, the staff and uh, acknowledge the co cooperation we received from the Tribunal President and staff. They, as always, conduct themselves in a very professional manner and uh, I think are doing an excellent job. The whole process of compiling this report was a very constructive process and uh, I think was highlighted by a submission from Mick Dodson, the Social Justice Commissioner, who made some very uh, constructive criticisms about the operation of the tribunal but did it in, a, as I say, a constructive and positive way that's only uh, uh, taken on the debate rather than... Uh, rather than uh, uh, been any, any sense of sort of point scoring exercise. The overall conclusion contained in the report is that the Native Title Tribunal is soundly established, that the early teething problems uh, from which we received uh, some evidence seem to have been addressed satisfactorily, and that the, the uh, Tribunal is playing a very good role in liaising with all the interested parties. Uh, the President has established liaison committees in each of the, uh, each of the states and is keeping in close contact, uh, contact with industry and Aboriginal interests to make sure that the tribunal um, is uh, keep, kept abreast of developments and is sensitive to the needs of both industry and Aboriginal uh, uh, communities. The report deals uh, with two major issues, and I won't go with any great length, uh, Mr. Deputy President, but the first was the acceptance process for applications, and the second was the President's suggested amendments to the Act. In terms of the acceptance test, there are arguments from industry that the uh, threshold of the test was too low and that Aboriginals were being allowed to enjoy the uh, benefits of the right to negotiate regime without fully establishing their claim to uh, native title. And the response of Aboriginal groups was concern regarding delays in having their uh, claims accepted, concern about some pre-acceptance discussions the tribunal was having, particularly with state governments, and uh, some uh, allegation that they were being required to go through uh, hoops that were not envisaged by the Act. Uh, the committee, in its conclusion, unanimously found that the relevant section, section 63 of the Act, 
which governs the acceptance of applications, was being applied correctly by the tribunal, that is, that it was meeting the tests appropriately set down in the legislation. And uh, the committee, in, in, in essence, therefore rejects the view that, uh, that the threshold had been, accepted, uh, had been set at too low a level. The committee, however, did note, uh, and I quote, the need for the tribunal to ensure that the pre-acceptance consultation is confined to questions of a factual nature and does, does not amount to mediation or negotiation with parties. This is a recognition by the committee of the concerns and criticisms raised by the Aboriginal uh, parties at what on occasions they uh, con uh, consider to have been quite long delays at the acceptance stage. We're pleased to note that the President in his uh, submission to the inquiry has responded to those concerns and is amending the tribunal procedures to, uh, to reflect uh, the evidence presented to the committee. On the other issue of the uh, President's proposed amendment to the Act, uh, the committee took the view that it was too early given the formative stage of the legislation and the need for more practical experience to, uh, to make a, a definitive judgment on his proposed amendment and uh, argued at the time that we ought to await the decision of the High Court. Well, as uh, members will be aware, that decision has now been handed down and uh, has upheld the Commonwealth legislation and struck out the West Australian uh, legislation as invalid. And so uh, it would, at, uh, in normal circumstances, be appropriate to consider that early amendment uh, uh, suggested by the President. I must say, though, Mr Deputy President, that the uh, debate has very much moved on now, and I think uh, the, uh, not only because of the High Court decision in relation to the WA legislation, but more importantly, in my view, the, uh, the decision of the High Court and the Brandy decision, which has implications for the Native Title Tribunal, and uh, I think the uh, changed public stance of organisations like the J WA Chamber of Mines and uh, today's uh, comments in the Australian by the head of, the, of CRA in, uh, in Australia means that the, uh, that the whole debate has moved on and that uh, uh, I think a discussion of the President's amendment is really uh, uh, not, uh, not very helpful at this stage. The, uh, the President has uh, submitted to the government a range of further amendments which uh, go to addressing the Brandy decision and the implications of that decision for the Native Title Tribunal. I think the government will have to seriously look at those suggestions in responding to the uh, difficulties posed by the Brandy decision, and I think they ought to be uh, the focus of discussion uh, uh, about amendments to the Native Title legislation. I think uh, it is, though, still the case that it is too early to look at whether or not the principles underlying the legislation have, uh, in fact, been successfully applied. That's due to the, uh, the uncertainty brought about by the WA High Court challenge and the fact that most parties have held off uh, proceeding under the Native Title Act until that uh, decision has been clear. There are also issues relating to past releases in which judicial decision is awaited. And, quite frankly, the states have played a negative role in a number of cases in uh, taking technical legal points during mediation proceedings which have uh, not allowed uh, the tribunal processes to run as smoothly as one would have hoped. So all these uh, delays, together with uh, the basic uh, uh, fact that uh, the development of common law in relation to native title will be a long process and, uh, and will evolve over time, means, in my view, that it's too early to properly assess and review the legislation um, and the impact the Native Title Act is having. I think, though, that uh, now the challenge is to, uh, to respond to the Brandy case decision to ensure that uh, tribunal processes and procedures are, are altered to reflect that decision, but to allow the basic principles of the Act to stay in place and uh, hopefully uh, the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Native Title will play a constructive and positive role in uh, examining the need for those changes and making some recommendations to government and to the parliament. And, uh, I hope that given all the acrimony that has surrounded Aboriginal issues in this parliament since I, uh, I was elected to the Senate uh, can be overcome, and uh, there have been some good signs in the work of this committee where, as I say, we have managed, despite some differences of opinion, to produce uh, two uh, unanimous reports, and hopefully when we get to more contentious issues that trend will continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the question is the motion uh, agreed to. Those that opinion say aye, oh, those against say no. Aye. I think the eyes have it.
uh, pursuant to, to resolutions of the Senate of the 13th of February 1991 and the 28th of June of 1994, I table indexed file of a list of files which was presented to me on the 15th of March 1995 in accordance with the terms of the 13th of February 1991 resolution if the publication of documents is authorised. I present the 1994 supplement to the Register of Senate Committee reports. I have received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying the Senate to seven laws, details of which will be incorporated in hand, sir. Uh, no, no report from committees and documents presented by the Clerk. Documents are tabled in accordance with lists circulated to honourable senators. An indexed list of files for the Department of Defence is presented pursuant to the order of the Senate of 28 June 1994. Uh, Clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion Number 2, standing in the name of Senator Faulkner, relating to the exemption from the order of the Senate of 29 November 1994 of the Land, Fu land Fund and Indigenous Land Corporation Atsic Amendment Bill 1994. Senator Ray. On behalf of Senator Faulkner, I move the motion. I think I'm required to give reasons therein, and I'm advised of the following. As the Senate is well aware, it passed an earlier version of this bill with some 70 amendments last week. When that bill was returned to the House of Representatives, that House disagreed with a number of the amendments made by the Senate and laid the bill aside. A new land fund bill was introduced in the House of Representatives on the 28th of February with amendments acceptable to the government and was passed by the House on the 8th of March. The Senate is, of course, very familiar with the provisions of the bill, having debated the earlier version at great length. The new bill is identical to the earlier bill as introduced into the Senate subject to the inclusion of 29 amendments agreed to by the Senate. When he indicated that the Coalition would not be opposing the new bill, the Leader of the Opposition said that he was doing so in order to prevent further delays in the flow of benefits from the Land Fund to Aboriginal people. The Government is seeking the expeditious passage of the new bill in the interest of having the Land Fund commence as soon as possible. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Ray be agreed to those that opinion say aye. I was going to say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ray. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I move that the ATSEC bill be brought on forthwith. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those that are going to say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator uh, Clark. Government Business Order of the Day, Land Fund and Indigenous Land Corporation, APSIC Amendment Bill, 1994, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Alston. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to speak on the APSIC Amendment, Indigenous Land Corporation and Land Fund Bill, 1994, and indeed uh, by our um, support for the, um, the previous motion, we uh, were indicating that we are anxious to have this uh, matter passed through the parliament as expeditiously as possible. And we do that uh, on the basis that um, whilst we have taken a position of principle and indeed I think to a significant extent we have been vindicated by the, uh, the number of amendments to, uh, that the Senate managed to achieve to legislation which the government from the outset was maintaining didn't require any amendments, then I think in itself we have demonstrated that um, the uh, uh, time spent in this chamber has been well worthwhile. But having reached the uh, deadlock position, as a result of um, uh, intransigence on the part of the government in relation to uh, at least some of the balance of those amendments, it uh, seemed clear to us, as Mr Howard uh, spelled out in uh, the House of Representatives on the 2nd of March, that uh, no point would usefully be served by uh, further delay because it was clear the government wasn't uh, proposing to go down our path and uh, we were not proposing to go down their path. And in those circumstances, the only losers would be those who are intended to be the beneficiaries of this legislation. Uh, in those circumstances, uh, we therefore um, have made it plain that uh, we will support the, uh, the land fund. And uh, once that is in place, we will obviously uh, monitor progress through to the next election. But at that time, we will again seek to uh, introduce 
those amendments which um, we uh, achieved successfully in this chamber and which we think do go a very significant way towards improving the lot of uh, those who are meant to benefit from the legislation. It is significant, I think, that um, this time around, as opposed to uh, the time when the Mabo legislation was debated, uh, there were a significant number of um, Aboriginal communities, indeed the New South Wales Land, Fund in, um, Land Council in particular, but certainly a number of other organisations who made it plain that they did not agree with the government's approach, and nor did they agree with the position outlined by ATSIC spokespeople. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, those who were criticising uh, ATSIC were, were right, uh, nor does it mean that, uh, the, that ATSIC was right. What it does mean is that there is uh, room for uh, intelligent disputation in the Aboriginal community, and so there ought to be in national politics. And that's why I think it is a great tragedy that uh, whenever an issue relating to Aboriginal affairs surfaces, and in, as we all know, it is a very emotive subject, the Prime Minister takes every opportunity to imply that uh, only he is on the side of virtue and his critics are uh, hard-hearted, uh, selfish people who are seeking to deny um, the improvement of the Aboriginal condition. And that is clearly not the case. There are clearly a number of ways in which progress can be achieved, and I would hope, in the spirit uh, adverted to a moment ago by Senator Chris Evans, that, uh, that there can be honest differences of opinion. Certainly, uh, the approach we took after uh, considerable consultation, uh, and I might at this stage uh, pay tribute to the work of um, two of my Senate colleagues, Senators uh, Ian Campbell and Chris Ellison, uh, it became clear that there, wa there was a significant demand amongst uh, members of the Aboriginal community for uh, much greater direct involvement, not to have things simply decided by uh, so-called official representatives, not to have um, land simply transferred to corporations, but to broaden the approach so that uh, individuals would be of paramount importance. And uh, I think uh, Senators Campbell and Ellison, in their travels around the country during January, when Senator Ray and I were at the cricket, uh, was clearly uh, a very important exercise in ascertaining uh, what it was that, um, that the Aboriginal community wanted. And I don't think um, we came up with any uh, single view, and nor should we. But uh, what I think we did discover, and I hope the government will acknowledge that we discovered, was that there are uh, very many different approaches that can be taken in good faith. And therefore, uh, the amendments which um, were carried by the Senate, uh, which the government will now not pursue, are ones which we will certainly seek to uh, reintroduce as uh, soon as the opportunity arises, and that will certainly be after the next election. And I think uh, when, we, when we do go down that path, we will find that um, the approach that uh, we are proposing is one that uh, will have a much more holistic uh, uh, impact on the Aboriginal community won't simply be uh, focused entirely on land, uh, important in all as that is, but will also address uh, other fundamental uh, factors which are necessary for human well-being. And um, I think we all know the extent to which uh, the Aboriginal community is uh, greatly deprived in the areas of uh, health, housing, education, welfare and uh, indeed uh, employment opportunities. And uh, unless and until we focus on uh, those greater criteria, then uh, it is unlikely that we will see significant improvement in the Aboriginal condition. And uh, I think that is one of the great tragedies that after 12 years of government and the expenditure of hundreds of millions of additional dollars, it is very difficult to demonstrate that Aboriginal health has improved. Indeed, uh, the statistics would indicate quite to the contrary. And in those circumstances, uh, the last thing that uh, a Prime Minister ought to be doing is running around pretending that somehow um, a land fund designed to uh, assist perhaps 5 per cent of the Aboriginal population is really going to uh, uh, solve any significant problems. The problems on the ground uh, are very basic human needs and ones that uh, need a lot more attention, not just dollars, but a lot more uh, 
experimentation in terms of uh, involvement by the Aboriginal communities themselves, a lot more sensitivity on the part of those who are responsible for the administration of uh, those funds, but that fundamentally address the needs of the local communities, not simply telling them that uh, land is the answer or that without land uh, you can't make any progress. The argument has uh, some validity, undoubtedly, but to suggest that uh, unless and until you uh, are able to restore uh, to the Aboriginal community an entitlement to uh, land that's uh, tantamount to uh, the freehold that is uh, held by uh, many non-Aboriginal Australians, I think uh, is almost uh, verging on a cruel hoax, because the fact is you have to approach these things um, in a number of different ways, and you have to ensure that you are making progress on a number of different fronts. So that uh, we will be, uh, in due course, uh, when in the announcement of our uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders policy, ensuring that we address a number of those, all of those issues, and at the same time that we uh, spell out our commitment to ensuring that the land fund uh, operates in the best interests of um, Aboriginal communities. Um, Senator Chris Evans. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support uh, the bill, the Land Fund and Indigenous Land Corporation ATSIC Amendment Bill. In doing so, I apologise for uh, getting up three times in about an hour uh, in the Senate. It's, uh, it's uh, not like me, and it's not, uh, not to be given any credence in relation to financial review stories that, uh, that this is somehow prompted by that. But. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm very much the 12th man, Todd. But uh, um, it is, I think, important for uh, at least a couple of government senators to uh, speak to uh, this bill. It is a fact that we've had uh, the large part of the debate uh, uh, when debating the previous bill, and I don't really wish to traverse all the ground. Uh, uh, and uh, I acknowledge Senator Alston didn't do that, and uh, I think that's uh, that's appropriate. But uh, I think it is uh, important that. Uh, that we say a few things about this bill, because I think it is important, firstly, to put it in context. It is the second stage of the government's legislative response to Mabo. It is part of a package of measures that the government has initiated to try and respond to the dispossession of Aboriginal people from their land. It is about their relationship with land and about trying to uh, uh, allow them to assert their self-respect and assert their relationship with the land. The land fund will enable Indigenous people to acquire land and to manage it in a sustainable way to promote economic, social and cultural benefits. It, uh, it will address the needs of those that will not benefit from Mabo and the native title legislation, that is, those dis dispossessed of their land who cannot meet the criteria laid down in the Mabo decision, which requires a continuing connection with the land and waters. The Mabo High Court decision and the later title legislation will, I think, always be seen as the landmark, the symbolic uh, recognition of uh, Aboriginal preoccupation of their land in Australian society. But in a practical sense of making uh, land with commercial uh, viability and ongoing benefits available to Aboriginal people, I think the land fund and the measures contained in the social justice package may prove to be more significant in the longer term. The resounding uh, rejection of the Dubai government's uh, 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 land uh, legislation in response to the, to the uh, Mabo decision and uh, the discriminatory way that that operated, I think, uh, is obviously reinforced the Mabo judgment and the correct uh, approach uh, that the, this, uh, this parliament adopted. I think now we can seek to have those native title laws implemented and, uh, and properly applied and I think we will make significant progress in the next year or so in, in developing native title law. But it will be a long process. It will rely on judicial judgments and evolution of common law, and uh, there are no easy solutions or, or quick fixes involved in that native title uh, route. Um, I think, uh, despite the rhetoric of some political leaders like Richard Court, the amount of land that will eventually be found to be native title uh, and granted to Aboriginals will be quite small and, and quite limited in its extent because the tests applied by the Mabo judgment and reflected in the native title legislation are quite, 
are quite stringent, and uh, I think uh, it will not be a boon to a large number of Aboriginals in terms of granting them land. But nevertheless, it is a highly significant and symbolic decision and will result in real benefit to a whole range of Aboriginal communities. But I think uh, Justice French uh, of the Native Title uh, Tribunal, in his uh, ruling on the uh, Wani application recently, uh, highlighted some of the problems that uh, Aboriginal groups will have in establishing Native Title. Um, because of these problems, I think it's uh, more imperative that uh, the land fund, uh, as, uh, as proposed by the government, is, uh, is implemented and that we start to address the disposition, is the disposition issue uh, of those Aboriginal people who will not have any opportunity to prove native title. Um, I think in, in, in these developments will also generally uh, assist in, uh, in reconciliation within the Australian community. As, uh, as people come to terms with recognising Aboriginal people as people with rights. I think by recognising Aboriginal dispossession, by acknowledging their right to the land and by purchasing land to be held by Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal people can help get, regain their self-respect and force non-Aboriginal people to deal with Aboriginals as people with rights. I think that's a very important develop, development in Australian society. The fact that by uh, recognising Aboriginal rights and people having to deal with Aboriginal people as people who possess rights, then a whole new understanding uh, can be developed in Australian society. And uh, at, the repeat, at the risk of repeating remarks I made earlier today in a previous contribution, it's very heartening to see the chief of CRA, one of Australia's largest mining companies, um, hailing the Mabo uh, legislation as, as an opportunity for partnership between mining companies and, uh, and Aboriginal people and, uh, and expressing the view that he was satisfied with the central tenet of the Native Title Act and generally uh, being quite positive about the role that uh, mining companies can, pay, can play in dealing with Aboriginal people as people with rights uh, and, and rights over land. So I think that's a very encouraging development, a real change in the climate uh, in Australian society. And uh, I must say I've also been heartened by some comments by the WA Chamber of Mines uh, recently which indicate that they too are beginning to come to terms with uh, native title as a, as a fact in Australian common law, especially now that uh, the uh, WA government's challenge to the legislation has, uh, has been ruled out. I think uh, the government uh, has been sensible in accepting uh, some of the amendments that were passed in the Senate. I think a, a range of them uh, uh, do improve the bill, and uh, I'm pleased that, uh, that we have accepted a range of those amendments. I think now it is a very, uh, a very strong bill, and one which I think will deliver to Aboriginal people in a, uh, in a proper way. I don't want, wish to traverse the ground that uh, the opposition has covered in, uh, in this debate in the last year or so, through uh, the various positions adopted by uh, Dr Hewson, Alexander Downer and John Howard and the range of positions they have adopted. Needless to say, it has been a convoluted and quite uh, confusing uh, uh, path they have trod to their current position. But I think, uh, I think it's pleasing nonetheless to see now that we will get the legislation through because uh, the government's intention has always been to have the legislation passed rather than, a, rather than to provide a, a double dissolution trigger. And I'm very hopeful that we will uh, soon pass this legislation and start to see the benefits of the legislation uh, transferred to Aboriginal people in the form of uh, land that they can purchase. Um, I did want to make some brief comments about one set of amendments which really troubled me. Uh, they're the amendments uh, supported by the Liberal Party and, uh, and the Greens in the uh, discussion of the earlier bill, and those are the ones that sought to have the ILC allow individuals and trusts to own property acquired through the land fund and allow guarantee, uh, sorry, grantees of land fund acquisitions to dispose of that land at any time without the consent of the ILC. I was uh, particularly troubled by those, uh, those amendments and uh, am very uh, glad that the government has held firm in opposing those amendments. I understand uh, that in developing their arguments in support of, uh, of that proposition, the opposition parties and Greens have 
seen it as a way of rejecting paternalism being applied to Aboriginal people and that somehow it will make them more self-reliant and recognise the management of their own affairs. And, uh, and I'm sure that has uh, uh, some appeal to those with, a, with an interest in rugged individualism, as the Liberal Party has always had, although I'm not quite sure what the appeal to the Greens is, but um, that'll, uh, I'll have to ask them about that privately. But uh, my major concern there is that that clearly militates against the central aim of building up an Indigenous land base and maintaining it for future generations. The government has continued to maintain its position, a position which Parliament has previously always adopted, and that is that holdings by Indigenous corporations best reflect traditional forms of land ownership and also provide more reliable guarantees of accountability. I can't begin to imagine what would occur the first time an, Aboriginal, an individual Aboriginal sold land granted under the land fund and used those funds for personal consumption purposes. Uh, I have listened to uh, Senators Panizza and Crane over the years uh, make repeated attacks on what they see as wasteful spending and ATSIC, uh, ATSIC uh, programs and uh, continue to highlight what they say is real concerns about accountability and expenditure of money in Aboriginal affairs. I think uh, Senator Curnow referred to this, uh, this problem in one of her earlier contributions. But I just think for the Liberal Party to seriously suggest that they would support granting of land to Aboriginals, which they, individual Aboriginals, which they then could on sell and use the proceeds for personal consumption, that they wouldn't be the first to be in this chamber screaming blue murder, alleging misuse of funds and, uh, and really uh, carrying on a treat is, uh, is uh, just uh, remarkable in my view. I cannot believe that the Liberal Party, who, who given their previous positions, could seriously suggest that we should support amendments that go to that, uh, go to that objective. So I'm pleased that the, uh, the government has uh, accepted the general view of uh, ATSIC and, uh, and Aboriginal groups that I've spoken to, that uh, we ought to uh, maintain the grants uh, to uh, corporations rather than individuals, and that we look to maintain that land base and uh, extend it over time for the benefit of all Aboriginals. Um, I think, uh, in conclusion, Ms. Uh, sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, the land fund will not be the last uh, last step or the last word in this uh, in this process. That uh, the native title legislation represented the first step. The land fund re reflects the third, and in some ways, I think so. The second, and I think in some ways, the third step, the social justice measures and some of the ideas that are coming out of the debate regarding the social justice initiatives may in fact may be the most uh, challenging and innovative at dealing with the problem of dispossession of Aboriginal people from their land and uh, taking measures to help uh, Aboriginal people uh, regain their connection with traditional lands. I think there have been a number of uh, suggestions about uh, making available other Crown lands, about regional land management agreements and a range of other initiatives that, that involve a, range, a lot of lateral thinking and I think that lateral thinking is only being possible because of the way the, uh, the native title legislation and the MABA decision and, of course, the land fund debate have actually pushed forward the debate about, uh, about these issues and, uh, and the recognition generally that uh, the land is very important uh, for Aboriginal people, that is a cultural and, uh, and uh, 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 other, rela other relationship to the land that Aboriginal people enjoy is a much stronger one that, uh, than Europeans, uh, Europeans uh, have, and that it's a very special relationship that, uh, that we have to try and recognise in, uh, in responding to, uh, to Aboriginal needs. I'm not sure that the Liberal Party have quite come to terms with that. I think the contributions by uh, Senator Hill earlier today and Senator Alston leave me in some doubt as to whether they actually have yet really come to terms with, uh, with that special relationship with the land and the need for the parliament to, to recognise that. We always fall back to the debate about uh, what's this mean for education, schools, etc. I, I don't think they actually necessarily grasp the central nature of that connection with the land and that while those issues are very important, Senator Panizza, that also the relationship of Aboriginal people to the land is on, in itself 
a, uh, a very central and important, an important issue. issue. So, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, with those remarks I conclude. I, uh, I uh, welcome uh, this uh, second bill and uh, hope that the Senate uh, supports it. Senator Kono. Madam Acting Deputy President, well, I think it's wonderful to have the opportunity finally to assist passage of this land fund bill in its amended form. And uh, on behalf of the Democrats, uh, I signal yet again our support for the concept of this land fund and uh, our vigorous resistance of some of the core amendments from the opposition and the Greens, which in our view have the cumulative result of undermining the purpose of the land fund and in so doing eroding the land stock. I heard Senator Alston's contribution and uh, I was a little bit disappointed to see us still mentioning or well, the opposition still mentioning what I regard as citizenship rights, rights to basic health standards, education and housing, the way in which most Australians have access to those rights, still tying those to the notion of land, still seeing land as some sort of commodity which primarily is there to be bought and sold in reasonably materialistic way and still seeking to measure in the buying and selling acquisition of land, still seeking to measure some tangible improvement in what I, I regard as the citizenship rights of Indigenous people. So I'd have to say to the coalition, given uh, what Senator Alston said about uh, seeking to move the opposition's amendments should the opposition form government, that uh, I haven't heard anything in the debate that would persuade me to change my view on those three core issues. On the core issue of attaching conditions to land acquisition and maintenance, on the core issue of uh, grants to individuals and on the core issue of seeking to give priority to the most disadvantaged. So I just need to signal to the opposition that uh, are they of a mind, if they really do mean to put these amendments back before the Senate should they win government, then I, I, I believe the Democrats would have to vote against them at that stage as well. I think that uh, the Native Title Bill and the Land Fund Bill have had the benefit of focusing public attention on wider issues associated with uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs in this, in this country. And I think that's been important, canvassing views with respect to self-determination, with respect to the role of land, the spiritual attachment of Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander people have to land and sea, the place of customary law and cultural practice, particularly as we see now with uh, the Hindmarsh Bridge episode. Uh, we talk widely about what constitutes consultation, what constitutes dispossession. I think those have been important discussions to have had in this place. Equally, I think it's been in important to have Aboriginal people both here in this building and at various consultation points around the country and for us to have gone to them in various ways as well. But I agree with Senator Chris Evans. This is phase two, the land fund is phase two. There's been a great deal of consultation so far gone into what should be in the social justice package and uh, I think the issues that Senator Alston raises with respect to citizenship rights will be clearly addressed in the social justice package. And on that matter, I welcome the public comments we've seen so far from ATSIC and the Council of Reconciliation on what should be in the social justice package. 
And I think we will find that that phase three of uh, this particular government's response to Indigenous issues in this country, that phase three could well turn out to be, in practical terms, the most important element. In any case, I reiterate our, the Democrat support for this land, this land corporation and land fund bill and look forward to some constructive debate on the social justice package. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I might say that uh, during the extensive hearings conducted by the Select Committee inquiring into this bill, that uh, there was a body of evidence which uh, was of the view that should the Coalition and the Greens not be able to get their, uh, the amendments through, that in any event there be a land fund of some sort. And uh, uh, I refer to the evidence of Mr Griffiths, who gave evidence at Dubbo. Mr Griffiths uh, is the coordinator for the Red Chief Local Aboriginal Council in Gunnada, New South Wales. And he said, uh, he said uh, to be totally honest with you, I agree with the concept that Lois O'Donoghue has put, that we have to have something in place. I could not d disagree with that. But prior to that happening, I would hope that any House of Parliament would have a look at the wording between the lines. If someone is saying that there's been full consultation with Aboriginal people, then that is not right. It has not happened. And that really sums it up, because there were some 244 witnesses that appeared before that committee, and there was an overwhelming view that there was insufficient consultation. And for that, the government stands condemned. However, the coalition had a difficult decision to make because when it became apparent that uh, uh, the land fund bill might not, uh, uh, might not succeed if we stuck out with our amendments, uh, the question was, well, do you pass a bill which provides a land fund of some sort or do you oppose it and thereby uh, thwart the process completely? Well, of course, Mr Griffiths was saying, well, uh, I believe that there has to be something in place. My preference is for the, uh, he, the amendments as suggested by the, and he was in favour of the New South Wales Land Council amendments, which the coalition has adopted. But he was saying, look, rather than, uh, than lose out in the whole lot, I'd rather a, a land fund in any event, if it has to be that way. And so that was the decision the coalition had to come to. And I believe that, uh, uh, in the end, uh, it was uh, an unavoidable decision. Now, I noticed that the, uh, the government uh, had to make a decision itself as to what it did with the 67 amendments and the one request uh, which were made in this chamber. And I noticed that uh, uh, the, uh, the government decided to adopt 28 of those amendments. So it would seem that, after all, the process of debate and the process of inquiry by the committee concerned was of value. It was of value because the government accepted that there were amendments uh, which were worthwhile uh, taking on board. I myself uh, would caution uh, those who are uh, somewhat uh, over-optimistic about the, the working of this uh, land fund. Myself, I think that having heard the evidence, it would still have been desirable to have had those, uh, those amendments as proposed by the co coalition. There was a, a great body of uh, opinion in favour of having the land vested in individuals, Aboriginal trusts and the like. It was regarded as patronising that we said to the Aboriginal people, you can only have it in the form of a corporation because we don't trust what you might do with the land. And uh, as it was put to the committee that uh, in the wider community, individuals uh, were able to hold land, individuals were able to dispose of land, but in this case we have those ties imposed upon the recipients, um, the ties being that the Indigenous Land Corporation has some sort of control over the land. Uh, most importantly, I believe that the question of regional strategies versus national strategies will prove to be one of the most troublesome aspects of this bill. I believe that in a year's time we will be debating this bill again. I believe that we would have then seen 12 months of activity which will show 
that you cannot place more uh, emphasis on the national strategy than the regional strategy, and I fully agree with those witnesses, numerous as they were too, who, was, who said to our committee that you had to start from the grassroots and work, work your way up. So that I, uh, I say as some sort of prophecy that we will be looking at this aspect, and as a member of the, uh, uh, the Joint uh, Committee on the Native Title Act, I look forward to uh, monitoring the progress of this legislation to ensure that it does do what the government says it's going to do, and uh, to ensure that it does provide for the grassroots out there for whom this bill was intended, and also to make sure that vesting land in corporations only doesn't result in, uh, in groups of Aboriginal people missing out, and to ensure that the ILC remains accountable for its decisions and to ensure that it does make uh, the, the uh, appropriate or, or the uh, most appropriate decisions where there is a conflict of interest. For after all, there is a limited fund and you're going to have competing uh, interests. You're going to have uh, Aboriginal groups vying with each other for land grants, grants for land maintenance, and it's going to be interesting to see just how the Indigenous Land Corporation applies its decision-making process. So that uh, I just uh, make those comments for the record because I believe that this bill was uh, proceeded with without sufficient consultation and that uh, the select uh, committee which travelled around this country uh, demonstrated that quite vividly. And that I would say to the government that if you're going to tack tackle any further bill of this sort, if you're going to embark on any further social legislation, then you must consult and consult widely, because you didn't do it with this bill and you didn't do it with the Native Title Bill. The government seems, seems hell-bent on achieving a political agenda that is getting it through before the next election so it can go to the Australian people and say, say well, we did this and we did that and we did everything else for those in need and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But the real question is whether they did what they did effectively. Did they really provide a, uh, a, an instrument whereby those who are dispossessed will be adequately uh, uh, recompensed? And that is, has to be the question at the end of the day, and uh, not, not just a, a question of, well, did they consult with some major uh, entities in the, uh, or main role players in the Aboriginal industry and, uh, and then go away and come up with a political solution? That's not the question. The question is whether they really addressed the, uh, the needs of those who had been dispossessed uh, over the course of time. And I also say this, that uh, there has been some comment that this bill is uh, for those who uh, have lost their traditional ties with their land. And of course that is so because the Native Title Act provided in the preamble that there should be a provision for those who could not claim native title. But it would be totally unfair, and I say this to the government, totally unfair if there was a biased view that this land fund bill should only be used for the more remote areas of this country. What I am saying is this. This land fund is available for all Aboriginal people, and that includes Aboriginal people who happen to live in suburbs in densely populated cities. It is, not, uh, it is not just there for those who are living in the more remote areas. And it seems to me that there's some misconception about this, because during the course of our committee's travels, when we did go to built-up areas, there were Aboriginal people living in, uh, in those areas who had long since been dispossessed of any land, but who were just as entitled to be considered under this legislation as any other member uh, of their race. And so that uh, I say that to the government, it's an aspect I'll be monitoring very carefully to make sure that there is an even-handed approach, that those in the city are catered for, those in the country are catered for, and those in the remote areas are catered for. It's not just, uh, it's not just a, uh, an instrument to be used for favourites. I uh, uh, support the bill, and uh, I uh, say to the Senate, that uh, there is, however, one flaw with the bill, and it's something the government might take on board. 
When you look at the second reading speech by the, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, you note that uh, in uh, Annexure A, he states that uh, amendments 36 to 40, as proposed by the, uh, the Coalition and the Greens, would be adopted. Now, there seems to be some problem because when you turn to the bill, uh, and in particular I refer to uh, Amendment 39, uh, that relates to Section 192, Capital D, 3. And there it says, the Minister may grant the Indigenous Land Corporation chairperson leave of absence other than recreation leave on such terms and conditions as to remuneration or otherwise as the Minister determines in writing. Well, as I recall it, and I'm referring to the, the list of amendments as contained in the, uh, the Select Committee's report on this Land Fund Bill, um, Amendment 39 was in fact uh, uh, put forward by the Greens, and that was uh, to omit the word minister and substitute Indigenous Land Corporation, uh, sorry, Indigenous Land Corporation Board. Now, this bill was supposed to be an, a replica of the original bill, and it was supposed to have adopted word for word those amendments which had been set out in the Prime Minister's annexure uh, A to his second reading speech. What I'm saying to the Senate is there's a mistake, because when you look at that and uh, you look at the brief description of the amendment, it states there that the ILC board, rather than minister, to approve certain terms and conditions for ILC directors. Now, Quite clearly, the bill that I've been um, provided with, and uh, that's via the chamber, uh, certainly has that uh, flaw in section 192, capital D, 3. And so I would say to the government that uh, if you do intend to adopt that amendment, you're going to have to change the wording. And in fact, if you had intended this to act as a trigger for a double dissolution, you would have been in trouble, because quite frankly, this is not. Uh, not incorporating the amendment word for word that was put by this chamber. And uh, you could only have used this bill if the bill uh, was an accurate, uh, uh, an accurate replication of the original bill with those amendments that you chose to adopt. But what you've done here is you've chose to adopt a, uh, an amendment, but it hasn't been faithfully reproduced. It is not uh, the uh, amendment word for word so that uh, what we would have been considering is a different bill I would uh, submit with respect, so that you could not say that this could have provided you with a trigger, and so that if you thought you were being smart, you weren't. And In fact, uh, I would advise you strongly to have a look at that uh, amendment, because you've adopted all the other amendments which replace the word minister with the ILC board, and I see no reason why that shouldn't be followed through in this case. Um, but. Uh, that's uh, just another piece of advice for the government in my submission today. Um, finally, I would say to the Senate that this most important piece of legislation is part of a package, as indicated by the government, and that, uh, as Senator Kernow and Senator Evans have said, it's phase two of uh, a package of three. I would say to the government that uh, please try and handle the next phase a lot better than you handled the previous two. Uh, it would help if you consulted with the, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, uh, community at large. It doesn't take that much. Uh, the, the Select Committee did, I think, a, uh, a very good job over the two weeks that it consulted with the, uh, the community at large uh, and that it covered a good deal of ground. Uh, I think that the government, with all its resources, could uh, easily do the same job, if not a better one. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect that these words will go unheeded. Uh, I might say that uh, Senator Campbell, who was part of that committee, in fact he was the, the chairman of that committee, uh, regrets that he could not be here today to support this bill. I think uh, for, a reason, for, uh, for a very good reason. Uh, 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 he, what happened was that I think the Senate owes his wife a debt of gratitude because she had a child on the weekend. And that kept uh, Senator Campbell away from the chamber, which no doubt, as he said to me, would have shortened the proceedings today. And, uh, uh, but he regrets that he's unable to make a con contribution, and he worked or did a very good job as chairman of this committee and has taken a keen interest in this bill. But uh, 
uh, on the birth, the birth of his son Douglas Andrews kept him away and uh, no doubt he'll make a contribution at a later stage. But uh, I commend the bill to the Senate uh, and uh, I look forward to the next 12 months uh, scrutinising the progress of this bill and uh, looking for both the, uh, the positive aspects of the bill and those aspects of the bill which need improvement. I would suggest to the government that uh, don't be uh, biased in your, in your approach to this bill. If there are some aspects which don't work, then at least uh, address them. The Native Title Bill is a bill, as Native Title Act is an act which has demonstrated some, uh, a, a, well, more than some, a large degree of uh, lack of e efficacy. And uh, in fact, you have one view in the West that it is totally unworkable. Uh, my view is uh, attends to that uh, view. I believe that vast changes are needed to that act, and that uh, it would be irresponsible if the government did not uh, face up to that. Uh, the, uh, Mr Justice French uh, has indicated or has been reported in today's Australian uh, suggesting that sweeping changes are needed and even Aboriginal groups themselves have suggested that. So that what I'm saying is uh, let's not play politics and uh, uh, turn a blind eye to amendments when they're needed. Let's look at these uh, two pieces of legislation and in a rational manner address them and make them workable for all Australians. And uh, I hope that this bill does work, but if it needs amendment, then let's have the courage to face that. Senator Panizza. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I write briefly to speak on this new land fund bill also and support my colleague, uh, Senator Evans, and to try and answer some of the smirks of uh, Senator Chris Evans, uh, Senator Ellison, I should say, and answer a few of the points that Senator Chris Evans made on the other side a bit later on. This bill, as you know, is purpose is for uh, Indigenous people who have been dispossessed of land uh, some of the last 207 odd years since European settlement in Australia. And it is for them to purchase land or acquire <coughs> land or whatever you like to call it, uh, where uh, they cannot claim, the same people cannot claim under the, native, under the Mabo style legislation. And it is, uh, there's an amount of 45 million set aside to the Indigenous Land Corporation for this uh, sort of, for this, uh, these purchases uh, from a fund, that will, a perpetual fund that will be set up. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, that 45 million allocated is not a very big sum, but I suppose you could say it is rather symbolic, and uh, we'll be waiting, and I'll certainly be waiting to see what's going to be done with it. And uh, it's there to acquire, to acquire land, uh, to manage that land, to uh, provide economic, in, economic uh, benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits and cultural benefits. And the ILC, we were uh, we told in this case, Indigenous Land Corporation will be uh, told in this case here that they will be setting up natural uh, national strategy to carry out the task ahead. But if I can just go over each one as uh, what has been stated of those points I've made, uh, say there's 45 million, which is not a great amount. To acquire, acquiring land is quite easy if you've got the necessary finance and, of course, if the land is available. To manage, the second point is to manage. That gets a bit harder as one that's been on land, managing land, acquiring land not selling land very often though. In my time in business, I can tell you that when it comes time to manage it, it's slightly different to, to uh, acquiring it. That's if you've got the necessary funds, I said, and uh, Senator Chamarette nod, uh, nods assent. And uh, you manage it to provide economic benefit was the first point. Well, I think of the, some of those corporations might have a few surprises coming. I don't know what type of land that they've mostly got in mind, but I presume that it is mostly pastoral land. That's the sort of land that Aborigines prefer to wander over 
and uh, carry out their cultural activities and all that sort of thing. But if anyone has looked at the parcel industry of Australia today and the difficulties it's been having, then they might think twice whether it's such a good idea to buy these big pieces of land because, as I said, the station, especially pastoral stations, are quite cheap to buy and quite a few willing sellers these days. But when you do acquire it, then that's where the work starts. That's where the thinking starts. That's where the extra finance has got to start. It's all we to say, well, there's a, there's a pastoral station on the, on the market down the road in the Kimberleys or the Pilbara or eastern goldfields of Western Australia. Excuse me for using the Western Australian uh, sort of uh, regions, but they're the ones I know best. Well, then, uh, if you spend a million dollars buying a pastoral lease, that's, and that's uh, one forty-fifth, forty-fifth, I should say, uh, of the amount that is available now. Then you've got to start by on look at ongoing costs. You've got to look at uh, uh, providing the wage, paying the wages bill. And I presume that if Aborigines are going to run it themselves, and there's not too many pastoral uh, leases they have bought that they really run themselves, well, I suppose they've got to pay themselves. So you've still got a real wage bill. So, you know, having paid, say, that million odd dollars, if you can pick up a reasonable pastoral property with even a few head of cattle and a few head of sheep on it, that is only the beginning. There's a lot of very ongoing costs you've got, as well as uh, uh, buy uh, fodder. If you need fodder, you've got to buy fencing, you've got to do fencing, you've got to upkeep fencing, you've got to upkeep windmills. I mean, these things just don't happen. You've got to actually do it if you want a viable situation. And if you only want to live on the place, You've got to keep the windmills up anyhow. You've got to keep the power stations up. You've got to do all those things. So I can tell you, you know, there's a lot of them. Uh, I've got a lot to learn. And after a few years, I might have wished that uh, they might have stayed in the places where they were rather than uh, take this on. But you know, I wish them well in that in those sort of endeavours. So I don't believe that the economic uh, situation is not going to improve their lot very much because when you pay. I said that million dollars I said for a uh, for a uh, pastoral lease or, or a farm for that matter, but I presume it's more the pastoral areas because they're they're more suited that sort of thing. And then a million dollar station will only provide a uh, a good income for say two couples. And that's not the sort of uh, the envisage of uh, sort of population that I can see on a pastoral lease in this case here, but whether they are, Aborigines will be living and this to be supported by Social Security means I don't know. But I believe that this fund is to set up a situation of land where they, uh, they support themselves. So there's going to, as I said, there's already going to be a, a lot of surprises on the, in that case uh, when the time comes. There's my good friend Senator Brownhill, farmer from northern New South Wales would know the cost of running a farming or a pastoral operation these days. Uh, yes, of course, especially under the Labor Party oh, policy. Yeah. And uh, under the Labor Party policy, and no doubt, uh, these pastoral leases that will be run by Aboriginal uh, 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 Corporation will have to adhere to the policies and the small business uh, loadings that comes from the Labor Party onto them as well as it does onto everybody else. So that's the situation. Now if I can move off the economic one, but before I finish the economic one, I can, I'm telling you, you spend a million dollars, say you've got 45 million available each year, you buy 45 properties a million dollars each, I would say that you probably only make a, a viable sort of uh, income for, to, for a reasonable living standard for four times uh, 45 which is about 180 people, you know, and I want the government to, to, to listen to that one. It may be an economic lesson. It said that it will uh, provide environmental benefits. Well, let's look at that too. Now, a station, a pastoral lease or a farm or whatever, uh, has got a lot of environmental responsibilities. I mean, you can't overstock it. There's not much good really understocking it either because uh, wild weeds and uh, uh, that have come onto the places gallop away if you uh, don't stock it enough. And of course, uh, 
the worst thing after that is you've got to control it some other way by using chemicals on. And I'm sure Sh Senator Shamaret's he here will stand on end to even think of the idea. Uh, you think about that because uh, the environmental upkeep on the station is fairly high. You've got to fence places to keep stock out of certain places and keep them in other certain places. All those sort of things that go fine management. So uh, I'm afraid then you have flood damage when you have uh, big cyclones of which you've got to repair. So I think that won't be quite plain sailing also. Social benefits, I'm sure that there will be some social benefits by setting up uh, for those people to live in areas that their forefathers were so, uh, so quite used to and was their cultural situation, which is the next item I've got on my, on my list here. But uh, maybe as far as the social side, that might, mightn't be quite so, uh, quite so rosy as well because, as you know, the most Aboriginal people I would say live in urban areas these days and uh, there's plenty of ordinary Australians that wouldn't trade the, the easy life of the rural areas, uh, sorry, of the urban based areas, especially places like Canberra, Sydney, the south west of Western Australia and all that to return to the station and vast uh, outback life. I mean there's a few dedicated few that keep our pastoral industry going but I mean that's something that we'll see in due course. Cultural benefits, well, I think I've covered that. So, no doubt the ILC will develop strategies, and I certainly hope that they will be. Uh, they will. But what I want to see in time to come is a monitoring of this uh, land fund to see what does happen. Senator Chris Ellison didn't mention that on the way through because, okay, the, the, the Labor government has been telling us every day I've been in this place. They're the only ones that care for Aboriginals. They're the only ones that care uh, for ethnics and, uh, and other uh, smaller groups in Australia. But let's look at the Aborigines. They, in claiming that, there's been billions of dollars going in, but unfortunately we haven't seen too much benefit when you only look at health. I mean, we, this is not a health debate, but it's uh, a debate about uh, helping Aboriginal people. The health situation of the communities I visit on a regular basis around Western Australia hasn't improved very much. The housing has improved very much. The retention at school hasn't re improved very much. So one of these days there's got to be some performance indicators and that got to be taken note of to see where we are going with that sort of spending. And I said this is only $45 million uh, in, uh, per annum. And uh, in a federal budget, that is nothing. But it's still got to be accountable, whether it's one million or forty-five million or forty-five dollars, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if I can just move on to uh, uh, a few other things. Uh, as I said accountability will be. We will be, as far as I'm concerned, I will be keeping an eye on it. And uh, of course, you always get branded a redneck. Uh, if you uh, happen to question one of these social programs, but I intend to keep, uh, keep questioning it. Last week, Madam Acting Deputy President, while we're still on the same subject, it was a black day for Western Australia and made blacker by the way our own newspaper, the West, Australia, West Australian, treated the decision of the High Court. West Australia has got a unique situation, though no one in this place wants to believe it, because we've only got 7 per cent of Western Australia is a freehold, is held freehold. Okay. Senator Evans, that's Gareth Evans, said during the Mabo debate here in uh, December, November, December of 1993, he said it time and time again uh, that pastoral leases uh, wiped out native title. He said it. You just check hands out time and time. How come all of a sudden now, how come all of a sudden with uh, 70, 90, up to 93 per cent of WA under the hammer that they say, oh, where the pastoral lease extinguishes native title, it'll have to be decided by a court. 
Well, I certainly hope it's not the same court as last week, because we have a special sort of special sort of uh, case as we always have. Now, if someone can guarantee me, could guarantee me, that uh, pastoral leases did extinguish native title, as we were told in this chamber time and time again, then I wouldn't be so worried at the decision that came out last week. But I can tell you that it was a black day for Western Australia and you ain't seen the end of it yet. Now, the, the Australian now, if I can talk to you, of the last weekend, and this is what the president of the Native Title Tribunal had to say, the pre and I'll quote, the president of the, of the Native Tribunal, Justice French, is preparing for the court government to ask him to make thousands of Mabo-style rulings in what may be an attempt to sabotage the system. Justice French told the Australian yesterday that although he wanted state government cooperation in the wake of Western Australia's defeat in the High Court, it was possible for claims to be made successfully negotiated without its involvement. Okay, we'll just leave it at there. Successful without involvement. That's if you put a, uh, apply for a title under mining which only takes two months to go through the mines office in Western Australia. That's if you run then the gauntlet of mediation, because you have no, a native title tribunal, then you have mediation and then goes on to a federal court if you can't decide. If it's all fixed up in that mediation, but how many of those have been fixed up in mediation in Western Australia in the last, uh, since native title? There's been two. Does anyone in this place know how many mining titles alone are issued in Western Australia in a year? Does anyone know that? Because a mining title does not last forever. A mining company might hold it for three months and release it. Might hold it six months and release it. Might hold it forever. There's about 10,000 processed by the Mines Department of Western Australia and its tribunals per year. Per year. Then Justice French, or the Australian, went on to say the two major Aboriginal legal bodies indicated yesterday that they would immediately challenge some of the 10,000 mining, uh, mining applications in Western Australia. So what do you want? Our, our legislation in Western Australia don't stand up. We've got 10,000 a year. When you put it onto the federal tribunal, we're told we're trying to plug the, the system up. So you tell me where else? I don't know how many title claims, how many uh, titles for mining is issued in Victoria or New South Wales or anywhere. But mind you, most of those is on private land. Uh, it's already native title distinguishing. You tell me where Western Australia can send those 10,000 applications every year. You tell me where there's a tribunal, the Austra federal tribunal. How many is it dealt with? You can count them on your hand. In two years, almost, it's dealt with. What are you going to do with the 10,000 that comes through in Western Australia every year? And what I want to ask, with all of that sort of situation, those 10,000 that are held up every year, who's going to recompense the investors in mining, the people that are employed in mining, the four times the people that are employed in mining that uh, in the manufacturing sector that supplies those mining, the surveyors, the transport people that rely for their income. Now, since Richard Court got into power in Western Australia, unemployment went, uh, in Western Australia dropped from 11.6 per cent to 7.5 per cent. He has created employment. He was elected m more jobs, better government. Now, what's going to happen to this? Increase in uh, the economy if those 10,000 titles take as long as what this federal tribunal has been taken. What's going to happen to those? I mean, you know, there's no reaction coming from the other side. Someone's got to give us answers before long. The government had better get uh, some pretty big advice, pretty good advice before long. And I think the best advice they can take 
is take on just as French as other suggestions, except this other one that he thinks that Western Australia is going to try and clog the system up, trying to wreck the system. He better, they better take up some ideas of speeding up, of speeding up if, uh, uh, the situation so those 10,000 titles will be dealt with. Because it's not only Western Australian matter and de uh, in Deputy President that's going to suffer in the economy, and uh, you can be bored as much as you like on it, it will be all of Australia that will suffer. As Senator Ellison said and Senator Austin said, we are supporting this bill. We are supporting this bill. But I do believe that, as Senator Ellison said, that it won't be very long before we're back in this chamber again looking at further amendments, like there will be to the Native Title Bill uh, in time also, because things are not going to work. I'm talking about Native Title Bill. Well, this one here, I certainly hope it does work, and, I, and my experience on land and land management, I'll be looking at it very carefully. It has our blessing and certainly has our hopes that it's going to work. Senator Chamaret. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I think a, a lot of words have been said and probably mine are going just on the public record to indicate uh, the Greens' view of uh, this new presentation of the Land Fund and Indigenous Land Corporation. And, uh, I acknowledge that it is part of the government's uh, three-stage package, the first of which was in response to the High Court decision on native title, um, the first stage of that being the native title um, bill and uh, one in which the, the statement was made that approximately 5 per cent of Aboriginal people may stand to gain from that native title legislation. And uh, I think people are aware that, of course, we haven't had any Aboriginal people gain at this point, 12 months or more down the track, uh, and so it may well be much smaller than 5 per cent of Aboriginal people who actually do gain by that provision. The second uh, part or stage of that three-stage packet has been, uh, of course, called the Land Fund and uh, the bill that we're looking at at the moment. And the government said on this one that it would deal with the land needs of the remaining 95 per cent of Aboriginal people who don't stand to gain from the native title legislation. And uh, of course, we are yet to see in full um, operation a response to the social justice package that has been proposed in recent days by the Reconciliation Council to the Prime Minister. But just to go back to this second stage that we're currently in, um, the Greens have expressed repeatedly our disappointment with it and uh, its total failure to meet the aims that the government uh, put in place for it, and that is to address the dispossession of 95 per cent of Aboriginal people over the last 200 years. Um, the question is, of course, that uh, the land fund is so small and its operation uh, so constricted that only a small number of people will benefit from this fund. I'm very delighted to see that in the uh, presentation of this document and the second reading speech, the language was far more restrained than in earlier times. We didn't have the obnoxious reference to the $1.4 billion land fund, and I wish that the media could learn the same inaccuracy and uh, restrict their language about it too, because the reality of this land fund is that at the very most uh, it will provide $240 million uh, in the next 10 years and uh, extra on what's already available. There will be a drawdown of $45 million a year uh, indefinitely as a result of the uh, amount put aside in the consolidated revenue. Uh, but that will be largely eaten up, as the debate earlier has said, in uh, not only management costs uh, but also with the administration of the fund itself. And so we see a very small amount uh, developing. And what we see really is a strategy developed by the government that uh, really has been looking at uh, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as three groups. One is uh, those 
who have been uh, least damaged by the impact of colonisation and seizure of lands and extinguishment of native title, and that is the, the group that is fortunate enough to still be on their land and be able to uh, as, uh, disprove any claims by governments that their native title has been extinguished um, over the last 200 years. The second group is those uh, who may be able to gain assistance from this land fund and gain uh, access to this fund to buy back some country. And presumably, uh, pastoral leases will be the main target of these, as we can see from the comments of Senator Panissa. Uh, a pastoral lease could be expected to be gained for um, $1 million, maybe, but we know that uh, land in the city and in places where uh, urban Aboriginal people are would uh, scarcely be available. Um, and uh, it, it means, therefore, that the amount that's available will primarily be used in the country. And I'm indebted to Senator Panitza from his uh, far greater experience of these matters than mine for pointing out the total inadequacy of the amount and the way in which it will be eaten into by uh, management requirements and also the way in which um, the environmental concerns and the capacity to support uh, numbers of Aboriginal people will be severely impeded by the lack of funds. And the third group, those who have been totally removed from their country, not even able to sometimes acknowledge uh, from what part of the country they were taken, because a lot of them were taken in childhood over the last 200 years, those that have been most damaged by colonisation will be last in the queue for this land fund, and it's highly unlikely that uh, they will ever gain anything from it. Um, so what we have basically is uh, a land fund that will meet the needs of a very small number of people. And uh, obviously there have been different views across Australia uh, amongst Aboriginal people. Uh, and it revolves around the same dilemma that the Greens uh, ourselves have expressed. Do we put in place legislation this satisfies a small number, maybe a key number but small, of people who stand to gain and leaves a large percentage of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders dispossessed and with their dispossession unaddressed. Um, and I think that accepting the land fund uh, means accepting a large degree of failure to address uh, those Aboriginal people who will stand to gain nothing from this land fund. In fact, the existence of the land fund penalises them because it allows the government to pretend that it has redressed the injustice of that dispossession. And uh, just in passing, uh, Senator Evans referred to this bill as the bill which establishes a very substantial perpetual fund and an Indigenous land corporation to use and administer that fund. And I think the key test of the amount of that fund is really how much impact it has on the budget deficit this year. Because if it's a $1.4 billion fund, which fortunately most people realise it isn't, um, it would presumably have a uh, $1.4 billion uh, impact on the deficit, or if it's a tenth of that amount, of course, a, uh, a similar amount. But the reality is that the budget will be um, increased by $24 million this year and, uh, and uh, in each year, and the budget deficit will be diminished by $24 million uh, for the next X number of years, beyond the 10 years. Um, and that is the uh, token, the symbol, of what this government is prepared to do to redress uh, the dispossession of Aboriginal people. And that's why I feel great disappointment um, with uh, the opposition for their unwillingness to hold out a bit longer on this government and to support the amendments that were uh, raised and supported right around the country during the process of the Senate Select Committee. Um, I think that uh, it is a disappointment, and I can only assume that they believe that uh, something is better than uh, tying Aboriginal people down to a pittance uh, 
is better than nothing. And uh, I, I will quote from the Yaru, Yandu Yaru Women's Group uh, statement at this point because I believe it sums it up very accurately. With this piece of legislation, Aboriginal people find themselves caught between a rock and a hard place. It's tempting to grab whatever it is that is offered, especially when nothing was being offered to begin with. Country must be protected now, and land acquisition may be the best way to do this. Culture and tradition associated with that land must be protected and maintained now. Um, the the uh, women in that delegation went on to make some very cogent points. Um, they also stated, while supporting the intent of the amended bill, several of the amendments need to be reviewed. The point must be made that organisations such as ATSIC have the most to gain from both the original and amended bill and have the resources to lobby Aboriginal people in this matter. What other alternatives to the Indigenous Land Corporation have been put to Aboriginal people that reflects less centralised and more regional control and that are true to principles of Aboriginal self-determination. Um, I think that's a very valid point and I think that uh, this bill is, is and will be a great disappointment in its passage to all those people who were uh, appearing before the committee and who urged us to uh, assert the inadequacy of the amount. In fact, that was unanimous. I don't think there was anyone who didn't uh, refer to the inadequacy of the amount in the land fund and want more. And in fact, uh, there were several uh, submissions, and I can't actually uh, count them, but one uh, which urged us, that I would quote now, that the bill uh, as proposed should be rejected. And uh, the statement was made, and this was at the uh, Dubbo hearing of the Senate Select Committee. While the Senate amendments improve what would otherwise be very paternalistic and regressive legislation, the funding is far too inadequate for the bill to be treated seriously. The original bill undermines all the struggles of Aboriginal peoples in the last 40 years to end government paternalism and to demonstrate that they are capable of making their own decisions and that they should be allowed to do so. The, far, the, the funding currently proposed for the fund is completely inadequate. It represents an increase of only $24 million per year on what is already provided. The inadequacy of funding is likely to create conflict between Aboriginal communities and may see a disproportionate amount of the funding spent on management rather than on acquisition. This will disadvantage people who have no land. So we do see that uh, the amount of the fund by the agreement of the opposition with the government uh, will not be addressed. Um, and nevertheless, uh, while Senator Evans has expressed the view he'd like this bill to pass unanimously in the chamber, uh, the Greens cannot allow it to go by uh, in that way. And we will be flagging amendments that relate to the size of the land fund, the uh, the, its restrictiveness to only uh, being held by corporations, uh, the disposal of surplus land, uh, the fact that there's no statement that this isn't to be regarded as compensation for dispossession and revival of native title. And uh, a final one, which was also raised by the Yandu Waru Women's Group, uh, which is the gender balance on the ILC board, and I'll just discuss that now because it hasn't been raised before. Um, while they were making their statement to the Senate Select Committee, the Yandu Yuaru Women's Group presented something that hadn't actually been uh, presented before. Certainly a question had been asked about gender representation, but uh, basically the recommendation of that group was uh, that there should be three Aboriginal women selected amongst the Aboriginal members of the board uh, in order to ensure that uh, those who stand to gain from this land fund aren't uh, uh, unable to reflect women's concerns and women's contact and connection with the land. So that will be a further 
um, amendment that will be being introduced into this bill for the first time for the very good reason that Aboriginal women took the trouble to uh, come. There were two uh, delegations of, of women at the committee process. Uh, one was in uh, Darwin and the other one was in Broome. And I believe that it does them justice to at least flag that. Uh, whether or not it gains uh, support, of course, is a, a moot point. And again, I repeat the fact that uh, largely the amendments that the Greens will be putting will be to place on the public record our disappointment with this bill and with the land fund and the government's response to the land needs of Aboriginal people. And in the light of the fact that in, uh, in Senator Evans' speech he he says that the original bill, with all the Senate's amendments, has been laid aside in the House of Representatives and will expire when that House is prorogued for an election. So the decks have finally been cleared for the Parliament to approve this great measure of social justice. And um, that's why I'm afraid that uh, the Greens will be presenting just a small number of the amendments that we presented earlier. They weren't the ones. Uh, in the main that had support, uh, some are, but it is because there will be no other record of the concerns about that bill um, in, in the future, and we would like it on the record for this particular um, bill. And uh, as, as I've indicated before, uh, the Greens are disappointed, but we feel that uh, the uh, opposition's bipartisan support with the government does two beneficial things. It reassures at least some Aboriginal people that a token attempt has been made to look at their uh, land needs and uh, that this may well uh, augur well for bipartisan approaches that shouldn't be used as political footballs in election processes. And, uh, and secondly, what it does is that it prevents the government from uh, taking uh, quite unjustifiably a high moral stand on this particular land fund. They can't complain that uh, they are the only ones that want to see the land needs of Aboriginal people addressed. Uh, unfortunately for the Greens, the opposition is willing to tolerate the low level of funding uh, available for the Aboriginal people through this land fund, but at least it means that it is bipartisan and won't be used as a political football. And I do put on record that I heard the Leader of the Opposition make his first election promise which was that should they be elected, they will support the amendments as passed in the Senate. And, uh, and so, and so I, uh, I believe that it is uh, a worthwhile time, but I'm extremely disappointed on behalf of all the Aboriginal people who hadn't been adequately consulted before the design of this fund and who would have liked to have seen something far better uh, produced if it was really to achieve the high words that the Prime Minister spoke when he announced it uh, during the debate on the Native Title Bill. Senator T. Mr Acting Deputy President, the coalition, as, it is known, as, as is known in the chamber, will not be opposing the passage of this bill. But I should lay it on the record that National Party senators have reservations about the format of the government's legislation. And we stand side by side with our Liberal Party colleagues in believing that exemplary work was done when this bill was first, the, the predecessor of this bill was first presented, and, and in the work that was done by uh, Senator Ian Campbell and uh, by Senator Chris Ellison. I think their work has been first class in terms of seeking to achieve a better result in the uh, legislation, and it is to the government's shame that they ignored the recommendations of the Senate, the Senate's amendments, it is to the government's eternal shame that they saw base political advantage as being more important and therefore sought to bring in this other bill. Now, I should make it very clear that as far as the National Party is concerned, there are manifest defects in legislation which says that Aboriginal people are not to be trusted with freehold title to land. Now, earlier on in the second reading debate, uh, Senator Chris Evans from the other side of the chamber said that this legislation was important. He said, because it was the first time 
there was a recognition that Aboriginal people had rights. Now, leaving aside the mammoth political hyperbole in that, Mr Acting Deputy President, I doubt the extent of the right that you give to somebody if you do not trust them to exercise judgment in relation to their rights. And my friend on the other side of the chamber, Senator Cooney, may wish to think about how valuable is a right if it is a right which is curtailed. And I think Senator Cooney and I could get into a, an interesting philosophical discussion here because, because a right which is limited in a fashion such that it is less than a right that somebody else may have in similar si situations is not much of a right at all. And that's my concern. And this government legislation says that Aboriginal people are not to be given freehold title to the land in question, which is purchased. It's to be put in, the power, in a corporation, and they are to be precluded from enjoying the benefits of a freeholder. Now, here there is a problem in the government's arguments, Mr Acting Deputy President, because the only defence for that is to say, well, look, we don't trust Aboriginal people not to sell the land. And if one argues that you don't trust Aboriginal people not to sell the land, then it becomes very difficult to continue sustaining the argument that there is a particular special significance. Surely if there is a special significance for Aborigines in holding land, then it's appropriate that we trust them to preserve that special significance. And yet the government wishes to have its cake and, and eat it on this issue because it wishes to say, look, there is a special significance to Aboriginal people in the land, but having said that, we're not going to trust them that they won't sell it. And there you see is the conundrum. And ultimately, the government is, is condemned forever and a day into a paternalistic attitude that says, we don't believe Aboriginal people are capable of exercising proper judgment in relation to these issues. And there is a yawning gulf between the Labor Party, the government on that side, and the coalition, the opposition on this side, because we do believe it is time that we ended the era of paternalism. What this legislation seeks to do is, of course, to perpetuate paternalism for political motives. For political motives. Because if one was to say we should search for a form of land holding which is in as close a possible sense consistent with the land uh, tenure that Aborigine, Aboriginal groups had prior to white settlement, if one accepts that argument, then the way to do it is not to put the land in a corporation but is to entrust the land upon trust to elders, because surely that is more consistent with traditional Aboriginal concepts of the holding of land. And yet we have this argument that now we have to have a corporate structure. And of course a corporate structure is entirely alien to traditional Aboriginal concepts of holding land. But a corporate structure is very useful for the government because it lets them utilise those corporations for political advantage and make no bones about it. That is exactly what will happen. And while we wish to be as bipartisan as we can on these issues, we have an, a, an obligation, a moral obligation, to the people of Australia to point out where the government is going to use this legislation for its political benefit and not for the benefit of Aboriginal people generally. And that is undoubtedly the case. And by denying Aborigines freehold title to land, what this government does is it denies individuals an opportunity to better their lot. It denies individuals the opportunity to have control of their own destiny. But you see, that is what the government will do in the passage of this legislation. 
So what I am saying on behalf of the National Party is that we have grave reservations about many of the provisions of this legislation. And our point of view is that there should be no special laws for the people on the basis of the colour of their skin. Now, the government cannot say, cannot say that this is a special law for, for people on the, on the basis of the colour of their skin because, after all, the government has said that this is to rectify, to rectify wrongs which occurred in the past. Thanks. So there is no argument, no moral argument, no political argument, no argument based even on utility which can justify the government then saying, well, look, we're going to make things special. Special laws really advantage the people at whom they are aimed. Special laws, and this is an experience around the world, special laws marginalise. Special laws condemn groups of people to the periphery of mainstream society. And I believe very firmly that we have an obligation to ensure that this community, Not only, buddy. this Australian community, is as integrated and as equal as is possible. And I think it should go on the record that government senators who support these provisions, who support the denial of freehold title, are in their own way perpetuating the inequality of which the government complains. It is as simple as that. Mr Acting Deputy President, there are other issues about which we have reservations. Those issues will be dealt with after the next election when a coalition government has an opportunity to right the wrongs which will be created by this legislation, wrongs to Aboriginal people. I do not wish to delay the further passage of this matter through the Senate, but I put the government, the Labor Party, on notice that after the next election things will change and the Aboriginal people of Australia will soon realise that the government has sold them a pup, that in many ways it has not taken a real and genuine interest in their needs. This legislation is proof of that and we will rectify that situation. Senator Kearney. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I think this is a uh, very happy day for Australia. Uh, as Senator Rochi has just indicated, uh, this bill has been supported by uh, both sides of the chamber. And of course, there's um, the uh, shouting and the tumult that goes on uh, as it must in Parliament. But the bottom line in this debate is that everybody other than the Greens supports the uh, legislation. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, as you know, there is a uh, free vote available to uh, everybody on the opposition side. Uh, there, of course, I don't think for one minute that they are concerned about a double dissolution. I think that they are people of principle. And uh, it is uh, very exciting to see that uh, all of them uh, will be voting for this bill. Uh, with, uh, with enthusiasm. Uh, the words you've heard here today are debating points, and uh, I think that uh, everybody is to be congratulated for arriving at this uh, position. Senator Shamaret has said that she's going to move 21 uh, amendments, which, as she said, she expects to be defeated. But uh, even she uh, was. Uh, at one point in her uh, debate, uh, at one point in her speech, anyhow, congratulating the rest of the parties in this uh, chamber for coming to agreements about this bill. <coughs> There's some. Um, she says, of course, uh, the, the main thrust of her her uh, objections seem to be that not enough money is being given. Of course, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, there is never enough money for the various things that government must do. Uh, there's more schools to be built, there's more 
health to be provided, and we could go on and on and on. Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, the fact of the matter is that the amount that is and has been agreed upon will be endorsed by uh, a near unanimous vote of this chamber. Senator Chamaret uh, says that uh, the Aboriginal people of Australia have been uh, sorely abused over the years, and that's absolutely so. But uh, even taking her position, I think her position is that uh, the community ought to give up 1 per cent of government receipts to Aboriginal people. That, of course, would not be sufficient to make up for, um, for what has happened. Uh, the, there, what we've got to do is to take a situation as it exists and to see what can be made of it. Senator Shamarek, for example, uh, if you took her position to the logical conclusion that it leads to, would say we should uh, give the land back to the Aboriginals. And that is somewhat consistent, inconsistent with her proposition that at the same time we should bring in more migrants. Uh, that we should help uh, those that come in from overseas as boat people, a, um, thing, a, a, a proposition that might be logical, but <coughs> not logical when taken together with the proposition that the uh, Aboriginals are entitled uh, to what they have lost in the past. But in any event, <coughs> Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't want to persist for too long in this uh, speech. I do want to say, however, that the position we've got to, where we have agreement across the chamber, except for the, for the Greens, where all parties have embraced this legislation, and uh, where, according to the Today's Australian, where uh, even the CRA, the new uh, CRA chief, hails the uh, Mabo, Mabo law as an opportunity for partnership. Uh, that's the headlines to the article in the Australian, and perhaps I ought to read the first paragraph, it's on page one. The new chief executive of Australia's biggest mining company, CRA Limited, yesterday applauded the federal government's Native Title Act uh, for providing opportunities for more exploration and partnership with Aborigines. And uh, the bill before us is going to take the position of Aborigines further. And, uh, the, uh, and of course, I should say this, that this is by no means the end of the, the matter. Aboriginals, no doubt, will be pressing for more and more uh, from the community, will be doing more and more for themselves as the years go by. And I uh, venture this opinion that uh, there are many, many uh, people of Aboriginal descent who are uh, much better off now uh, than they would have been had not the money that some people have complained about uh, uh, as having been uh, spent upon them had not been spent upon them. And 20 years from now, the position will be even better again. Now, it's in that situation, Mr Acting Deputy President, that I say this is a happy day. But this uh, position, where we've got near unanimity in the chamber on this legislation, uh, this position was not reached easily, and there has been uh, people who have laboured long and hard to get the legislation to the point where it is now. And I don't uh, simply mean uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Prime Minister and uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate here, Senator Evans and uh, Mr Tickner, who are the, as were the, the, the ministers who have uh, headed up the people that have legislated, who have prepared the legislation in this matter. I, of course, acknowledge them, but I include the people who have um, worked hard in the background, and some of them in, are in the chamber here today. I think we sometimes uh, forget the amount of work that is done on our behalf uh, by uh, those in the public service. They are oftentimes the but for jokes, uh, buts for criticism, and unlike us, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, are not able to uh, answer the charges which are usually most unjust. 
So I would like to mention the uh, team that has prepared this legislation uh, that has been so uh, well received today and, uh, as I say, will be voted on soon and uh, which will be passed by the uh, overwhelming majority of this uh, chamber. And uh, can I mention them? Uh, no doubt to their embarrassment. I see here uh, Sandra Ellams, uh, John Vernon Burden, uh, Caroline Edwards, Michelle Canane and Dorothy Ledee. I think they're there and uh, I think it's proper that uh, we acknowledge them. And I'm sure the ministers, the ones that I've named, Prime Minister Gareth Evans and Robert Tickner, Mr. Uh, Senator Gareth Evans and uh, Mr. Robert Tickner, would uh, endorse with great enthusiasm my acknowledgement of that team. So, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, can I resume my seat by again <coughs> paying tribute to those people for bringing us the legislation that is in before us today? Minister. Well, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, it is gratifying to the government that the coalition has finally seen sense of the situation and agreed to pass the Land Fund Bill in a form which will be efficient in practice and defensible in principle. It's a matter of regret uh, that the same still can't be said of the Greens. One would have wished that the opposition's motives in this matter had been a bit more exalted than simply the fear of fighting a double dissolution election in a policy area in which they continue to feel profoundly embarrassed, or if they don't, they should. It would have been uh, much preferable if the opposition had approached this issue with a real sense of understanding of the significance of the issues involved and a sense of grace about the great changes that are involved, both with the enactment of the native title legislation itself and this companion piece of legislation, the second stage of the government's response to the historic Mabo decision, the legislation here establishing the land fund and recognising and making provision for recompense for the dispossession which has been suffered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It would have been nice in particular if the opposition had shown the same sort of grace and acknowledgement of the issues of principle involved as was shown in the speech uh, yesterday by the new uh, chief executive of CRA, Leon Davis, who did say in what was clearly a, a path-breaking change of position for his organisation and one which I hope will signal a similar change of direction for the whole mining industry that he was satisfied with the central tenet of the Act. He said further that it laid, and he's referring here of course to the Native Title Act, he said further that it laid the basis, and I'm quoting him, laid the basis for better exploration access and thus increased the probability that the next decade will see a series of CRA operations developed in active partnership with the Aboriginal people. I think that particular statement, which has been referred to by a couple of other speakers today, uh, was appropriately responded to by Noel Pearson, the director of the Cape York Land Council, when he described those uh, comments by the CRA chief as an absolute milestone in the relationship between Aborigines and the mining industry in Australia. He said further that uh, the statement showed a culture change more tolerant of Aborigines was about to sweep across the mining sector, a change that would have been inconceivable just two years ago. I think it's worth recording for posterity the cartoonist Nicholson's uh, response to all of this in The Australian today when uh, under the heading The Sensitive New Age Miner we have a depiction of a miner standing on a rock with his arm around an Aboriginal Australian with the Aboriginal saying to himself, well bugger me, next it'll be John Howard. Well one hopes it would be John Howard next. So far, unhappily, there's been no sign of that in terms of the basic response of this opposition to the Native Title Act, which they're still talking about fundamentally amending um, when they get the chance. There's been no fundamental change of heart, it seems, in what they're saying about this Land Fund Act, because they're talking about uh, making further amendments to that if and when they get a chance. 
There hasn't been a change of heart in the attitude to Aboriginal cultural sensitivities, as is revealed by the extraordinary saga over the Hindmarsh documents affair in the last week, where Mr Howard continues to stand behind uh, his former front bench spokesman, Mr McLaughlin, after Mr McLaughlin engaged in what must be the most tawdry and unpalatable little exercise in recent Australian uh, politics in distributing, photocopying sensitive documents uh, as he did for crude political advantage in circumstances of the utmost sensitivity for the Aboriginal people involved. So I say all that because although we are obviously pleased uh, that there has been a sufficient change of heart on the part of the opposition to enable us to get this uh, land fund legislation through. It unhappily does not seem to presage the kind of change of heart, change of mind, change of attitude that really would mean something for the Aboriginal people in this country. And one can only hope that that will eventually occur. We are pleased that the Coalition hasn't insisted on those of its amendments which would have made the ILC a statutory body excessively bound by legislative prescription. And we simply hope, I say again, that the Coalition's threats to amend the bill when and if they ever attain government will fade away once the ILC is given the opportunity to prove itself under the flexible and autonomous approach that the bill provides for. In the end, a good piece of legislation does seem to have triumphed and the ILC will be able to get on with the job of acquiring and managing land on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We will be moving quickly to ensure that the ILC is set up by the end of the financial year. I'm confident uh, that if there are any continuing differences in opinion uh, on behalf of uh, various Aboriginal organisations or particular members of the affected community, uh, then those will be easily capable of being resolved once the ILC is up and running. I uh, want to place on record the government's appreciation of the very helpful and constructive role which Indigenous organisations have played uh, throughout the long and difficult course of framing this legislation. And I'm not excluding those organisations which disagreed with some aspects of the bill. Differences of opinion are to be expected in relation to any piece of legislation, particularly a complex piece of legislation, and they're hardly surprising in this situation here, given the diversity of circumstances of Australia's Indigenous peoples. I do think the approach taken by the government on this bill has the broad support of the majority of Indigenous organisations. I don't think there's any question of gilding the lily in that respect. That is simply the case. And, of course, ATSIC has been a very strong and effective supporter of this legislation from the outset. And as the only organisation capable of representing Indigenous opinion nationally and the government's advisor on Indigenous matters, of course we gave very significant weight to ATSIC's views. But we also took into account and adopted, wherever it was possible to do so, the views of other Indigenous organisations. Might I uh, close by uh, repeating uh, Senator Cooney's very gracious tribute to the public servants who have been involved in this very difficult uh, exercise, Sandra Ellams and uh, the rest of the team uh, over there. It has been um, an outstanding effort, as I can well testify, having uh, been the beneficiary of their very detailed advice on practical and technical questions as they have arisen. I take it I'll be a further beneficiary of their advice in the committee stage um, now about to dawn upon us. I certainly hope so, because I could be floundering without it when I look at some of these amendments, God help me, that have been moved once again uh, by the Greens. So uh, might I wish the bill uh, a speedy passage, thank those senators who have contributed uh, to the debate and uh, hope that we really are putting now today in place a piece of legislation which will live up to the expectations that we all have of it as a very serious attempt to address one aspect of the fundamental injustice done to Aboriginal people in this country by enabling people who have been dispossessed of land, who don't have the opportunity to recapture possession of traditional land, to at least have access to land that will be meaningful to them through the process of acquisition and disposition that's provided for in this bill. I commend it to the Senate.
Well, the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Act 1989 and certain other acts so as to establish a land fund and an Indigenous land corporation to help redress the dispossession of Aboriginal persons in Torres Strait Islanders and for related purposes. Does the wish to committee the bill be taken as a whole? No objection is so ordered. The question is this bill stand as printed. Senator Chamaret. Um, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I uh, have a series of amendments that have been circulated in the chamber and uh, as Senator Evans said he would need help. It, it is possible that uh, I may uh, also get a little adrift in this because I haven't actually seen the drafting of them until this moment, but I know the uh, principles underlying them. And uh, my understanding is that amendments one to four relate to the size of the land fund. Um, five to about 14 uh, refers to the corporation aspect of it, and then it goes on as following. So I just, if, if I may, I want to move my amendments uh, one to four and then give the uh, minister an opportunity to respond or anyone else uh, who wishes to come in at that stage. Is that all right? Is, is Luke granted? No objection. Luke is granted. Senator Chamaret. Thank you very much. Um, as, as I said, the first amendments relate to the size of the land fund. And just very briefly, I'll go through for the public record the reasons for that. Under the legislation, the government will contribute around $1.28 billion into a trust account in the Commonwealth Public Account called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land Fund over the next 10 years. The Greens uh, WA are concerned that the fund will not be sufficient to meet the land ownership needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that the fund will not be self-sustaining. The Greens also believe that the fund is unlikely to provide any degree of historical justice for the 95 per cent of Aboriginal people who will not gain anything from the recognition of native title. So our amendment proposes that the House of Representatives amend the bill so that 1 per cent of total Commonwealth Government revenues be placed in the land fund per annum for 10 years. This would see the government contribution exceed $11 billion at the end of 10 years. Uh, why have we uh, stipulated the 1 per uh, cent? There's two reasons that I'm going to briefly put here. First, because it is a substantial sum. It really is the kind of substantial perpetual fund that uh, Senator Evans referred to in his speech, however not substantiated by the amount in the uh, bill we're considering. Uh, so therefore the one billion a year uh, is a substantial sum which would more, more satisfactorily address the land needs of Australia's Indigenous people. One per cent of total revenue would see a government contribute about $1.12 billion per annum, a genuine billion-dollar fund. The second reason for the one per cent is a historical one. In, in 1890, uh, when the British handed self-government to Western Australia, there was a clause placed in the Constitution to ensure that the new government of Western Australia fulfilled their obligations to protect Aboriginal people. Under the clause, 1 per cent of total government revenue had to be spent on Western Australian Indigenous people. The clause disappeared in 1904, and early this year a group of Aboriginal people began a challenge on this issue in the High Court. It seems to us that if we're addressing historic injustice, we ought to look at the historical uh, attempts to redress that injustice that unfortunately have not operated in any way, shape or form within this country. And uh, so we felt that 1 per cent of uh, total government revenue was a really good amount to be put in a land fund when we consider that that government revenue is derived from Australia and from the land of its original indigenous owners. Um, that's all I wish to say about the size of the fund. The amendments come in the form of a request and, and amendments, and I just uh, leave it on the minister to comment or to uh, for anyone else. 
Senator Evans, if it be your wish. Sorry, it was just number one, wasn't it? One to four, Senator Evans. One to four. Um, well, needless to say, where the hell is that? Um, well, needless to say, the government um, rejects these particular amendments as we did last time round in their companion volumes. The um, government will be allocating a very sizable sum of $1.463 billion to the land fund over a 10 year period. $200 million has been allocated this year to give the fund a significant base. The annual drawdowns from the fund from 95 96 will be $45 million. Per annum, this is more than double the $21 million spent by ATSEC on land acquisition and management annually. The ILC will also have the capacity to borrow from commercial sources or to facilitate landholders borrowing from commercial sources, and that will allow significant capital injections into Indigenous land-based enterprises over and above existing sources of capital. We really do believe that these amounts represent a significant uh, commitment of um, Commonwealth monies consistent with responsible economic management. Um, the Greens proposal, which is aimed at um, providing a fund of around $15 billion after 10 years, is completely unrealistic and fiscally irresponsible. The Land uh, Corporation would be simply unable to handle the sum of about $450 million a year it would have available to spend on land acquisition and management. The availability of such an amount would artificially drive up land prices to the detriment of Indigenous interests. The Commonwealth currently provides around $1.5 billion annually to ATSIC and other agencies to address the needs of Indigenous people. If the Commonwealth was to place 1% um, of Commonwealth revenues in the land fund, this would amount to around another $1.5 billion annually. While we can't be certain the Commonwealth revenue is collected far into the future, if the land fund were outside the public account, this amendment would contribute about $1.5 billion annually uh, to the deficit, and that would represent an addition of over 10 per cent to the budget uh, deficit this year, rising to more than half the projected deficit in 1997-98. If the land fund was to remain in the public account, this amendment would add up to $270 million annually to the deficit. So I think the orders of magnitude that we're talking about there, whichever way you approach this, simply put it beyond the pale in terms of our reasonable economic management strategies at the moment. The government has agreed to a Democrats amendment, it will be recalled, which will guarantee a 4 per cent return after inflation on investments over 10 years. That guarantee of that return is in addition to what's already a pretty sizable allocation by the government. We are committed to the reconciliation process. Mabo itself, the decision, the native title legislation and this fund have all advanced that process. But it has to be acknowledged that reconciliation is in its early stages. If we were to irresponsibly allocate around $15 billion to the land fund with no regard to the effects on the broader economy, there's a strong possibility that the reconciliation process itself would be put in jeopardy. And I think that adds another dimension to our response to this. So um, I think that point has been made clear enough. As to the uh, amendments two and three, or well, amendment two for a start, which goes to the method of investment of land fund monies and the percentage to be invested, it does appear to us inconsistent to repeal 193A as you're proposing while retaining 192W3, which provides that land fund monies have to be invested in accordance with section 62B, couple B of the Audit Act. The proposed new subsection 1 adds forms of investments permitted under state and territory laws to those permitted under 62B of the Commonwealth Audit Act. It really appears that this would provide just the lowest common denominator for prudential investments. It wouldn't improve the bill. It's likely to create confusion rather than assist the fund to operate efficiently. And in particular, it will never be clear which legislative authority is the basis for fund investments. And in the event that the states amend their legislation, a legislative basis for long-term strategies could be undermined, conceivably resulting in losses to the fund. That's so far as subsection 1. There are similar difficulties with 2. It would, under the funding arrangements currently contained in the bill, provide a total annual drawdown of only $36 million 
instead of 45 million, that's to say 25 per cent of 121 million. However, the new subsection is no doubt uh, predicated on the bill being amended to provide for the massive funding sought by the Greens in their proposed amendment to 193A, which the government can't agree to. It might make sense in the context of uh, such an increase, but in the absence of that increase, it just makes the bill go backwards. Um, the new subsection 2 also seems to involve a drafting loophole. As drafted, it would allow the ILC to spend the previous year's allocation since the 75 per cent limit here proposed only applies to the year the allocation was credited to the fund. So there are a whole variety of substantial reasons why the government opposes that amendment. Um, amendments th three and the companion piece four um, are also unacceptable. They, in our judgment, will result in a quite unworkable scheme and the government opposes them on that basis. In removing 193B to 193H, as is proposed, this amendment removes from the bill provisions for payments out of the fund to the ILC and ATSIC. It would appear that this would leave no legislative basis for the making of payments out of the fund. The assumption appears to be that the ILC will control the fund and not need some legislative basis. Well, that's an inadequate assumption. These amendments would remove the requirement for the accounts and financial statements of the fund uh, to be in a form determined by the Minister for Finance, which is presently provided for in 193H. And that, again, um, in our judgment, uh, is an unattractive proposition and indeed one that uh, further contributes to making the bill unworkable in this form. So for all those complex reasons, that they at least should show the Greens that we're taking them seriously, the government opposes these amendments. Well, the question is, the Senate. The question is that the motions moved by Senator Shamaret, or in this case, requests by Senator Shamaret, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Senator Kerno. Chairman, I haven't seen the amendments. I've, I've heard the arguments rehearsed, but I haven't seen them. So, well, they're not. They're not. No, this is the audit bill, and Senator Ellison hasn't seen them, so it's a bit hard. I mean, I, I've heard you re-canvassing things that you've said several times already. I don't think it's going to change my view, but you know, technically, I haven't seen what I'm about to vote on. Jim, I uh, apologise. I understood that they had been circulated already, um, and it was my failure to uh, make that instruction. Uh, Obvious, and uh, so I, I express that Ad, as uh, Senator Kerno has mentioned that the uh, amendments and their contents have been well rehearsed, apart from one new one today. And so, uh, if I can just respond to uh, Senator Evans' concerns about uh, amendments two and three, I think that uh, the assumption of those was that it would be an increased amount and not. Uh, 75 per cent of the $121 million that the uh, uh, government is intending by this bill to put aside, but of uh, one that was uh, in the, the possibility that an increase in the total amount of the fund uh, would be addressed. And just as a final comment in relation to uh, Senator Evans' statements, uh, I'm glad he's acknowledging that there's no substantial hole in the uh, budget deficit pr produced by this fund. It's only one of $24 million, and uh, we would like to see in a, in a so-called billion-dollar land fund uh, at least an attempt to address a billion dollars uh, into it, but uh, with the drawdown that would actually be uh, considerably less and I think would make the uh, logic of the government in its statements about how it's addressing the needs of Aboriginal people. 95 per cent of the Aboriginal people in this country uh, more, more clear. The question is that the Senator Harraday. Um, <coughs> thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I do apologise uh, uh, to the committee uh, that uh, uh, the uh, perhaps uh, third, uh, 60 second contribution that I might make here um, initially may not be dreadfully relevant to the uh, committee stage of the bill, but uh, I, I, I was—you'll appreciate that uh, this measure came on 
uh, before many of us expected it to come on this afternoon, and um, uh, a number of us have been caught up in other meetings. Uh, but I do want to say to the um, committee, uh, as I would have said uh, if I were to make a second reading speech, that I of course support the uh, uh, legislation. I am disappointed, uh, very disappointed, that uh, uh, all of the work that went into uh, the um, amendments that were adopted by this chamber and the discussions that took place uh, 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 by members of the Senate Select Committee on, uh, on the Land Fund uh, Bill. All of that work uh, uh, at this stage appears not to have uh, borne fruit uh, it, to the extent uh, that uh, the amendments aren't, uh, or a number of the, most of the amendments aren't contained in this piece of legislation that is currently before us. Nevertheless, I'd also acknowledge that there has been a tremendous uh, amount of work gone into this particular measure uh, by others in, uh, in the process as well. Um, uh, it's not only the Senate that's been uh, uh, involved in the tremendous amount of work that's gone into uh, uh, the development of the Land Fund Indigenous Land Corporation uh, ATSIC Amendment Bill. Uh, so I do acknowledge that. Um, and uh, I am supporting the legislation with uh, an expression of disappointment uh, that uh, particularly uh, uh, a number of the amendments that uh, we adopted in this place are not included in therein. I did um, have the opportunity um, only in the last five minutes to hear uh, what was said by Senator Evans in response uh, to Senator Chamaret. I think Senator Chamaret has um, uh, has identified uh, a matter which uh, is, uh, is very much at the heart uh, of this particular question, the heart of the matter, and that is whether in fact our commitment through this legislation is going to be uh, more than just words. Is it going to be uh, supported by a uh, substantial uh, monetary commitment? Now, uh, having said that, however, I, I did uh, hear what Senator Evans said about the uh, uh, difficulty, particularly in the, in the, in the early years, uh, for, for the um, fund management to handle that type of, uh, um, uh, that type of money. And uh, I also heard the comment that was made about uh, 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 land price and the effect that it uh, would have on land price, I suppose. That's something that we've got to be concerned about, and I'm not going to go over that argument uh, that we had previously uh, when um, uh, we uh, debated the amendment that we wanted into the legislation about consultation with uh, 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 various uh, uh, groups. I know uh, Senator Evans uh, might come back at me on that particular matter. But um, I, for one, uh, uh, would like to see the government um, constantly review uh, the practical commitment that it, uh, it has uh, uh, for the fund. Um, but in saying so, I indicate again that I support the legislation and am disappointed with the fact that uh, uh, the amendments uh, were not, uh, or most of the amendments were not in incorporated in into the legislation. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The question for amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Senator Shamaret. Um, having dealt with uh, the request and amendments one to four, um, the next series of um, amendments are uh, numbers 5 to 15 and all relate to the matter of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations. Mm -hmm. Under the bill, the ILC can only carry out its land acquisition functions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations. The Greens believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be able to own land as they see fit and that the bill is far too restrictive on this issue. Um, whenever the uh, committee, uh, the Senate Select Committee uh, was uh, addressed on this topic, 
there were many people who felt that uh, Aboriginal people should determine the capacity in which they held the land. And while some felt that the corporations model, which has worked uh, in other areas through ATSIC, has been a workable one for them, they felt that there was a legitimacy to other means being available and for the communities to be able to make that decision. Um, so uh, we believe that acquired interests in land, uh, and that's the purpose of these amendments, may be granted to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations or Aboriginal persons or Torres Strait Islanders or trustees of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander trusts. Um, we put the amendments because we believe that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders should be treated like other, uh, any other citizens and be allowed to hold their land as they see fit. Uh, it's an act of paternalism to do otherwise. Um, the only outstanding issue would be the definition of trust. Um, the Greens WA have adopted a definition which ensures that each person who benefits or is capable of benefiting is an Aboriginal person, Torres Strait Islander, or an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander corporation. And uh, it's, it's our view that um, the reason why uh, the government has been so restrictive in relation to only allowing corporations to have it is uh, in, in a way imposing a, a bureaucratic structure upon Aboriginal communities that makes it easier uh, for the government. It makes it easier for uh, corporations uh, to be administratively handled and also, presumably, if they fold, for the government to uh, reacquire anything that they've had um, in the time when they've been established. Uh, many committee hearings uh, noted that uh, Aboriginal people feel that corporations have in some ways done them an injustice. They have forced people to uh, adopt this uh, white bureaucratic convention of a legal entity and uh, those who are better able to understand uh, those mechanisms have been able to benefit from them, sometimes to the detriment of some Aboriginal families and people within communities uh, when that trust uh, when the corporation has perhaps folded through mismanagement or, or problems. And uh, it's for that reason the flexibility of these amendments was, was proposed uh, to be included in this bill, not, as has been publicised, to allow uh, the land to be given to individuals, but to prevent the bill from being so restrictive as to only allow it to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations. Uh, but to allow uh, Aboriginal communities to make their own determination of the entity which wants to hold any land that may be acquired through this fund. Senator Shamaret, you're moving 5 to 15 together by the Yes, leave. I oh, move amendments uh, no 5 to 15. Thank you. Well, matter before Minister. we start, um, I think you're only actually moving 5 to 13 because uh, 14 and 15 are really associated with 16. I think you'll find if you have a look at it. They're consequential upon 16. It's 5 to 13, yeah, five inclusive to 13. by leave. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, well, on this group of amendments, the government's position remains, I'm afraid, implacably hostile because grants to individuals and trustees threaten to undermine the bill's fundamental purpose as we see it. This uh, group of amendments was moved by the opposition in both the House of Representatives and the Senate last year. We opposed the amendment then for the same reasons as we do now. The Senate Select Committee on the Land Fund Bill failed to find any consensus among Indigenous peoples about this amendment, although a number of witnesses did explicitly endorse the government's original approach to the issue. The Coalition's uh, stated rationale for this amendment, and that again now by the Greens, is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples should be treated like other Australians who are not required to incorporate in order to have title to land. Of course, other Australians don't have access to the land fund. This is a special case of positive discrimination, unashamed positive discrimination designed to redress a past injustice. The land fund provides for Indigenous people an avenue in addition to that available to all Australians to purchase land. Indigenous people will still be, of course, free to pursue the ordinary means of acquiring land if they don't wish to be bound by the restrictions on title to land acquired through this fund. 
it all really goes back to the fundamental purpose of this whole exercise, which is to give Indigenous peoples back their land and to ensure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples can enjoy the benefits of their land, land granted to them on this basis, for generations to come. Vestment of ownership in corporations will ensure that the land remains part of the Aboriginal land base for the use of future generations of Indigenous people. Aboriginal people did invariably hold in the past a communal form of title, which was inalienable. They're familiar with operating on a collective basis. The Senate Select Committee purported to establish that individual ownership was traditionally accepted in some Indigenous communities, based its argument on the testimony of one Torres Strait Islander witness. Yet it's abundantly clear from that gentleman's evidence that even he was in no way talking about individual ownership. He was referring to a form of familial ownership in which the structure of the owning family clearly extended well beyond what we would call a nuclear family. Grants to individuals run the risk of potentially excluding the rightful traditional owners, using traditional here in a loose sense because we're not talking, of course, in this context about people with a native title claim as such, but traditional owners in the loose sense who are likely to be communities or groups. Beside being consistent with the fundamental purpose of the Land Fund Bill, ownership by corporations does have some practical advantages. Uh, corporate ownership does strengthen accountability through the statutory requirements which are placed on such bodies, including the need for them to report publicly on their activities. Allowing grants to trustees would mean that non-Indigenous individuals and corporations could acquire legal ownership of land under the bill, even though beneficial ownership would be with Indigenous interests. There would not necessarily be a full Indigenous ownership contemplated by the bill. Well, that's a miscellany of points, but they all move in the same direction, which is that of uh, the non-acceptability in terms not this time of workability so much as basic principle, and the basic principle that we do want the land base uh, to be maintained, retained for future generations. And uh, we see that corporate ownership is not only consistent with known Aboriginal tradition, but by far and away the best way to ensure that that, in fact, will be the case. Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to question the Minister. Was he saying that the recent select committee uh, had only evidence from one witness uh, in support of the individual ownership of land? I mean, I, I understood him to say that. If, I, if it's otherwise, then I stand corrected. I'm advised that on the specific question of individual ownership being traditionally accepted in some Indigenous communities, there was only one witness. I mean, there may well have been more witnesses than that arguing in favour of individual ownership, but on the factual question, the anthropological question, if you like, as to the nature of the ownership tradition, I'm told that uh, that's so. And everyone's nodding in unison on my left, so I don't know whether you want to take on the assembled forces of bureaucratic light over here, or whether you'll accept that as the explanation. Accept that explanation. Uh, it wasn't quite clear at the outset. Uh, suffice to say that uh, the, the coalition's made its, its position quite clear on this in the past, uh, and uh, we will be supporting the bill uh, without this amendment. But I might just say that uh, in my role in the uh, Joint House Committee on Na uh, reviewing the Native Title Act, which now will be reviewing the operation of this, uh, this legislation, I'll be maintaining a keen interest in how this provision operates. Senator Shamaret. Um, I have an, a question arising out of this. Um, I'd like the uh, minister to clarify whether this land fund is designed for the 95 per cent of Aboriginal people uh, who won't be able to uh, assert uh, their rights through native title. Um, and then I'd ask him to explain how um, this can possibly reflect those people for whom corporation, for, for whom communal uh, traditional concepts no, no longer hold, and for whom uh, the corporate corporation structure is is a, a form of uh, white bureaucracy that's being superimposed upon them, and in no way reflecting any uh, remnant of communal title. A communal inalienable title, as he referred to. Well, it is the case, of course, that this uh, legislation is primarily designed for those who have been dispossessed and who are unable to uh, recreate a uh, 
a claim in relation to uh, some particular piece of land with whom they've maintained traditional attachment. Yes, of course, we've had this discussion often enough. That doesn't mean, however, that it's inappropriate uh, to think in terms of the, clear, the, the, the closest thing we can get to communal title um, as being the, uh, the way to go when we're vesting land in these people, because um, it's not a matter of white bureaucracy. It's the best that white bureaucracy can do to get close to what we're trying to do, and that is to recreate some kind of land base uh, for those people who can't establish a land base in any other way. But it's not just uh, hung on that particular notion. It's also to do with the business of preserving that base uh, as intact as possible intergenerationally for the future. It's, it's linked with the question of alienability, which we're dealing with separately. Uh, but the point, I think, is a very important one, that we want to create from the outset a sense that this particular legislation is designed not to benefit individuals, but rather groups groups of people who are trying by this means to, uh, to recover some of the heritage uh, which has been lost. Senator Harradine. Uh, Madam Chair, um, one of the reasons uh, that I supported the uh, uh, previous amendments, uh, <coughs> uh, which, uh, and this one is similar to those, is that it would give uh, a flexibility See, one of my concerns, and a very great concern of mine, and it's shared uh, amongst um, a, a lot of uh, Aboriginal people, and that is uh, the decline of uh, job opportunities uh, for Aboriginal people. Um, I think it's fair to say uh, that uh, there are now uh, there were uh, a greater number, a uh, percentage number of uh, Aboriginal people working during the Great Depression than there are now. And that is real, a real concern. There's a very real concern. Admittedly, that uh, some of the, uh, uh, the Aboriginals, uh, the uh, people that were working at that particular time were working. Uh, in uh, very substandard uh, uh, conditions and uh, uh, that uh, absolutely would not be tolerated um, and should then not have been tolerated. But nevertheless, um, uh, the situation at, as at 1995 is that um, uh, many, uh, uh, there are a very large number a great percentage of uh, Aboriginal people who are unable to find employment and who want employment, who want to be able to uh, uh, be creative. Now, one of the reasons that uh, I was supportive of uh, uh, the um, uh, proposals that uh, now Senator Chamaret is giving another run to uh, was precisely that, because I thought that would give a flexibility which would enable these people uh, to um, uh, perhaps um, uh, to, to enable the, the management of the fund to ensure that, that uh, there would be employment uh, opportunities uh, uh, and employment created uh, in the administration of this particular fund. And thus I believe that it was necessary uh, to have a more flexible uh, uh, arrangement than, than the inflexible one that appears to be in the legislation at the present moment, point of time. I, I apologise for the committee for raising this ag uh, uh, again at this uh, point of time, but it does, it does worry me very much. Uh, 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 that is to say, uh, the, the numbers of uh, Aboriginal people who want to be employed, want to be engaged in creative uh, uh, and uh, income generating uh, work, uh, but uh, who just do not have the opportunity. And I, I wonder whether the government, uh, either now or at some particular stage, could just give to the Senate um, its views about that particular issue, which is, I think, a very, very important issue. Minister? Well, could I just say that um, certainly one of the uh, aspirations we have is that land. Um, or property uh, will be able to be vested for income earning and job generating uh, purposes, for enterprise development purposes. 
And uh, I take very seriously the point that uh, Senator Harradine makes in respect, and I hope very much that the ILC will bear that objective in mind in uh, disposing of its funds. That said, I don't think that the requirement that they vest them in corporate structures rather than individuals uh, would necessarily inhibit their, uh, their flexibility in pursuing that enterprise objective to quite the extent that Senator Harradine suggests. I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's an interesting point that he raises and one that um, can certainly be kept under review as we look at the way in which the legislation uh, operates. And if there is any uh, unnecessary inhibition of the objectives he's pointing to, well, that's something I think we you know, might usefully debate at some future time in the light of any accumulated data. But um, I don't think he's astray at all, uh, Madam Chair, in suggesting that that should be a, a legitimate aspiration for the use of the fund. And uh, if employment opportunities uh, can be generated, that's uh, so much the better. I mean, it's not the, not the only objective, and it's just the use and enjoyment of land for purposes approximating traditional purposes is uh, as a very legitimate usage as well, just giving people a sense of space and access to, uh, to land which uh, urban Aboriginal people, dispossessed Aboriginal people might well uh, uh, be, be craving for. It doesn't necessarily have to have an economic component to it, uh, but there's certainly no reason why it shouldn't and uh, every reason why, at least in part, uh, some funds should not be directed to that objective. The question is, Senator Chamaret. I just want to briefly comment on that. Uh, I think the point uh, that I was trying to make, and, and I, I think it uh, has been borne out by Senator Harradine's comment, is that uh, by restricting it to corporations, uh, the, the bill actually could um, uh, penalise or disadvantage some uh, Aboriginal people within urban areas uh, for whom a corporation is a very artificial entity, uh, an, an excessive administrative hoop, whereas they may have natural um, uh, entities that are uh, more amenable to allowing them that independence. And I just want to complete uh, this section by reading uh, two quotes that illustrate the dilemma amongst the Aboriginal community. Um, one is uh, the, the uh, destiny before the Senate Select Committee uh, by uh, Sharon Fryerbrace, Director of Palm River uh, Propriety Limited and a councillor for Atsix Tambuka region, who argued that the ILC should have the flexibility to make grants of land to individuals, groups and families as well as corporations. Whilst acknowledging the long-held principle of Indigenous community ownership, we must be conscious of the changing place, role and contribution of Aboriginal people in contemporary Australia, particularly urban localities. We have fought long and hard for equal rights. Let us not be constrained by traditional ownership practices that are foreign to many in contemporary Indigenous communities in the southeast of Australia. And the other comment from the Ballarat and District Aboriginal Cooperative Limited, who maintained that land should be owned by the Indigenous people with no conditions or restrictions of their right to make all decisions in respect to the land, including the right to sell, even after a short period of time. Although traditional Aboriginal culture has been for community control or care of the land, we assert that the Aboriginal people should have the same rights as other Australians, be it as corporations, individuals, groups of individuals or trustees. The argument of corporations being answerable to the ILC is further evidence of government desiring to keep control of and take decision-making away from Aboriginal people. That's the point of these amendments. I, I, I can see that the government is not going to uh, move on it, but I do want it on the public record that it is a paternalistic measure. It's intended to restrict uh, Aboriginal people from being able to have real say into how they will own and manage their land. The question is that amendments 5 to 13 moved by Senator Shamaret be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that Senator Shamaret. I now move amendments 14 to 16. I'm indebted to Senator Evans for uh, you're seeking, being up. You're seeking leave to move those amendments together, Yes, I'm you? seeking leave to move leave those. granted? There being no objections, leave is granted, yeah. Senator Shamaret. And these uh, relate to the disposal of surplus land uh, by the ILC. Um, the bill as it stands permits the ILC or its subsidiaries to dispose of land that it no longer needs to hold. 
as in the case where the ILC should only acquire land for the purposes of making a grant of the interest to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the Greens WA believe that it is appropriate that relevant people and bodies be consulted before the ILC disposes of any land. We believe that the bill should require consultation with relevant Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations or Aboriginal persons and Torres Strait Islanders or trustees of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Trust before disposal of any land bought for grants to Indigenous people. Um, I think that's why uh, I um, got confused with the amendments 14 to 15 because we were still including the concept which we've just lost in the previous amendments of a wider um, ownership possibility than corporations. Um, I must make clear here that the bill permits the ILC to gain land uh, that it uses for other purposes uh, to raise money, etc. The uh, amendments put here relate to when the ILC has bought land specifically to grant it uh, to, Aboriginal and Torres Strait, to an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporation. Um, and uh, we believe that it's only reasonable that those people should be consulted if uh, the ILC decides to dispose of that uh, prior to granting it. So it's really a mechanism to permit efficiently passing over the land to the people for whom it's been acquired, and it removes the capacity of the ILC uh, to, um, to hold on to it or to uh, dispose of it without consulting those people. Is that amendments, Minister? The government thinks this amendment is unnecessary. There's no requirement for a legislative prescription here which might in practice unnecessarily fetter the ILC, bearing in mind here as elsewhere that whenever you create an obligation to do anything, that immediately becomes uh, litigatable by someone who might be minded to make a nuisance of himself or herself or itself in the case of a corporation. And uh, you've got to have a pretty solid grounds before you start cluttering the landscape with those kinds of inhibitions. We see the power to dispose of surplus land as likely to be used in the following situations. First, where the ILC has purchased a parcel of land, only part of which is required for granting to Indigenous people. Um, you might have well have a situation where part may be required to be sold uh, to assist in the financing of the other part. Uh, a second situation which could easily arise as a matter of routine is where land which was originally purchased by the ILC is surrendered to the ILC for disposal on behalf of the landholders. Um, another situation could arise when the ILC is unable to find an appropriate body to hold tight to the land which it has purchased. In the event that there were people uh, affected by the disposal, we would certainly expect the ILC to consult them as a matter of good administration. I think it's reasonable to anticipate that that will in fact occur. Uh, without the need to multiply legislative uh, strictures of this kind. The question is that amendments 14, 15 and 16 moved by Senator, Senator Shamaret be agreed to. Those other opinions say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Senator Shamaret, do you have 17, 18 and 19? Yes, but I'd like to deal with 17 and 18 together. Um, so you're seeking leave for that? Yes. Is leave yes. granted? Being no objections, leave is granted. And I think this is the most exciting amendment because it hasn't been seen before in the debate and uh, <laughs> because I'd like to move it on principle, um, not that I'm unduly unrealistic about the outcome. And it relates to the gender balance on the ILC board. Uh, this amendment, uh, these amendments, it's 17 and 18, arise from the views of Aboriginal women who appeared before the Land Fund Select Committee in Broome. I believe there was also a reference made uh, by the uh, Aboriginal women who appeared in Darwin as well. They wanted to make sure that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women were equally represented on the ILC board. In order to achieve this, it's necessary to increase the minimum number of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders from uh, five to six in the bill. And uh, I'm really putting uh, this amendment on the record for the Yandu Yuaru Women's Group uh, because it was one of the best moments in the debate and in the um, committee consultations when they came and uh, asked some questions regarding uh, the representation on the board and made this um, suggestion 
and they were followed up, and I, I can't immediately recall the group that appeared, but um, a group that came after them, and I, th I believe it was um, a, a group from Kananara, who stated that they felt that that was only uh, just to have uh, three Aboriginal women on the board, but in that way they wanted the uh, uh, male representation uh, not to be uh, penalised by the constriction of up to five Aboriginal representatives on the board of seven, so they wanted it increased to six so there could be three men and three women. And while having placed that on the record and urged people to think about what it means when we pass or, or reject it, I'd like to ask the minister just for an update on the process by which the minister uh, of Aboriginal Affairs is going to appoint the board and whether this amendment is at all possible uh, for consideration or whether that process is so far advanced that it wouldn't be possible to include it. And, uh, I, I would urge him to do that because right throughout the committee hearings we did hear people saying they didn't mind the minister appointing, providing he actually received nominations, perhaps one from each state or from uh, various regions of Australia, and the whole idea that he might just arbitrarily appoint a number of people was, uh, I don't think, contemplated by very many, or if it was, uh, they weren't very impressed by that. Senator Ellison. Uh, I might say that the coalition doesn't believe in quotas as such. However, uh, there is some me merit in what, uh, in, in what Senator Shamaret says, and I can only say that again in the role, the supervisory role of the uh, Joint House Committee on Native Title, that it's something that I'd be looking at to make to ensure that uh, the appointments are made uh, with that in mind, and that during the course of the evidence taken. Uh, there were many Aboriginal women who appeared and who were concerned about uh, uh, one or more aspects of this bill. So I would say to the government that uh, uh, although uh, there, there's no quota as such, that the comments of Senator Chamaret uh, must and should be borne in mind. Minister. Well, we'll certainly bear those uh, comments in mind, but we don't feel we ought to be constrained by a formal rule of the kind that's proposed. Um, as to the need for gender balance, for a start, we certainly favour boards balanced on gender grounds wherever possible. However, there will be circumstances where there's simply going to be insufficient men or insufficient women with the particular skills or experience required for membership of a board willing, who are willing in turn or available in turn to serve on it. Um, in such cases, we certainly wouldn't want to have the options to appoint a suitably qualified board limited by a prescription of this kind. As to the um, requirement of proposed of at least six Indigenous members, let me say this. The bill allows for a board that could be entirely Indigenous, but it doesn't make that a requirement. It's likely that the board will be all Indigenous um, when there are Indigenous men and women with the appropriate level of expertise who are available to be part of it. But it is important the ILC is able to use the skills and experiences of non-Indigenous experts when it happens to be the case that there are no Indigenous people available to play that role, or an insufficient number. The bill is based on the Indigenous Commercial Development Corporation model, uh, which provides that five out of the nine board members must be Indigenous. And I think it's just worth stopping for half a second to note that a number of really quite vital contributions have been made to that corporation by some of its non-Indigenous members who've been appointed because of their expertise in financial and business matters. Um, I don't think it is in this context invidious to, to name some names. I'm thinking of people like Brian Wright of the Commonwealth Bank, uh, Mr Laurie Willett, who was head of the Commonwealth Funds Management Limited, and uh, Professor Bob Walker, who I think is widely regarded as Australia's preeminent independent expert in public sector accounting. As it stands, the bill we think provides the correct balance between the need for Indigenous direction and self-determination and the need to ensure that there is appropriate expertise on the board. And uh, for that reason we won't support the amendment, but um, I recognise the aspiration. We're not unsympathetic to that and uh, in practice we'll try and get there. The question is that amendments 17 and 18 moved by Senator Chamaret be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Senator Shamaret, you want to move to number 19? Yes. Um, 
and uh, I'm just wondering whether there's any point in, in doing 19 and 20 separately. They relate to two different matters, so maybe I'll, uh, with by leave, just move the remaining two. Senator, I don't have an amendment number 20. Oh, well, that's. I have 19. Mm. It's in two that's parts. Right. One about Division 15 and one about Division 16. But I don't have. We do not have an amendment number 20 up here. Well, that seems to be a, a problem. I have got a 20 on my sheet, which is the original. But uh, uh, I wonder if I could just go ahead with um, 19 for the moment and, and just uh, uh, seek uh, your indulgence to find out what's happened with the uh, the one. I th I'll check later. But if I can just um, refer to amendment 19. Um, can you just have a check at what yours says? Um, this amendment inserts a new division concerning dispossession at the end of, of clause three. And um, currently, the bill doesn't make it clear whether this legislation is intended to be compens compensation for dispossession. The Greens believe that this bill should not be seen in any way as compensation and nothing in it should prevent claims for compensation being made in the future. Uh, the Greens are concerned that the associated rhetoric from the Prime Minister, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and the Leader of the Government in the Senate might lead people to understand that this is the major act of compensation for dispossession. It has been repeatedly stated that this is the major uh, financial um, component which is uh, following after the um, High Court decision on native title, uh, and it may then lead to the land fund being taken as compensation for the dispossession of the last 200 years. Compensation for dispossession does not come at $45 million a year or $24 million a year more than is currently available. Compensation for dispossession would be incalculable. And the Greens see that it is important that the legislation leaves the option open for compensation to be sought at another time, and thus the legislation should include a clause which specifically states that this is not compensation for dispossession and that nothing in this bill prevents claims for compensation being made. Uh, we've already talked about how many people are going to uh, benefit from this fund, and the reality is that those who, who know already that they will never get access to that minute uh, amount uh, want some kind of guarantee that they won't be regarded as having uh, gained some kind of uh, compensation at a governmental level of which they haven't received anything. And uh, it's for that reason why they want it stated within the bill as a disclaimer that uh, prevents them from being uh, disadvantaged in any way from taking that stand. Um, and Excuse me, Senator Shamaret, on our work running sheet, 19 and 20 have been collapsed together, so feel right. free to talk about both oh, of them, but it's only number 19. Great. On our right, you have got it. I'm, I'm delighted. I think the 20 just fell off. Um, and the amendment 20 on my copy, which is uh, in the amendment 19 as we're considering it, uh, under the section Division 16, yes. uh, extinguishment of native title rights and interests to be disregarded. Um, uh, the amendment that is, is meant here creates a new division at the end of part four of the ATSIC Act, which deals with the extinguishment of native title on Indigenous held land. This amendment statutorily sets aside any extinguishment of native title on any land which has been acquired, set aside or dedicated for the benefit of Aboriginal people or Torres Strait Islanders. In doing so, it provides for the revival of native title, similar to the revival of native title on mining leases under the Native Title Act 1993. If the object of this bill is to restore land to Australia's Indigenous people, then it is important that they have the land restored to them in terms which is appropriate to them. If this land is to be treated as Indigenous held land, as the government keeps arguing, then it should be treated as other Indigenous held land, as land where native title rights remain. And uh, in an earlier uh, discussion, Senator Evans used the word communal inalienable title in order to justify uh, corporations um, having the land as being the closest equivalent to the communal inalienable title of Aboriginal culture. Um, 
what we are proposing here is that revival of native title allows that inalienable aspect of land that's acquired under the, the land fund uh, to be made available to Aboriginal people. And uh, it would uh, offset the concerns which I haven't agreed with which uh, have been referred to by Senator Evans as wanting to keep control of the Aboriginal estate by using corporations as the means by which the land is held, rather than actually giving it to Aboriginal people in whatever form their community feels is most appropriate, and then allowing them to revive native title in such a way that that communal inalienable title is really reflected. And uh, that's the purpose of that final amendment. And uh, so I, I just, if I haven't already moved it, uh, move um, amendments 19 and 20, though I wouldn't mind the minister just commenting on whether there's any chance of uh, change of heart by the government in relation to either of these, otherwise I wouldn't want to move them together. Minister. Oh, so no, Minister. Not much prospect of a change of heart, I'm afraid, uh, Senator. I don't want to disappoint you, but that's the breaks. Um, as to 19, it is wrong to claim that nothing in the bill is intended as compensation for the dispossession that Indigenous people have suffered. The provision of $1.5 billion for the acquisition of land is intended as one step in the process of recognition of Indigenous possession and some compensation for that dispossession. Uh, the Greens have mistaken in their view that the government considers this is the totality of the final settlement. It's been stated over and over that this bill is only part of the government's broad response to the Mabo decision. There's nothing in the bill which states that this is the government's final position or action. And I can assure you, Senator, that it's the government's view that a good deal more should and will be done to address the issue of dispossession. As to um, prior extinguishment being disregarded, can I say this? It's a little complicated, but I need to put the government's position clearly on the record. This proposal means that if any land is acquired or set aside for the benefit of Indigenous people for any purpose, any previous extinguishment of native title over that land will be disregarded and presumably native title is to be re-established. Section would apply to any acquisition or dedication of land under any Commonwealth law, whether related to this Act or not. It's at least arguable that the provision would apply to state laws. The section would provide for the non-extinguishment of native title, even over land which has been freehold title for over 100 years. And I have to say that the amendment shows a fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of native title, which exists only where Indigenous people have maintained their connection with the land. There will also be major difficulties in determining who the native title's holders are, if any, when the extinguishment occurred a long time ago, and that again raises further potential for significant dispute and conflict among Indigenous people. The section differs from section 47 of the Native Title Act in the following ways. Uh, 47 only applies to pastoral leased land, not to all land. Section 47 builds in the requirement of continuing attachment to the land. And Section 47 also provides for pastoral leases to remain in place and coexist with native title. There's nothing in this proposal to provide for the situation where the revived native title and the acquired interests are not in the hands of the same Indigenous people. This is another potential source of conflict and division between Aboriginal groups. For example, where the corporation attempts to assist a group of Aboriginal people by granting it land to which it had no prior connection, and the native title to that land, as re-established, is held by a different group. One can imagine a number of examples where this provision will create extraordinary difficulties. E.g., if the Commonwealth funds, for the, funds the purchase of land to set up a health centre in the middle of Sydney for the benefit of the Aboriginal communities there, the native title to the land on which that centre is situated may continue to be held by the so-called traditional owners. If the ILC purchased an office block in a CBD for investment purposes similar to the New South Wales land funds purchase in Parramatta and then later wishes to realise that investment, couldn't do so. If the ILC wished to rationalise a number of purchases through swaps of land, linked sales, acquisitions, similarly there'd be difficulties. Again, complex compensation issues may arise for the ILC and other Commonwealth agencies, especially where land acquired for the benefit of Indigenous people is subsequently used for some other purpose or disposed of. The ILC and other bodies may be precluded from granting land or using it for the purpose for which it was acquired because the possible existence of Native Title makes that Act an impermissible future Act for the purposes of the Native Title Act. 
The proposed amendment finally is completely at odds with the Greens' previous uh, support for the removal of controls on the disposal of land in section 191S, because native title land is by its nature inalienable. So there's a number of strikes there. I think uh, you might conceivably be prepared to acknowledge uh, Senator Chamaret. I think I've covered the terrain in more than adequate uh, detail to indicate why it is that the government can't accept that amendment either. Senator Ellison. Perhaps if I could ask the minister a question which perhaps related to one previously asked by Senator Chamaret, but uh, it, is, it is relevant in that uh, the minister has mentioned section 47 of the Native Title Act, the, uh, uh, the method by which uh, pastoral properties purchased through the ILC can be converted to native title under the, that section. But what, what I'd ask the, the minister is there's a concern uh, with the Northern Territory that having regard to the next three years, uh, the ATSIC uh, provision remaining in force until then, that uh, in view of that limited time, that that money would be devoted mainly to acquiring properties in the Northern Territory and uh, that would deplete uh, funds available to purchase a property in other parts of Australia. Now, can the government give an undertaking that that won't be the case? That, uh, that it won't, you won't have uh, during the next three years a, uh, a heavy concentration on the acquisition of property in the Northern Territory? Minister. Well, it's not our expectation that ATSIC will do anything other than maintain the normal pattern of land acquisition. Uh, using those funds available uh, to it. I mean, that's ex independent authority makes its own decisions about this matter, but um, I don't believe there is any basis uh, for thinking that uh, the kind of strategy outlined by uh, Senator Elson will in fact be pursued. I think there's far too many other people around the country with competing interests uh, that would be far too upset for that to, uh, that to happen, and uh, I think we can rely on good sense prevailing in that respect. Ellison. Can I then ask the minister, is it the case that uh, he would envisage that expenditure by the ILC, uh, having regard to his comments that uh, you don't put all your eggs in one basket, would be uh, spread evenly across the country or as much as possible? But that would be the, the, pr the main aim, was to provide a, uh, a wider spread as possible. Minister. Well, I think everything hangs on the as possible. Um, there is a sense in which I think we've got to leave it to the ILC's discretion. Situations vary enormously around the country. And to talk in terms of an even spread, I mean, um, begs a lot of questions that need to be answered uh, by the board. I mean, I hope it will be equitable and balanced, uh, but how that is best done, I mean, depends on the combination of national strategies and regional strategies that, uh, that emerge. And there will be a consultative process associated with that. And, uh, I hope again that uh, good sense will prevail. We expect it will. Senator Ellison. I just raise the point that in the Northern Territory, uh, uh, in a Northern Territory publication, uh, which has been provided to me by the uh, Chief Minister uh, in a letter dated the 15th of March, uh, there's a statement there that the Northern Land Council is considering the purchase of 21 cattle stations at an estimate cost, estimated cost of $50 million. The NLC says money for the stations would be provided by the federal government's proposed Aboriginal land fund. Now, I'll just ask the minister if he knows anything about that. Question is that Amendment 19, moved by Senator uh, Chamaret, be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Question is that the bill be reported. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. That was that was part amendment twenty years. They are yes on. It was identified as a separate amendment, and we've all referred to it in speeches. So okay. Well, the amendment twenty. The question is, amendment twenty be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. McGowan. Senator McGowan, would you like to oblige, please? Timber Chairman of the Committee, Senator West reports that the Committee has considered the land fund and Indigenous land 
Corporation Act, the Amendment Bill 1995, and agreed to it without amendments or requests. Senator Evans. The report the committee be adopted. Question is that motion be agreed to? Does that opinion say aye? Oh, no. Senator Shannon Moran. Um, I wish to place on the record the reasons why the Greens cannot and won't be supporting this land fund. Um, firstly, uh, we, we don't support it because it's inadequate. Senator, are you wanting to speak to the third reading? Yes. We're not quite there yet. Oh, please. Sorry. Minister. Um, well, the question is, the report of the committee be adopted. Those other opinions say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, move the bill be read a third time. Senator Shamaret. Uh, again. Um, the Greens uh, WA cannot support this land fund in the form in which it's coming before the Senate now, firstly because it is inadequate um, in its amount and uh, because the government has shown itself inflexible and paternalistic as well as ungenerous in its response uh, to the uh, calls right across Australia from various uh, Aboriginal communities in relation to this fund. Um, because this land fund actually ties Aboriginal people into a, a system of never being able to achieve more than uh, $24 million a year more for acquisition and management and also administration of that, uh, we feel that there has to be some protest against it. And uh, as we vote against it, we actually represent far more than the two uh, out of the 76 members here in terms of percentage of those uh, Aboriginal Australians who don't agree with this bill going through in the form that it currently is. And so it's a symbolic vote. It's, uh, it's one that recognises that uh, the uh, Senate is about to pass it and about to give some small uh, concession in terms of access to a land fund to some small number of Aboriginal people across the country, and in that it's, it's a symbol that the government is willing to do something. However, we feel it's an indictment of the government's uh, will uh, to do something that should really be far bigger and far more generous uh, to the Aboriginal people of this country, and uh, that is why we indicate that we aren't supporting this bill. Question is the bill be narrowed a third time? Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Foreman teller for the ayes and Senator Chamaret teller for the noes. Thank you. There have been 47 ayes and two noes. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats? Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission Act 1989 and certain other acts so as to establish a land fund and an Indigenous land corporation to help redress the dispossession of Aboriginal persons in the Torres Strait Islanders and for related purposes. Or Order. Can I have those senators who are intending to leave this chamber? Can they do so speedily, please? Those who are going to stay, resume their seats. And the level of noise is a little bit high. Senator Foreman, you are wishing to move something by leave. You're seeking leave. Yes, I seek leave. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Foreman. Uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, on behalf of yourself, Senator West, I present the report of the Community Affairs Legislation. Committee on the Health Legislation, Private Health Insurance Reform Amendment Bill 1994, together with the transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee, and move that the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
It being six after 6.50, we're now on consideration of government documents. There is one government document, the Auditor General Report No. 20 of 1994-95, Report on the Audit of the Australian Wheat Board. Senator Madam Mackey, Bowen. Deputy President, uh, I move the Senate take note of the paper and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Consideration of the government documents is now concluded, and I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator, Mc Senator Cooney. Sitting out. <coughs> Mr. Uh, Acting, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, Mr. John Fay and Mr. Bob Carr are fighting the New South Wales election due to be determined next Saturday on the proposition that society wants to lock away forever those it would be rid of. Both leaders are intent on that strategy. They would imprison men and women for decades in close to arbitrary fashion. Madam Making Deputy President, the abuse of arbitrary power corrodes the quality of any community. Criminals misuse such power when they murder, rape, maim, steal and blackmail. Monopolies do so when they ply their trade in defiance of consumer rights. Contractors follow that course when they oppress their workers. So do parents when they violate their children. Partners do likewise when they excoriate each other on party. And governments abuse arbitrary power when they jail a class of people indifferent to the particular circumstances of each of its members. Mr Madam Acting Deputy President, what happens to law enforcement in New South Wales may in the future spread to other states and the Commonwealth. A statute made in Macquarie Street taking away a court's capacity to judge people on their merits may come to taint criminal justice throughout Australia. We need all address the issue. Three questions face a judge about to sentence a convict. Firstly, what has this criminal done? Secondly, who is he or she? Thirdly, what ought to be done with him or her? From what Mr Fay and Mr Carr have proposed, the courts will be allowed to answer the first question only. Parliament is to take the other two away from them. This usurps the proper role of judges. To attach a, minimum to, <coughs> to attach a maximum penalty to a crime is a function of Parliament. To impose an appropriate sentence on a particular individual for a specific wrong he or she has perpetrated is a duty of the judiciary. Were the legislature to invade the proper province of the courts, as advocated in the current election, the right balance between them would be grossly disturbed. Madam Deputy President, a long sentence is not necessarily a wrong one, but a judge ought not award it automatically. A judge ought to take into account a number of matters when sentencing convicts. These include their role in the crime, the harm they have done, what efforts they have made to redress it, their character, their social and cultural history, their age and the quality of their remorse. When Parliament fixes a mandatory rather than a maximum term of imprisonment for a crime, it puts at risk the free, democratic and liberal society most Australians want. It countermands the imperatives arising from the uniqueness of each individual and those of fairness, of compassion and propriety. People subject to the criminal justice system are treated as little more than automatons. How society treats those at its margin is a key test of its worth. A community which embraces the rich, the powerful, the beautiful and the healthy, while spurning the poor, the weak, the ugly and the sick is grievously flawed. Where it treats the criminal as no more than refuse to be cast into a garbage bin and buried for a generation, it perverts the humanity of all its members. Madam Acting Deputy President, there are times when the public is unfairly critical of political leaders. During their careers, both Mr Fay and Mr Carr have done many good things and deserve much praise. But on this issue, where each commits himself to outdo the other in locking away lawbreakers in New South Wales, indifferent to the, demand, to, the, to the demands of justice and morality, they both fail miserably as men of principle. Senator Brownhill, are you ready to... You're closest to your desk and standing. No, I'm not actually. Jim can go. Well, you're next. Oh. No, Jim's behind me. Well, I'm trying to be even handed and call left, right, left, right. Oh, I ain't ready yet for the moment. I'd okay, Senator McKeonan. Senator McKeonan's not jumping. Senator O'Chi, are you jumping? Do you want to go? Simply just a June. Well, if nobody else. Well, um. Am I the understanding that Senator McKinnon does not want the call? He's not call. He's not jumping. Nobody's jumping. I'm about to adjourn the place, well, in Senator that case, O'Chee. In that case, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, I come into the Senate tonight on the adjournment to raise a very serious matter, and that is in relation to uh, 
the conduct of senior executive officers within the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. And the matters in question relate to issues first aired by my colleague and Deputy Leader of the National Party, Senator David Brownhill and myself, uh, in the estimates immediately following the last federal election, where we had details of financial impropriety, which was alleged to have been done by a number of senior executive service officers within the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. To cut a long story short, Madam Acting Deputy President, extracting the information on these improprieties was a bit like pulling teeth, because getting the officers to acknowledge that there was even reason for concern was a very difficult process indeed. And as a consequence of that, the estimates hearings relating to the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service were particularly protracted, particularly protracted question, uh, questioning sessions, and, uh, and they didn't bring a lot of satisfaction to any of the people who were, who were involved in the whole process. Early last year, in May last year, charges were brought under the Public Service Act against one officer in particular, an officer by the name of Philip Corrigan. Now, as at November last year, the inquiry, the official inquiry under Section 61 of the Public Service Act uh, into those charges had only just commenced. And the inquiry officer had not been able to do anything in the interim. What Senator Brownhill and I were not told, was not told on uh, the 29th of November, was that that officer in question had in fact obtained permission from the Secretary of the Department to have extended leave of absence so that he could take up a high paying job in the United Kingdom. That high paying job in the United Kingdom was in fact to head up the operations executive of the new meat hygiene division of the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. It is our understanding, and certainly our understanding from information which has been provided to us, that Mr Corrigan may well have been aided in obtaining that position with the assistance of references provided by the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service itself. Not individual officers of the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service personally writing references, but we understand that there may have been the belief in the United Kingdom that Mr Corrigan came, in fact, with an official reference from the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. Given that the officer was under investigation on six charges of impropriety under the Public Service Act, those charges carrying penalties of up to dismissal, it is particularly disturbing that that possibility may even arise, Madam Acting Deputy President, particularly disturbing that that situation should come to pass. And the Estimates Committee was not told on the 29th of November, when the hearing took place, that this was in fact the case. Nobody even attempted to tell senators attending the Estimates Committee that Mr Corrigan had already obtained approval for his extended leave of absence. Now Mr Corrigan is subject to questioning is the subject of questions in the House of Commons because word has travelled over there about the charges against Mr Corrigan and members of parliament in the United Kingdom who take a different view in relation to financial propriety from that which was expressed by Senator Collins, who seemed to think it was all well and good at the estimates hearing on the 15th of February that Mr Corrigan should have obtained this job in the UK and what a great feather it was in our cap. Parliamentarians in England have taken a different view, and this is turning into a scandal in the UK as well, because I understand the view over there is that it was entirely improper that this officer should have obtained references and should have been fixed up 
with a job in the UK with the assistance of his colleagues at Aquis to get him out of the country and unload him on the United Kingdom, because that is exactly what has happened. And they are saying that this is unsatisfactory. I say also that this is unsatisfactory because I believe it blemishes the good name and integrity of the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service for this sort of going on to occur, for Mr Corrigan to be able to obtain these references and be fitted up with a job in the United Kingdom is quite simply a slur on the integrity of the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. It should never have happened. And it only happened because there was a failure of proper management. Now, it is also my understanding that findings have been made in relation to those six charges. I'm waiting the official advice from the minister as to exactly what the situation is. I understand Mr Corrigan has been advised, and I also understand from journalists that Mr Corrigan doesn't want to answer any questions about the results of the findings on those six charges. Now, I can only surmise, Madam Acting Deputy President, why Mr Corrigan doesn't want to answer any questions. I mean, I can only assume that if Mr Corrigan had been found innocent on all of the six charges, he'd be very happy to answer questions from journalists in relation to the matter. But I understand from a journalist who contacted Mr Corrigan that he wasn't particularly keen to talk about the issue at all, which sort of suggests to me that Mr Corrigan has not had the benefit of six, uh, six verdicts of innocent. I am concerned that these matters, which I was told were finalised on the 15th of February, I'm sorry, Senator Crowley, would I like to repeat that interjection? I said you are disgraceful, Senator. I want that withdrawn. Well, Senator Minister, would you like to withdraw it, please? Senator, I'm well, I'm not quite sure what is um, to be withdrawn. The um, uh, claim by uh, Senator that uh, there is a presumption of guilt if a person is not proved oh, you know innocent. Exactly Just no, I don't. Or if you want me to say it is disgraceful, that to call you disgraceful should be withdrawn, I withdraw it. Your comments are disgraceful. Well, Minister, we think your financial propriety in government Senator has been absolutely Chief. disgraceful. And I am absolutely sick and tired of this government's attempt to hide the financial impropriety of senior officers in Aquis. It is now becoming an embarrassment to this nation and an embarrassment to our primary producers. That is the simple fact about it. Senator Crowley on the other side of the chamber shows the Labor Party's attitude to these matters. Don't talk about it. It is a matter of record that these charges were finalised on the 15th of February. The Labor Party's contempt for the estimates process has meant that there is still no official advice from the minister as to the outcome of the, of the charges, notwithstanding an undertaking on the 15th of February that they would be provided forthwith. So much for the Labor Party's view of accountability. That is disgraceful. And what I say now is that the minister must immediately make available the findings on each of the six charges, details of the charges, so we can assess exactly what has happened in Aquis. But the idea that the Secretary of the Department would allow this officer to have extended leave of absence so that he could go over to the United Kingdom and take a high-paying job over there whilst he is still facing charges over here, knowing that if that officer is found guilty of the charges, then it's going to be an embarrassment to Aquis and an embarrassment to the Australian government is in itself very disturbing notwithstanding the fact that this officer may well have knowledge about other financial impropriety which was committed by other members of the Senior Executive Service of Aquis. This has not been a pleasing task to be involved with, but it is something that has to be done to protect the financial interests of producers whose livestock is ultimately inspected by Aquis and who rely for their earnings overseas on the good workings of the Australian Quarantine and Inspection Service. I hope this scandal is concluded as soon as, pro as, soon as possible, but concluded properly and with a sense of accountability to Parliament. Senator McKeonan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, rise tonight because of an event that occurred here in the Chamber earlier today, where uh, Senator O'Chee 
called upon me to uh, resign for remarks I allegedly made on a Perth radio station some weeks ago during a debate by him. Before I deal with that, Madam Alaraki, Deputy President, I want to read into the record an extract from a copy of a letter that I circulated on the 3rd of March 1995 to quite a large number of constituents in my home state of Western Australia. Uh, it, the numbers would have run into some hundreds. It's item three on the, uh, from that letter I want to quote and put into the record, and I'll explain my reasons for doing so at the conclusion of the quote. It's number three, expose of the National Civic Council plans for Australia. The Sunday Times article of last weekend, which was the 26th of February 1995, growth will halt refugees, say NCC, went somewhere towards explaining the puzzling support that the National Civic Council had been giving over the years to the boat people. That support has been overt and covert. They have used this WA State Secretary Richard Egan, sometimes on behalf of fringe organisations, but their covert, covert operations are less easy to delineate. The NCC have infiltrated political parties, service organisations and refugee support groups. Their influence in some refugee support groups have had such effect that some of these groups work exclusively for boat people, ignoring the 13,000 refugees who are settled in Australia each year. The article states the NCC want to populate and develop northern, northern Australia. Quote, clearly the only way to seek to inhabit and exploit the area, the NCC Weekly News Bulletin, News Weekly, says, is that it is naive to say that Australia cannot be allowed to be overpopulated because of our poor soils and shortage of water. The article suggests that there is plenty of water and that this can be used to expand the economic potential of the area. They cite the Ord River scheme to prove the point. The hidden agenda must now be obvious. The encouragement they have given to some groups of refugees can possibly be explained. They want to populate Northern Australia with wealthy, in brackets, those who can afford passage on a boat, Asians who are fleeing communist regimes. By giving encouragement and support to boat people, they ensure that the flow will continue. When the flood becomes too big, Australia will be forced to accept and settle these people. They will not be processed in a normal way, no character checks, no health checks. What is the future for Australia if the NCC's sinister plot comes to fruition? And I end the letter at that with my uh, salutations and signatures. I make the point that this letter was circulated on the 3rd of March 1995. I didn't seek in putting forward those strong words to use the privilege that's extended to me as a senator representing the people of, of Western Australia to make remarks that I couldn't substantiate. In, in other places, be it in this place or out there in the broader community. I have never sought to abuse or misuse the privilege of, uh, of this place. During, and that, that letter is on the record, gone to some hundreds of people back in my uh, constituency of Western Australia. I've also used the text in different contexts in uh, various interviews that I've done again back in my home state of Western Australia. On the 10th of uh, March this year, the 6PR radio station, as the call sign 6PR, uh, an interviewer, Rob Broad Broadfield, interviewed both Senator Chi and myself in regard to the general matter of the boat people, but in particular to the legislation that is before this chamber, which I do not seek to canvass during the uh, adjournment debate because that would be uh, wrong and in opposition to uh, standing orders of the place. We had, uh, I think, from my point of view, a very lively debate uh, between Senator O'Chee and myself, with uh, uh, sometimes, on some rare occasions, Mr Broadfield uh, having to act as a moderator to keep both of us in, uh, in check. I was quite happy with the, con uh, the comments that I'd made from the record that I had uh, given to me, the printed record of the interview that I had given to me at a later time. I was surprised to find today, whilst I was out, at, uh, out of the building and uh, trying to look after my health for a change, that Senator Chi used the, uh, again used the, uh, the uh, chamber to get up and, uh, and make some suggestions about my uh, comments on the radio. He concluded, I wasn't here, 
and the information that I've got from uh, other people in the building that, who were here was that his language was strong, and I understand it was much more stronger than the, uh, the words were recently challenged in the chamber about being outrageous. I understand from what I've been told, and I don't know this for certain myself, that if those comments had been made outside of the privilege of the parliament, that uh, I might now be, instead of addressing the adjournment debate, I might be talking to uh, my lawyers. But I don't know that for certain because I, won't, I haven't got the, uh, the uh, Hansard record of uh, Senator O'Chee's comments and I won't get that until tomorrow. But when I do get it, we'll, we'll see whether or not the, uh, the same principles that I adhere to in terms of the, uh, the uh, privilege of the parliament have been respected by my opponent on the other side. I don't know. We will, the record will prove it at a later time. I have been told, however, that during the course of Senator O'Chee's comments today that he has misquoted me. I don't, I'm not making the assertion or allegation. I've been told that, and I will hold my counsel until that is, uh, until that is uh, proven by the record tomorrow. I was told that it was in the context of uh, an interchange between Mr Broadfield and myself that this was said. My record of the interview reads as follows. Rob. Now that the, and I apologise if I'm, I'm doing this on second-hand information, but I do believe, from my point of view, it's important to put the record straight. That's why I'm seeking to do it. And if I am wrong, I will most graciously stand in this place tomorrow and apologise. The part that I've been told that I've been misquoted on was uh, this extract here. Rob, which was the presenter or the moderator, now the National Civic Council, Bob Santa Maria's mob, as most Australians would know it you are saying is in league with the opposition now, McKinnon. No, no, no. I am saying that the NCC have infiltrated political parties, refugee groups and others in our community. Rob, to what end? Senator McKinnon, uh, the legal profession. Rob, no, but to what end? To what purpose? Senator McKinnon, to populate the northern end of Australia. Rob, with, Asi with Asians. Senator McKinnon, to populate the northern end of Australia, to keep the pressures of countries in the Asian region, which they say are overpopulated. Now, it's not by accident that we have the full-time Secretary of the NCC in Western Australia, Mr Richard Egan, who is also Secretary of the WA representative of the Indochina Refugee Association. Rob, OK. I'm told, and again the record will, tomorrow will show, that it was at the time when the reference to Asians came in that Senator Chi. Uh, added some additional words to the, uh, the comments and the record that I've got, and also went on to say that I had that he went on to say that I was going to say somebody something else, but didn't say it. Which, of course, if what I've been told is true, will completely and utterly distort the record in a most unfair way. Uh, I haven't had the opportunity because of other events and the paper only reaching me yet because we've got to adjourn very early to show these uh, transcripts to the opposition, but they are available. I'm more than happy to supply them. I won't try and subvert the uh, practices in this place by seeking to table them uh, because I haven't had the opportunity to show them to the, the, this transcript of the, my record of the interview. I haven't had an opportunity to show them to the opposition, so I won't be seeking to, uh, to uh, either table or incorporate. I would conclude, Mr President, by making the comment that I stand by everything I put in the letter to my constituents on the 3rd of March. I stand by my comments that I've made on the 10th of March, and if I'm upsetting some people with those comments, I'm doing that on behalf of the people of Western Australia, of my constituents in Western Australia, of those long-suffering taxpayers who have been exploited to the hilt by a small number of people who uh, are acting sometimes in a not-too-professional manner in support of illegal entrants who come to this country. <coughs> Senator Brownhill. Sorry. The invitation to incorporate well, the transcript of the so leave table to table the transcript. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. Senator Brownhill. Thank you, Mr. President. I wish to add some remarks to those already made by my colleague, Senator Chi, uh, on the matter of Aquis. 
The Senate estimates uh, process is one designed to obtain information from and assess the performance of the Commonwealth Public Service. And over the years, it's been used in various ways by various senators from various political persuasions. And increasingly, uh, during my period in the Senate, the officers have come before the Senate estimates committees have become increasingly adept at avoiding issues and so skilled at providing information that it has so little substance that it renders the estimates process rather difficult. In May 1993, a series of questions was asked of officers from AQUIS and the Department of Primary Industries. It was a simple line of questions based on information conveyed to the Queensland Parliament about travel irregularities involving senior officers in, within AQUIS. The concern of senators at the time, including Senator A. Chi, was that here was a department that was in the process of moving to full cost recovery from the public, in this case the rural sector predominantly. And there were allegations and evidence to suggest that certain officers were abusing the system. And I'll not waste the Senate's time with the exhaustive processes that followed. Suffice to say that my office and Senator O'Chee's office pursued the issue largely, largely as a result of stonewalling we received in the first estimates hearing and subsequent hearings in September and uh, November in 1993. We learned through our investigations that several officers had breached public service guidelines. We uncovered a range of inappropriate activities, uh, a series of cover-ups and total lack of cooperation by officers, both from within AQUIS and the wider DPIE to the estimates process. During our inquiries, and obviously as a result of the mismanagement that we exposed, the head of AQUIS was transferred and a new officer from another department was brought in as the head. And obviously the department was hopeful the matter would be dropped, uh, and I'm afraid it wasn't. As Senator O'Chi has advised, one officer involved in that original line of questioning has uh, pur purported, and I mention the word purported, uh, to be found uh, uh, to be in uh, uh, de de dereliction of his duty relating to the issues we raised nearly two years ago. And quite coincidentally, that officer is no longer, longer in Australia. And of some concern to senators, including myself, that officer is now in a senior position in the UK. Ministry of Agriculture. How he obtained that position and with what recommendations he was sent from Australia is yet to be determined. Obviously, the ability and the willingness of the Australian authorities to pursue those charges, of which I understand he has been found in error, needs also to be examined. The point I wish to raise is that in October 1993, when changes were made, we were given to understand that a new regime and a commitment to service uh, had been adopted in November and December 19 and 1993. During the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee hearings into the Domestic Meat Charges Bill, there were calls from within and without, outside the parliament for an inquiry uh, into AQUIS. And uh, that's something that... Uh, uh